Hello. I just wanted to speak about something that I find really important when it comes to Neville's work. To really understand his work, you have to think in terms of imagination being the only reality. If you can think in this term, which is a type of feeling, then you really, you really will understand what he is saying. But it has to be taken as fact. And it is an assumption, it's a leap you're going to have to take if you want to understand what he is saying. But a perfect example of what I mean is the concept of everyone is you pushed out. This concept doesn't quite make sense to a lot of people because they're trying to think in terms of this outer person. And they're saying, well, I'm not my parent and I'm not my siblings and I'm not my friends. So they sort of disbelieve this. But if we just take it as far as, if we go to the world within ourselves and then we apply this concept, does it make sense? That the people within me are me pushed out. That the people within my imagination actually are reflecting me and they are obeying me. They actually are me pushed out. It's a fact. They're my reflection, they're my mirror. And just from that alone, you can start to see how everyone you pushed out just makes perfect sense when you take the idea that imagination is the reality. And Neville speaking from the, the from that premise, he constantly said, consciousness is the one and only reality. And that is a leap of faith to believe. To believe that your mind is reality actually can be credited reality. You actually can credit reality to things. And the way you do that is you can imagine a scene. And at first, the scene might not feel real to you. But notice the wording. It, might, it doesn't feel real. Well, you can make it feel real. You just provided a feeling of reality. You keep feeling as if it's reality. You just keep assuming that it is, that you, that you are experiencing this person, this version of yourself. But what I really wanted to stress on that I find so important is that is really the value of acceptance of your current reality in order to change the reality. I am one person, I'm a person who truly believes one must accept the position they're in in order to change it. And if, one's, if one wants to change their type of state that they're in, in order for one to occupy a new state, in order to move effortlessly between states, you have to accept that you're in a state right now. You have to accept that you are expressing your state of mind. Your mind is just simply expressing itself as a state. You might not like what it's expressing, but it's expressing it regardless. If you can accept it from this point, then I really think you're on your way to changing it. But you have to fully embrace that it's just the state you're in. Then you can fully embrace that the person you want to be is just a state as well. If you can really separate yourself from the I am and the state itself, from the person in the state, you'll be able to do this for, for other people as well. You, Because what you do to yourself, you do to others. The way you view yourself, you're going to view other people that way. People will become less scary if you're afraid of people because you're going to realize they're just in a state. And states express themselves. So if you're in a safe, if you feel safe, if you feel uh, at ease, comfortable, feel whatever about yourself, that will express. But you have to feel that you are it now. See, the name is I am. It's not I will be. I am is the cause of everything that goes on in your inner world. And your inner experience, every feeling, every thought, is caused by you. I would just, I would, I would hope you just assume that to be the case in the mind and watch it actually be the case. You'll start to see that really nobody's speaking their own words in me. Nobody is really, nobody's really angry. Nobody is really harming me. It's just myself. It's my reflection. And there's a lot of ease and relaxation in knowing that your world is reflecting you, your inner world. I'm just speaking about the inner world. I'm speaking from the premise that imagination is reality. Okay. Now, if you can see that the state you're in right now and the state you want, let's say you imagine something you want to be, you have to see yourself as 
simply a state as well, but both of these states come from imagination. If you can accept that, then you can use imagination to change the state. So really the mantra is this, they or it is not the problem. They or it is not the solution. I am the problem and I am the solution. I'm speaking of this in terms of the inner reality. Really nobody within you is the problem and the objects that you're trying to obtain aren't the problem either. It's I am the problem and I am the solution. And I truly believe in order, I think a lot of us, including myself, have jumped into this hoping that I am is the solution. Yet we don't really credit it fully with the problem. And I noticed as much as you credit I am the problem, that you credit that that is the solution. So if you want to fully make I am the solution, you have to make I am to be the problem fully. You have to fully take responsibility for everything within you in order to change everything within you. Because if it's under someone else's control, you just created two powers and then you're going to have resistance within you. You're going to think there's another power within you who's stopping you and there really isn't. But that's just, um, that could have just been a habit you've developed. Uh, many times we don't do things we want. We do things we're used to. Um, it might not be something you, if you're doing things you don't want to do in your mind, you're most likely just repeating things that you're used to. Um, and it's actually easy to change if you know you're just in a state. It's difficult. It be, what's challenging is if you're in a state for so long, what tends to happen is that the person identifies themselves with the state as if it's a permanent part of their identity. When in reality, it's just a state. It's just as you can imagine yourself being the way you want to be. That's a state too. The only reason why it feels unreal to you is because you're not crediting it with reality the way you're crediting it, you know, this one with reality. And there's something really important that Neville once said. He said that you can awake inside of dreams and become conscious inside of them. And you can start acting inside of these when you're sleeping. And then you'll wake up and realize it was all a dream. I've had this experience many times, but the way he made me view it was different. He said, okay, if you can see that this is the imagination speaking to you, that this it's, it's trying to show you something and ask yourself what it's trying to show you. You'll see how obvious it is. And what it showed me was that I was in a world just like this, experiencing myself totally different. And it was just as solidly real as this world. And then I woke up and I realized it was just a dream. And my imagination is trying to show me that this reality is just a dream as well. It's the same, it's the same thing. There's no difference. And it takes an assumption to realize if you start to assume that this life is a dream, truly start to feel that, you will get a relief and an ease that what you see isn't necessarily permanent, it's just a dream. And you will awake. You know how you awake from a dream and you feel relief? Like, well, it was just a dream. That's sort of how you have to view life. I should say that is how I view it personally. And I've noticed that whatever assumptions free me in my body, Whatever assumptions provide me really, really high amounts of ecstasy, I tend to just assume. I just notice that it makes me a better person. It makes me be the way I would desire to be. Um, it, it makes it so effortless for me to imagine what I want. If I go with opening and freeing my body, it's very, very easy. And in my opinion, um, the body's the first type of manifestation is the is in the body. If you were to imagine a scene and enter the scene and feel that scene, it's reality. And then you walk across that bridge of incidents to the end goal, which is the scene you imagined. What you would find is that the first act of change in this outer reality was in the body because the body is a part of this outer reality. That's why Neville says you can't do anything. You have to just imagine and feel and then you'll walk across a bridge of incidents. But the first change of reality, the first, the way right when you imagine something new, the first change that happens is in the body. It's the feeling in the body. Neville would say he would imagine until he has a certain motor change. So if he was imagining somebody talking to him and telling him something wonderful about himself, he would keep imagining it until he smiles naturally. The way he would naturally react is if that's happening to him right now. And he would lose himself in it. So, um, by him losing himself in these imaginal scenes, he becomes it. 
and then the inevitable happens is that he becomes it in his world. But in order for Neville to truly accept that new scene, he has to accept that he's simply just in a state as well right now. That the, the undesirable is just a state. He accepted that fully. In imagination, it truly is just a state because it can always be changed. So if you want to change, you have to accept that you are the problem within yourself. And the mantra I do give is I'll imagine, um, let's say I imagine certain people in my life and I'll, I will just repeat, they are not the problem. I am the problem and I am the solution. And a lot of us look to people for solutions. We look to them thinking that they're gonna give us what we want. But I am is a solution, but I am is also the problem. So I really think that if you want to change, you have to accept fully that you're just in a state right now. You have to just assume that. And then you'll be able to assume a new state. Maybe you've been in the state for a very long time. Maybe you felt like you're a prisoner to it. It doesn't mean you are. Because in imagination, anything can be changed. So um, I really think taking one's, taking full responsibility um, and accepting the fact that you are the solution and the problem, that you are just in a state, is crucial to changing. I think many times we try to force ourselves upon uh, the solution, not seeing what the real problem is. So take a step back in your imagination and just observe it. Ask yourself, uh, what do these thoughts say about me? Why am I having these thoughts? There's so many thoughts I could have. Why these specifically? And what do they mean to me? What do they say about me specifically? What am I feeling about myself? Is it something that I want to feel or is it something I think I have to feel by society or by my partner? What is it that I want? Remember, this is your imagination. It's nobody else's. So anybody who's in control in here, it should be you. Um, don't create another, another God within you. Don't start worshiping other things or feel like you're powerless because there is no other. Nothing can have power unless you give it in your mind. This is just something I felt um, was very important to share. So Neville speaks about assumption and how to assume that you are what you want to be, to assume that you have what you want to have. And I think a lot of us, including myself, we've used this art of assumption in the material world. We're too too much of a consumer of it, if you will. We assume certain products and clothing brands and money and fame and things of society. But I really think if you just use this art of assumption just for that, I really think you, you're selling yourself short. I don't think you should really just use it for material goods. I think there's so much more to life. And an assumption that has truly freed me more than any other assumption, to be honest, is the fact that life is a dream and I am its dreamer. This assumption has freed me more than any amount of money or clothing or really anything. It's freed me. And the reason why is because I've had experiences where I've became conscious inside of dreams. And I knew that I was sleeping back home and I knew that I was going to awake within it. I've also had dreams where I just I've had nightmares, terrible nightmares of people doing something to me that I love, you know, they're harming me or they're leaving me or I've had dreams of me harming others, um, breaking my moral code. But when I wake up, I feel relieved that it's just a dream, that the horrific thing I experienced moments ago is not, it's not as real as I thought. And that relief when you wake up is it's quite wonderful. I mean, if you did something that broke your moral code inside of a dream, I mean, you're probably, you probably would feel shame, but because it was a dream, you don't, you kind of remove that shame immediately. You remove it. You don't, um, you don't carry it with you longer than a week, to be honest. I mean, after a week, you kind of drop everything you've ever done in those dreams because you forget about the dream. And now imagine for a second that this life is also a dream. How much relief would you honestly have? 
knowing that this is just a dream. I mean, how much relief would you feel if you knew none of this was as real as you thought it was? I really believe this. I really believe that once man assumes life is a dream, man is given a divine relief. I truly believe this. Because I can't think of a a more lovely relief than knowing all of this was just a dream. And I know that this um, assumption doesn't seem on the surface that practical, but I, re- I think it opens up a freedom within you to remove that shame, to remove the fear that this is not as real as you think it is. And from actually from removing that fear, you can now begin to play with the dream. I remember when I've, I know I became conscious inside of dreams, I got very excited to just create things and go places. And that's the same as this life. I really believe that my imagination was trying to show me that this life is the same because I couldn't tell the difference between this world and the world I was dreaming. I really couldn't. Everybody was solid. Everything was solidly real. And what am I supposed to do with that experience? I mean, I was in another world where I was experiencing things just like this. I, I, I don't think this world's any bit different, to be honest. And I really think that if you use the art of assumption, not just for material things or outwardly things, and really try to assume things about just your sense of self, who you are, who you want to be, what you want to do. Um, how do you just want to feel today? I mean, you can just assume anything. And I really think, though, in my opinion, I mean, I guess you say, from my experience, the greatest relief I have felt is assuming and truly feeling it as a fact that life is a dream. And when I assumed it, I was given some, it's strange, I was given a lot of euphoric feelings. And a part of me maybe wanted to resist it. But I just pushed beyond that and stopped listening to that fear and I just kept persisting in that euphoria and the next thing I know I I just you get so elated and you realize that it's true (laughs) it's true that life's just a dream and from this position of being the dreamer you can now you know do what you want without feeling that there's some obstacle in the way you truly are your own obstacle because there's nothing else within you but I am, and that's you. Every problem that you have within your mind is created by you, and it only exists because of your attention to it. You you really only create, um, or I should say, if you were raised a certain way, if you grew up in a certain manner where you didn't like, and you seem to keep repeating certain things of your childhood or your past, it's 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 so simple but it's actually you're just reacting to things in your mind and neville tells us not to react he tells us to act he says stop reacting and he tells you that you don't have to have the same reactions as your parents did or as their parents did you're your own person you are unique and you can have your own reactions or i should say you can have your own actions you don't have to keep reacting to the past or to the future events that you're creating in your mind it's the reaction It's you not learning how to show indifference to it. That's the problem. It's you feeling that you have to accept it on some level. But if you really believe life's a dream, you could change yourself when you want. And you don't have to feel like you have to ask permission from anybody. And you shouldn't because there's no one else to ask. If you feel like you're not allowed to feel what you want within your own body, I mean, you're going to cause yourself a hell within you. These are your feelings. These are your thoughts. These are things that you want to feel about yourself. And if you won't do it, then who will? If there's nobody else within you. No one can feel things for you. I can't think your own thought. I can't think thoughts for you. You really are the opera power. And you would want it to be that way. You really wouldn't want to change that. So knowing this information, I, I hope that you 
I hope you experience the relief that I've experienced. That life is truly a dream. So this will be a lecture that I've written. I have to accept my current mental circumstances I find myself in. If I'm being hurt, or things are stolen from me, or if I'm failing at something, or arguing with another in imagination, I have to accept these are my mental circumstances. Acceptance of these circumstances in imagination is the start of change. For acceptance, the opposite of denying it exists, causes the fear to dissipate. We deny because we fear. We accept because we are unafraid. Acceptance is made effortlessly when you know that all mental problems have mental solutions in imagination. One may struggle to accept their undesirable states because they believe there is no solution to this problem. So acceptance feels like a death sentence. But every problematic mental circumstance you find yourself in has within it a mental solution. So from this understanding, one must see problems as existing within themselves, not outside of themselves. This causes a boost in confidence because you know that you can't solve it in the mind because you are the opera power here. Seeing that every mental problem is a problematic assumption about the self in the mind, then you being the creative power can create a new assumption to resolve it. You are resolving yourself. Circumstances truly do not matter in imagination because circumstances are dormant and need to be awakened and made alive to matter. The only one who can make a circumstance matter, which is to say, feeling it as a present reality, is you. Only you can take a horrifying thought and feel its reality until it scares you. Only you can take that exact horrifying thought and not react at all. The same way you and I can look at a piece of art and see entirely different perspectives, likewise thoughts are pieces of art. These pieces of art are a part of ourselves. A scary thought does not have to scare you. We can change how we relate to thoughts. You cannot seek to the world to tell you who you are. A person who does not know his I am's will look to the world to tell him his, what his I am's should be. But through his search, he'll come to find that there is no consistency. To one he is good, to another bad, to one smart, to another stupid. A man who does not know who he is will look to society to tell him who he is. But what he does not see is that he's looking at a mirror. They do not know who you are because you do not know who you are. We are defined in this reality. That is to say, there is a length, height, and width. We can measure and we can define. Likewise, we must define our I am. We must know exactly who we are. Define yourself, because you have the freedom to do so. Don't keep wandering in the fog looking for the right person to tell you who you are. You are looking for approval from the mirror to accept a certain wonderful I am. But a mirror can only reflect. Let your I am be the daylight that removes the fog and clears your sight. In an instant, your mental mirror your mental circumstances will change. During the end of the search, man will have to answer this question. Who do I say that I am? It is who do I say, not who do they say. Now in this part of the journey, man has to give an answer. He knows he cannot keep living in a seek for an I am. He knows that it's just a mirror. He cannot keep looking to the world asking, does this mean that I am this or that? He must define himself. He must become cubic in a sense. Tired of being tossed by the wind, he must take root. But root takes the next obstacle, which is trust. Who do I say that I am? Must be answered. But the answer to this question is only worth the amount of trust that is put into it. Man has to genuinely have, genuinely, with faith, trust the answer he gives. Which is to trust his own imagination being enough evidence that he is who he wants to be. But what is he trusting in? I am. So he is trusting himself. I am worthy. I am loved. I am you name it. If he trusts in I am, the present tense feeling of being, he'll be given an ecstasy as a gift for trusting. He freed a part of I am, and that's what that relief is. Continue defining and freeing I am. Free yourself. The only bondage man is in is the bondage of I am. 
I am puts you in bondage and I am frees you. I am is the prison, I am is the key. Then man sees he was given the greatest gift of all, the I am. This I am is the greatest instrument in the world and must be treated as so. Learn to play the instrument of I am and create a harmony with it. Do not deny I am. See what you are I aming within you by observing your mental circumstances. Accept that you have played I am in a bad tune by adding to it disharmonious self-concepts. Then from this acceptance, change the tune. So we use I am to move in the way we desire to inside of imagination. To move inside imagination effectively, one must bring reality to the new mental circumstances. I am is the reality that must be brought to states to have any effect on you. So success and failure lie in imagination. They lie in I am. Become successful in the mind by fully embodying a new state. Just like you are embodying one now. Discard the old I am and accept a new one. Accepting the fact that you are merely in a state now causes it to lose power because states are powerless without I am. If you find yourself fearing your imaginal acts, tell yourself, I am in the state of fearing these thoughts. Seeing it's just a state, a reaction, then change the state, the I am. I am is the prison and I am is the key. I grew up with abuse, which is to say I was given frightening impressions upon my imagination. I developed an inner world that scared me. I consistently lived in the state of I am not instead of I am, meaning I grew up consistently proving to myself that I am not worthless, I am not unwanted, I am not stupid, I am not unloved, I am not abandonable. So I constantly would do things, constantly would think things to prove that I am not X, even though I would say I'm not stupid, lazy, unwanted, etc. I deep down, if I'm honest with myself, felt those concepts to be true. I felt this to be true because of my inner circumstances I found myself in, in imagination. I felt these concepts as a present fact. I hated it and wanted to deny it, but I did not feel I could accept the wonderful self-concepts. So on the one hand, I felt I was something bad, but I could not accept that I did this, that I feel this, for fear of being stuck without a solution. And on the other hand, I felt the solution was to accept new self-concepts, but I didn't feel worthy enough to accept them. Both of these hands I could not accept. So I went towards the only other way, which was denial. I denied under my breath for years that I am not X, whatever bad self-concept that is. But then since I felt I was that bad self-concept deep down, I would manifest it into my world. And then the inevitable would come. What is the inevitable? My harvest. My own thoughts and feelings that I have planted in my garden of, of imagination the one cause. When it would manifest, I, would f I felt defeated. That there was nothing I could do. But look at my mistake. I was not accepting my own harvest. I was not truly seeing how I feel about myself. I was so focused on what I did not want to be. I was so focused on what I did not want to happen. I did not look at I am. Thus, I could never find the problem and I could not find the solution. The problem is I am and the solution is I am in imagination. We are I am passing through states in imagination. So when you identify yourself with the I am that precedes all states, then you feel yourself to have the ability to change. Even though I desire deep down to not feel those things, having a deep want for something does not mean you are it. You can want it with all your heart to be X, but it does not mean you are X. So don't confuse the feeling of a deep desire for something with the feeling of fulfillment. The goal is to stop desiring, stop feeling I am not, I wish I could be, and feel I am. The name is I am. Why fight with I am instead of saying I am worthy, I am intelligent, I am, I am wanted, I am loved? If I'm fighting my concepts and I'm not winning, then I have not yet occupied the new state. For in, order a, for, in order for a state to be occupied, it must be with I am. The only victory is I am. Instead of eternally fighting why you are not a self-concept, end the fight within and gain victory by saying, with a present tense feeling, I am the self-concept you want to be. You do not have to prove anything to anyone within you, for they are only mirroring you. 
You just have to be it in the mind and everyone within you has no choice but to see you that way if you fully see yourself that way. Now in a practical manner, let's take a look at a quote Neville consistently used. An assumption, though false, if persisted in, will harden into fact. Take these words and just meditate upon them throughout your day. Repeat this phrase, not as an odorless phrase, but a phrase with a vibrant fragrance. Let it captivate you and become interested in it. Smell it repeatedly and discover all the notes. Try to understand each word and what they mean in this context. What I think you'll find is what I found. That the most important words in the sentence are, though false. The words assumption and persisted are of great importance as well, but the words though false have a freedom that is attached to it unlike the other words. The assumption is false. Yes. We are assuming something to be true that we know is false at the moment. We have to accept this. If we do not accept this, we'll try to force ourselves. But force implies multiple powers at play. There is only one power, in here, in imagination, and that is I am, which is the inner you. So acceptance is unity and force is separation. This acceptance, I hope, causes a relief that you do not have to pound it in your mind all day, exhausting yourself to believe it to be true. It is false. Accept the assumption is false for now. The question becomes, what are we assuming that is false? We are assuming a state about ourselves. So when we are assuming or appropriating a state, we have to see that we are assuming a state that is, that is why we are reaping what we are reaping. To reap a new harvest, one must change the state. So we must take, this, that, we must take the state we want to be and see it only as an assumption. The assumption is false based upon my state right now. If I were in a new state, the assumption would no longer feel to me a long distant dream, but an ever present reality. Now that we have less resistance by accepting the assumption is false, meaning it contradicts my current state, let us see what Neville is trying to tell us to do with this false assumption. Imagine Neville asking you this question. The assumption you want is false about yourself, but what if what you are now is also an assumption? And the only reason why you feel it to be true is because you are trusting in it. That what you are now was once an assumption that was false as well. And your trusting it is in trusting in it is the only reason why you are accepting it, experiencing it. What if you trusted in a different assumption? Would you would your experience change? If this is true, then what I am now is only as real as I make it. It is a dream in a way that I forgot was a dream. A state is a dream that I'm dreaming about myself. It may be a nightmare, but I can, I can always awake from it. Since I am the dreamer, and apart from the dreamer, there is no dream. So the assumption is false, but if I were to experience it as being true within myself and make it feel real to me, it ceases being false in an imagination. The assumption is false in the outer world, but it is true in the world of imagination. The question is, are you going to accept the imagination as being the truth about yourself? I hope you believe in imagination. When we, then we, we persist in the new state until it becomes our natural way of being. Then in the most natural way it will come into your world. We must feel natural about it in imagination, for it is as within, so without. You may not feel natural about the new state immediately. You might, but if you don't, then persist. Remember, persistence is not in trying to become. It is in being the new state. Being it means to experience it. There is no fulfillment in trying to be. The only fulfillment is I am. No, I'm quoting Neville. It does not matter what you've done. You, may have, you might have been cruel. You might have been a thief. You might be this very night running away from some deed. I will say you are forgiven. Believe now in God. God is your own wonderful human imagination, and with Him all things are possible. So regardless of what your background might have been, regardless of what you are doing now, have an object, have a desire, consume, a consuming desire. You have the power right now to change the inner self. You don't have to live in nightmares and, and slumps in imagination. You need nothing but the imagination to change the self. Without anything, you can conjure up a new dream and occupy and feel the reality, feel the reality of that dream. Imagination cares nothing about your background. 
Imagination cares nothing if you've made mistakes in the past. Imagination does not even care about your present reality. Imagination has forgiven everything. It holds nothing from you. All states in imagination, these are dreams awaiting your occupancy. So how does one put this material into practice? Here's what I found to work beautifully for changing states. The goal is to change the self. The self is I am and I am is attached to certain states. So as Neville said, start from the premise, I am the I am moving through states. So how can we change states effectively? Neville constantly said to trust in God, but what does that really mean? Now I'm quoting Neville again. Believe in the infinite wisdom and power of a presence that is in you and believe that presence to be your imagination. Do not argue the point. You carry the request to this one within you as though you say, is it all right? He will invariably say, yes, it is done, invariably. He doesn't argue. He doesn't point to your background. He doesn't point to any restrictions of the past. He played those parts. So whatever you want, go to him, commune with him. Bring it to a head as though it were done. Is it done? And get confirmation from this deeper self. Yes, it is done. And then drop it. Your conscious reasoning mind cannot reach the depth necessary to set in motion all the causes necessary to bring it to pass in your world. So don't try to analyze it. Leave it where it is. It will happen in a way you never suspect. So if I were to make this into a step, I would say step one, define a desire. If this desire was to be realized, what would that imply about you? So we're looking for a self-concept. It has to imply something about you. Feel that what you desire has already been said yes to. It has already been said yes by the only creative power there is. Trust in God, which is in the context, is to trust in imagination. So you see a scene or hear a lovely conversation. To trust this imaginative experience as real is to trust in God. There is no trying to get. Remember, it has already been said yes to. All it awaits is your occupancy. All you have to do is experience what already has been said yes to. Do it in love for yourself, that you have saved yourself from an undesirable state. I have found this method is the simplest than other methods, that, but, require, but requires trust and faith. However, there, there is a practice within this method that must be developed. That is to remove the conscious reasoning mind from the equation. What tends to happen is the moment one goes to visualize or hear what they want and they choose to feel after it, they become scared. The reasoning mind comes and takes the blessing away. This is a feeling, a pull into doubting what you see and hear. Practice resisting the urge to reason when you imagine a new state and practice believing the divine eyes and divine ears. When you stop the urge of reasoning, your desire will be met within. You will feel euphoria, and from this euphoria, you will naturally have thoughts from this new state. This euphoria is a personal one. So find that feeling that would be success to you and appropriate that state as your own. Then your reactions to life will change automatically. Now walk in this new state of mind and be patient. I must confess, on this level, I do not know the means that will be employed. On this level, I have to learn to be patient and simply persist in being. But you have planted this in your mental garden, and it will grow into your experience. You will have to confront your harvest, for you are confronting your harvest right now. The harvest you are experiencing was once, once planted in the same garden. Your harvest is your state's. To quicken the learning curve of this method, apply this method to others. See people in your life doing wonderfully. Hear them tell you something wonderful about their life. Experience it within and feel it It has already been said yes to and move on with the day. Then do it for something else. But I urge you to do it in love. If you are disturbed between the planting and the bridge, persist in the new state for the only thing that is expressing are your states. Persistence is not stressful, but in fact the opposite. Experiencing being what you want is ecstasy. It is ease, and the more you persist and experience it, the more natural you will feel about being it. Here's what I do not do while I imagine a new state for myself. I do not argue the point. I do not concern myself with trying to figure out the means or when it will happen. I do not wonder if it's possible. 
I do not feel any fear whether or not it will work. I remove concepts from the future and past from my mind. I remove all grudges towards anyone. I let go of all these concepts and experience being that new state. It feels entirely natural when you suspend reasoning. Then I conjure up a scene or a conversation implying the desire is already done. I like to see this as a dream. The reason I see it as a dream is because I see my current reality as a, as a dream as well. It is all dreams to me. So I conjure up a dream, a, a dream and then I enter into it. I do not become frightened. I see the dream from a third person perspective and then I enter into it as a first person perspective and experience it just as though it is true. This new dream that I conjured up is just another version of me experiencing what I want to be. But I'm not pretending. I actually experience being that version. I hear what he hears. I feel what he feels. I see what he sees. The people in my mind see me the way I want them to see me. I do not question or argue. I just say yes to experiencing it and yes to everything in my imagination. I feel the yes, not just say it. I say, I want to experience being X. Then I feel in my imagination, which is myself, say yes. And I trust implicitly in that yes and proceed to experience it. So my only goal is to actually experience what I want to experience because that's all I would do if I were the person I wanted to be. Imagination has already said yes. If imagination has not, has not said yes, then you would not be able to imagine it. The power is not in the word yes, but in the feeling. So go within and change your imaginative world to how you want it to be or how it ought to be to you. Feel that what you are now experiencing has already been said yes to. Accept and trust in the yes. And then a change will happen in your feeling. And you'll start to think from. And your reactions will change towards your world. But don't become fixated or worried if you're thinking from it. The moment you feel you are it now is the moment you are thinking and feeling from the state. Remember, we think and react from states. So change this state, not each and every thought. You cannot be in want of evidence of what you are currently being. The state inside you is complete. It just needs to be occupied. The evidence, the dream is there. You must see that the evidence of who you are before your eyes is also produced by the imagination. So it is in the imagination that one must change. And the experience you seek is within. So learn to make imagination a heaven, a refuge. Let it become the safest place to be. It has the capability and ability to become one. That if you were to tell it all your fears, for it knows your fears more intimately than anyone in the world, it would comfort you. Somewhere in this world of imagination, there is a dream where you are who you want to be. Find it and quench your thirst by entering into an experience being it. Persist in experiencing it until it becomes natural to you and then it will naturally enter into your world. So I'm ending with a novel quote. All you have to do is imagine you are doing it. So this is uh, just going to be me rambling and talking about this stuff because uh, I got to be honest, I don't really love reading like that. I, I seem to make mistakes that I, I just, I just bothers me a bit. Um, I prefer to just go, you know, with no notes, but um, there's something important that I want to stress about what Neville said when he said, um, do not argue the point, just accept it. And, um, I, I had this conversation one time with um, a person of, you know, I know, and they were having this guilt that they were feeling. And I was trying to show them how the guilt that they're feeling, that they don't have to have it and they don't have to keep it. And um, they were arguing with me. And I, I thought to myself, I said, I asked them, I said, are you arguing with me to keep your guilt and they had to think about that and the reason why I was able to ask that question was because I've asked that about myself I've asked myself am I when I argue with imagination and it's telling me I am who I want to be am I arguing to keep myself in the same position I'm in right now and that's essentially what we're doing when we fight against our, our imaginations, when it's trying to tell us who we want, we are who we want to be, we are essentially fighting to keep ourselves in the same state. So we have to learn to not uh, 
introduce the conscious reasoning mind into these types of um, into into changing states because you you sort of can't. The reasoning mind's going to show you no. You you are where you are. You you should feel guilty. You should feel these things. You should not move on. But imagine if everybody took that position, <laughs> we would make no progress in life. So imagination really is the thing that hinders us or the thing that makes us grow. But it's up to us how we want to use this instrument. Um, but when it says yes, it's done to whatever you want. Don't reason. Don't don't even don't even go any step further. Just accept it, and then move on. You you'll you'll start to notice how much easier life will get if you stop arguing um, to keep your current limited state. So when you go to assume a new state, you can't bring with you the um, the worries and questions of your current state. You have to let go of the state. So you have to let go of all the reasoning that keeps you uh, in bondage and accept this new one. But the way to accept it is actually you have to not question it. You have to see it's you granting this towards yourself. There is no other. So it's you giving this to yourself. And the moment you start arguing with it is the moment you start uh, restricting it from yourself. So all denial in imagination is self-denial. Um, I think one of Neville's students, um, Lindell, he, he said that. And I find that to be powerful. That every single thing we deny is actually self-denial. And I took it, um, I also kind of added to that. And I sort of said that every thought is self-given. Every thought is self-given, and I and I mean that. I mean, I, who, who else has given us these thoughts but ourselves? So if we can really take responsibility in that, that we can see that when we argue, we are essentially keeping ourselves in the positions we're used to. Um, then we can see what the real issue is here: is that it's the it's this reasoning mind, it's this restrictive thinking, um, it's the continuously or the the continuation of feeling fear. And persisting in our fears and then we have all these scary thoughts and we wonder why am i thinking all these scary things why am i what's well, because we're feeling these things and then from these feelings we start thinking naturally i mean there there are times where i will feel um like an impending doom i grew up with this feeling a lot was like this impending doom's coming my way <laughs> and i would when i noticed that whenever i would feel it it'd be the most random thought of what bad could go wrong in my life but it never it never was consistent it was always something random and it's because it has to generate a thought to match the feeling that I'm having. But if I were to uh, tell myself that I am something else, or let's say I want to experience some sense of safety, well, then I imagine myself in a position where I'm safe, where I feel safe, and I'm in a safe place. I have safe people around me. I have friends that I, that I talk to that I feel safe around. And I start to feel comfortable inside my imagination. So start there. If you feel afraid, learn to feel safe in imagination. We have to learn to make imagination our refuge. It has to be this thing where we tell it our fears and it comforts us. I wasn't very comforted growing up at all, if any. So I'm not used to that. But I have to get used to it. If I want change in my, I have to have change, uh, sorry, sorry, to have change in my outer world, I have to have change in my inner world. So... If I really want to start being safe in my outer world, I need to start feeling safe in my inner world. And it's the it's that um, argumentation, that fear that causes you to ruin the scenes. If you notice your scenes are being ruined all the time, you're actually ruining it with your fear. It's your it's your not your your inability to accept it as it is. And I think that that's a part of unworthiness, is that we feel actually unworthy to feel accepted, to feel loved, to feel. Um, wealthy to feel strong to feel like people like us this is this for me growing up was very unnatural um, but it can become natural with persistence and this is what persistence comes through it's just simply persisting in being safe in the mind persist being the thing you want to be in the mind so you start being it consistently. And the next thing you know, you start reacting differently to what I, I there, there's been times where like I've reacted to certain situations in my life, um, a very consistent way, very similar to the way I was raised. And then I changed my entire state and it's like I reacted completely differently. And the whole the whole reality shifted because of my change in state resulted in my change in reaction, which resulted in a change in the outcome. So you just keep doing that. <laughs> It's that it is that simple because um, really it's just it's binary. It's just inputs and outputs, reactions or actions. It's um, either in the state or not in the state. So 
it, it is very simple, but it, it can be um, difficult when we tend to argue ourselves back into guilt and back into shame. We have to learn that imagination has forgiven us of everything. And it's important for us to see imagination as a, as a place that could be a heaven. That it's a place where it allows us to freely feel anything we desire to feel. And if it doesn't stop you from feeling horrible about yourself, it won't stop you from feeling great about yourself. But you have to see it's just you who's stopping you. God has given you this entire plane of imagination where there's all these dreams. And you can enter into these things and experience them. But we really only experience what we think we are allowed to experience. But since we are t entirely forgiven, we can now feel worthy enough to grant ourselves the things we've always been wanting. And imagination knows you more intimately than anyone in this world. Because it's only you and God. It's just I am in this world. So it knows, and it's, and it's within you, so it knows every single desire you have. It knows you more intimately, and you have to accept that. Start to live an intimate relationship with your, with your imagination that it really does know your fears. It knows every thought you've ever thought. It could have been a horrible thought about somebody. It could have been a nice thought about somebody, but it knows it. And it knows that you are struggling in certain areas in your mind. It knows that you're conjuring up these nightmares. I've had a dream where I, where I was uh, stuck in this terrible, terrible place. And I used I am to get out of there in my, in, my, in my dream and I escaped it. But then I found myself not trusting in that new I am, that I'm freed. And then I went right back to that prison. So really it is a self-freeing or it's a self-imprisonment. And it allows us to choose. But we are the ones who make the choice. We are the operant power, as Neville says. It doesn't operate itself. And you can test this by, I mean, you can see this by people who don't even, I mean, I remember before Neville, I don't even remember me even actually giving my thoughts a thought, if that makes sense. I'd never really even thought about what I was thinking. I just was sort of reacting to life. I was basically a robot at that point. I mean, what's the difference? You can say I was dead at one point. I just wasn't really living. I just was sort of whatever thoughts came to my mind. I just thought them and went on with my day. And it wasn't once I, once I became aware of my own thinking, that's actually when I started to become frightened because my I saw my world's actually a nightmare. My whole I'm imagining these nightmares and I didn't know how to change them. So um, I'm very blessed to find Neville because Neville really showed me that it's about changing the imagination. I do it all within myself um, because the nightmares are within me. The problems I have are within me. As you know, Henry Thoreau once said, it's not what you're looking at, it's what you see. I find this quote to be so incredibly powerful because it really is. Because what we see reflections are of ourselves. And William Blake made this point that like you look at a tree and some people might be moved to tears and another person might see a green thing in their way. So it's truly, truly perspective is what makes our experience here good or bad. But we get to define the perspective. And the most important perspective you can have is the perspective of the self. How do you perceive yourself? And can you allow yourself to perceive yourself a new way without arguing your way out of it, without fearing your way out of it? Can you allow imagination to comfort you? That because it knows your fears better than you do. <laughs> it knows you better than you, anyone. So you have to see that it's you're in a relationship with you and God. And it knows you more intimately than anything. And um, through practicing this, you can start to feel safer and safer in the mind. I really think you need to feel, I really think it's a, it's, you need to feel safe first to start to imagine things and enter into these scenes um, and not argue way out of it. I think it's the feeling of unsafety I found for me that seems to, I guess, wiggle me out of the dream and I'm back to feeling afraid or I'm back to feeling like I'm stuck. But you really can't be stuck. Um, so don't argue way out, don't reason your way out, just accept it, just feel that everything the imagination says to you is yes it's just yes and just leave it there do not do not try to argue it do not try to um find ways to maybe it's a no don't do that learn to resist that impulse and the more you learn to resist that impulse you'll find yourself creating a heaven within you and there's nothing wrong with that um there's nothing wrong with living in a without fear there's nothing wrong with that and in fact fear doesn't really do much it doesn't really aid you in a lot of ways. It's, it sounds, it's, it's quite funny. What I've found is that the more and more I practice Neville's work, the more reasonable I actually feel. 
I started realizing how unreasonable I am worrying about everything. It's actually not the. It's actually not really that rational to worry about everything. It's best to take action than to just constantly react with worry. So if you want to feel, I found that myself that like I thought at first I was be, being so irrational, but then I the more I persisted and I felt like, no, I'm feeling more wise actually. I'm feeling like I can do something about this. Um, and then I started actually seeing worrying as irrational and how crazy it is to worry all the time. It sounds nuts. There's nothing wrong with having a worry. I mean, but then quench the worry with imagination because it the worry is within you. The problem is within you and imagination wants to quench it. It offers you a solution. But don't be like me who was uh, at first was arguing my way back into guilt. It's, it's showing you here's the solution. The problem is within you and here's the solution within you. You can grant this to yourself as well. Are you going to take it? Are we going to believe in your imagination? We already do. We already believe in it, but we believe in it with worries and fears. The question is, are you going to allow accept um, the opposite, which is safety, joy, and love, and the things you truly want? In, in imagination, there is a dream where you are receiving, what, or you, you are expressing what you truly want to express, and find that dream. Okay, so let's talk about states. Now, states, um, you can think of a state that a state creates mental circumstances that you find yourself in. Now, I'm just speaking about the world of imagination. Um, I want you to see how it's more important who you are inside this world of imagination than it is who you are in this outer world. Okay, and <clears throat> what tends to happen is um, we struggle within this world of imagination, which is really the world we shouldn't be struggling in because we can express what we want to express in it. Um, the question is, why aren't we expressing what we want to express? And why are we experiencing what we are experiencing within ourselves? And it's because of your state. Or a state, you can think of it as a self-concept. And a self-concept is a feeling towards the I, or the I am, okay? So we have these feelings towards ourselves, and it's this feeling that creates scenarios that we find ourselves in inside our minds. So uh, I, I don't love um, using negative examples. It's just much easier to use negative examples to prove my point. For someone who is very insecure, they will find themselves in certain mental circumstances where that will be expressed. Um, maybe their uh, their friends don't. They think their friends don't like them, or they experience their partners leaving them, or whatever it is. Maybe the case, um, or they sort of imagine scenarios where they're rejected. Um, these scenarios are being caused by your self concept. So your inner experience is shaped by your self-concept. I'm going to repeat that one more time. Your inner experience, which is the most important experience, is shaped by your self-concept. And your self-concept is the way you feel about yourself, towards yourself. It's about the I. That's why Neville tells us to change the feeling of I. But how does one change the feeling of I if they don't know what the I is? And this is where I think it's crucial to understand that the I, the I am, is the individual who lives inside the world of imagination, which is you. So you, the same way you are an individual living in this outer world, eating food and talking to people and going places, you are doing that same thing inside yourself. But the being inside yourself, unlike the outer being, has the ability to change and move within this world effortlessly when it desires to. The problem is, is that we struggle to move inside of imagination because we don't know who we are within it. Because if we knew who we were, we wouldn't worry about any mental circumstance. If we can see that circumstances are mental, then we can see the, the you know the phrase that circumstances don't matter. 
Now, like I said earlier in one of my earlier videos about how everybody is you pushed out and how the confusing that could be. But if we just took, took that same concept and just applied it only within the world of imagination, we can see how true it really is that everybody within me truly is reflecting me. They are me pushed out. And likewise, the, the phrase circumstances don't matter. Well, yes, mental circumstances don't matter because mental circumstances can always be changed. For every problem inside the world of imagination, the solution's there. We just have to access that solution. And the solution, remember, is I am. It's me. I am, to me, is the individual inside the world of imagination who has attached self-concepts to himself or herself and expresses these self-concepts, whether, whether or not they're good, bad, or indifferent, as Neville would say. It doesn't matter what you hold about yourself, you will express it. And it's effortless expression. Um, if you enter the world of imagination and you start fearing something, you, your fear will arise inside this world and show you. It's not doing it to scare you. Your imagination is not trying to frighten you. It's just showing you things you have accepted. Um, it truly is not trying to frighten you. It's actually trying to show you to, so you can fix it. Uh, if you have repeatedly uh, repeated uh, repetitive thoughts that are fearful, it's, it's it's showing you what needs to be changed. It's actually showing you what you actually desire to be changed. Um, the only reason why you don't change it is because you don't know who you are within it. And I want to get into that into a different video. For this video, I just want to talk about states. Or, um, yeah, I just want to talk about states in this video. Um, so if you want to change your inner experience, the scenarios you're, you're finding yourself in, if you find yourself arguing with people, or if you find yourself in situations you don't like to be inside your mind, or you find yourself stuck, remember, you can't be stuck here. Um, you have to learn to change the feeling of I. Now, to change the feeling of I, it's actually um, simple if you understand that you are the I am that precedes things inside this world. That every expression is just a reflection of you. And if you can really accept that, that nobody within you really has any power over you. They're just reflecting. Even if you conjured up people within your mind who have more power than you, um, it's just you doing it. Um, and if you have a desire for a new self-concept, you have to view states, these um, these things that you want to attach to I am, you have to view them almost like an itch. If you have an itch, you scratch it, correct? Do you feel guilty for scratching your itch? No. I, I don't really know anybody who feels guilty for scratching themselves when there's an itch. Well, the same way in imagination, think of an itch as a, a new self-concept. Don't feel guilty. Or don't feel unworthy. You just scratch it. You fulfill it. If you want to change... Um, nothing, there's no bondage within you that stops you from expressing something new within yourself. Now, what I can tell you from experience for me, what tend to happen was when I would go to assume a new state and it would feel so, so incredibly lovely to be this new thing and expressing that in my inner world, I would become afraid. I would become afraid of fully uh, embodying it. And I was almost afraid of how much power I actually had for a while and I share this because um, you might be in a similar situation that you might find yourself thinking is it really that easy just to change my state it's that simple for me to just express something new I have that much power and control and as somebody in from me like I grew up with almost no power no control so it's, it feels quite imbalanced when I first found out who I was within myself that I was allowed to change and just say yes to myself. Um, it was quite a shock. And I felt a little bit embarrassed for how low I thought of myself. But I let that go. And you just, like I said, you think of it like an itch. You just scratch it. That's all you have to do. But what tends to happen is that we take upon the impressions that were given to us um, growing up. And we live that way inside of imagination. So if you aren't taking, for example, in, in my life, I grew up walking on eggshells 24-7. So how do you think I lived inside of imagination? I was walking on eggshells inside my own mind. I wasn't taking these long, confident strides and these long, 
or these, these confident appropriations within myself. I was scared. I was scared to just uh, take things inside my own mind. Um, I don't shame myself for it. It's just I understand why I was why I was walking in eggshells in my own mind. But it's just an itch. <laughs> That's all it is. It, you have to view these states as less than you because you are the I am. No matter what state it is, it's always less than you. Always. Um, you can't have a state that's greater than you because states are, by definition, powerless unless they're given I am. A state doesn't have the power to express itself without you. So if you can um, accept that imagination is the only reality, I want you to think of it like this. Let's say you want to express something. Um, and you feel like maybe it's impossible to express it. Now, I want you just to remove the outer world for a second and just think in terms of imagination inside this world. I want you to name something to me that you don't believe you can express inside this world. I think you'll struggle because you, what you'll find is that no matter what you want, you can express it in this world. Now, what Neville's trying to make us do is realize that that has to be enough evidence that you are who you want to be. If that can be enough evidence, you truly are the master of your own fate. Inside this world of imagination where I think is the only experience we actually have. So if you want to be the master of your own fate inside this world, learn to change states. And what you can do is learn to exalt yourself within yourself. So you, maybe you started off where I started off, where you're walking on eggshells. But slowly, you know, on your own pace, realize who you are within this world and start start uh, breaking the rules, if you will. Maybe I was walking on eggshells for so long and I'm so used to it. Well, let me just break the rule a little, a little bit. Maybe, maybe growing up, it was sort of wrong for me to be confident. Okay, fine. Let me start being confident in my mind and see if that expresses. And then, oh, look, at uh, next thing I know, I'm expressing confidence inside my own mind. Oh, okay, well, let me... Let me try a little bit. Let me try some wealth. Let me see what wealth's like. And let me see if that expresses inside my own mind. And all of a sudden, I find myself expressing that in my mind. Let me try love. Let me try respect. And the next thing I know, there's really nothing that isn't given to me. Everything can be expressed in this world. And nothing's withheld from me. So now I have to learn, this is why I speak so much about exalting the inner self, is that it's really the inner self that must be exalted. It's not so much this outer self. This outer self truly is just mimicking what I'm doing within myself. So if I'm afraid, um, it's not this outer self that's afraid. It's the inner self that's scared. If I feel like I'm in bondage, it's not the outer self that's in bondage. It's the inner self. And if I can see that the, it's the inner self who wants to ex it wants to change states, it's the inner self who wants to express something new inside this world of imagination, well then yes, you truly are limitless because there's nothing you can't express inside this world. This is a beautiful world of imagination where all things exist. All expressions that you want to express are here. They just need occupancy, as Neville says. And occupancy is, is remembering that inside this world, there is no future and there is no past. Things express themselves now. Regardless of when they, when they happen, they express themselves now. So you remove ideas of the future and the past while you're in this world. And you simply experience the expressions of what you're trying to uh, achieve. There really, there really isn't trying to achieve here either because everything already is. All it takes is your acceptance of it. And this is why I speak so much about saying yes to everything inside your imagination. Because if you can learn to say the word yes and not argue the point, um, the level of freedom you will feel will be quite... It might, it might scare you like it scared me is resisting that urge to argue when you say, I am whatever it is. And then the moment you say that and you feel that as a present tense fact, because that's what the I is, that's what the I am is, is the present tense feeling of being. So if you change your present tense feeling of who you are now, what you will find is that your mind will start to express it within yourself and just keep letting it express. Don't hinder it. Don't argue with it. Just keep letting it express. And what you will find is, is it is that simple to change yourself. 
It is that simple. If you realize that, you have to realize who you are within this world. That you're not some... Here's what tends to happen, is that people, tend, including myself, would tend to go into this world of imagination and they say, well, I'm going... Uh, we really have a choice. Who are we going to be in here? We can be anything, right? So who are we going to be? And what tends to happen is people go into their inner worlds and they say, well, I'm going to be somebody who's worried about this thing. And I'm going to be somebody who starts, who's frightened about future events. And I'm going to be somebody who shames myself for my past. And I'm going to be somebody who thinks he can't have that or this. And we live this way inside our minds. And then we wonder, why, why, aren't, why am I not receiving what I want? Why is it that my world is the way it is? Well, I, I tell you, the world is the, your world is the way it is because of your self-concept. Because there's nothing but expressing it. There's nothing but you that's expressing here. So I always tell people, start with the imagination. Remember, Neville says imagining creates reality. Or I should say it, ma it manifests itself into reality, into this reality. So don't be so concerned about your outer world. Figure out who you are in this world, in this inner world. And learn it, learn to express, you really have to learn to express what you want to express in this world in order to express it in this outer world. Um, and, I, and I mean this seriously because if you aren't used to expressing what you want in this inner world where all things can be expressed, you won't express it in your outer world. You just won't. So really learn to uh, learn the art of assumption, as Neville would call it, the art of assumption of assuming things about the self and resist the impulse to restrict and deny yourself. If you can re restrict that, you'll find yourself effortlessly expressing everything you want inside your mind. Now persist in that. This is why, it's, this is why persistence is so wonderful. Because it's persistent in the expression of who you want to be. It's not persistent in trying to become it. You already are it in the mind. <laughs> Just continue being it until it finds its. It, it will express itself in your outer world naturally. Because this world's natural, so you want to feel natural about it inside your mind. So, don't feel that you need to uh, force yourself to become. And if if you need proof that you don't need to force yourself to become things in your mind. Just watch it express itself. You don't. You you can um, imagine yourself a certain way in in an instant. You're expressing it like it's almost as if the current circumstance you just were in, the current mental problem you were just in, doesn't matter to imagination. It just rearranged itself, and you find yourself expressing something new. What tends to happen is uh, we don't believe that new expression. We think we have to work our way into it. It's a, we already are it. Just continue being it regardless of your outer circumstances. Continue being it inside yourself. No one needs to know what you're doing. It's in secret. Now, so you can feel that change is not impossible. It's actually very possible. In fact, we're, we're supposed to do it. Neville tells us all the time that you're supposed to change the feeling of I. Like you have the, you have the, um, you are allowed to, you are allowed to change inside this world. Nothing is restricting you. There's no one telling you, no, you can't. Um, maybe you harmed somebody in your past and you're, you feel guilty and you're like, well, I don't want to do that again. I want to change, but I feel guilty. Um, you're doing that. You don't have to. You can change. Imagination re doesn't restrict you from your past at all. As Neville says, it doesn't look to your background. Um, it doesn't matter. As Neville would give, he would give the example that if you were in jail and the bar is closed and you want to be free, Imagination doesn't stop you from visualizing yourself being free. It gives you all things. Now really take that example to heart. This is somebody who has been just told that they have 25 years. He says, you know, you got you got you just heard the sentence and now you're in the, behind these bars. Neville said he would assume himself free because it's a reflection of him anyways. So if he wants to change his outer world, he frees himself in his mind first. That's what he did when he was in the army. That's what he did when he wanted to get married. You know, he said he said that when he wanted to get married the second time, because you know how he had a first wife. He said that when he wanted to get married, he was uh, worried about how that would work. <laughs> and this is Neville. This is somebody who clearly knows the law and teaches it, but he forgot. Because, you know, we tend to forget when things feel serious to us. When they feel important to us, we tend to forget to apply this law. Because we think, oh, well, this is such a big thing that I want. What if I can't have it? Um, 
So then he tried to work out a scenario where, where like, well, how would I divorce my current wife and how could I be? He was trying to figure it out and then he stopped. And he realized, oh, what am I doing? I'm not practicing the law. So, we, so he went to sleep that night as sleeping as the person he wants to be inside his mind. He associated himself with the inner man who is expressing the thing he wants, which is happily, being happily married. And then next thing you know, it worked itself out in a natural way, and then he found himself to be happily married. So we can learn to, we have to learn to uh, accept our imaginations as the reality and not this outer world. This outer world is, is a dream. It really can be molded and shifted. Now, I don't know if there's limitations to the dream. I'm not really concerned about that. I just say yes and move on with my day. I say yes to what I want. I feel that my imagination loves me enough to say yes, like it truly loves me because it grants me all things. And um, so don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to express yourself here. It's that freedom of expression. It's grant yourself the freedom of expression in this world where you'll find that the freedom of expression truly is the almost the greatest freedom you could have. It really is the greatest freedom to express what you want to express here. Don't allow someone to tell you no because there is no one else to tell you no. There's only I am in this world. I'm talking about the world of imagination. So don't be concerned um, about the mental circumstances you find yourself in. You might be frightened about a thought, but don't be concerned because you can always just move to somewhere else. You, you can't be stuck here. You just can't. Um, to, in order to be stuck, you'd have to feel and say, I am stuck. But you're the I am, so you can apply a new thing to it and then find yourself expressing that. Um, so what what um, what you can do is you can learn to live in this world of by understanding that imagination has granted you all things inside of it. And all things I mean by that is... Um, you can express the things you desire to express no matter what it is inside this world. You can now start to live in an imagination where you know, there's no regret, there's no shame, there's no guilt, there's no problems, there's no, um, yeah, I should say, um, problems that can't be solved. There's no, um, there's no fear in it. You can live in an imagination where there's safety, there's a your desires are always fulfilled where um, you are expressing the things you desire to express. You're expressing the love you desire to share. You can receive the love you want to share. All things exist in here. But um, to be honest, many of us don't live that way because we don't know who we are within it. We, we think we have to be these, um, oh, I'm going to go into, inside this world of imagination and I'm going to imagine myself really feeling like I can't have what I want. <laughs> and uh, when you realize that you, you are deciding to express that in this infinite plane of, of imagination, you'll find how silly it is. And uh, you might feel what I felt, which was a bit silly. I felt a bit silly that I was being this way inside my mind. I put myself so low, thinking that I was being humble. <laughs> Um, yeah, don't, don't don't feel that you need to be you need to bring yourself down. It doesn't make there's no one else expressing here but you. You can lift yourself to great heights in your mind and have people love that you're there. It's up to you, really. Like the limitations you decide to impose on yourself inside this world of imagination is truly up to you. And you don't want it to be up to somebody else. Let it be up to you. And you might find yourself, like I found myself, uh, almost fearing certain states because they're so grand. And I was like, oh, I don't know if I'm worthy of that. It's like, again, I'm claiming I'm going to be somebody inside my mind who feels they're unworthy for th the things within it. Don't be that person. You're worthy of all things. Because <laughs> you have imagination. You were granted imagination, which contains all things. So how can you feel unworthy of it? If all things are yours. So, um, I want to speak on something that I find uh, incredibly important. I think that every video I'm going to make is something I find important. 
It's just that um, the title is going to be called uh, Be Angry, uh, Sin Not. And I think I'm going to talk about three things, which is uh, the concept of being angry, um, sin, and righteousness. And why I think Neville breaks it down better than other teachers and why him using the scriptures is is a much better or more freeing way because I think what happens with this type in this type of community from what I've seen um, I was fortunate enough to get into this uh, get into the law not by any other teacher but Neville so Neville was actually the first teacher I ever read about this stuff and I was only intrigued by him because of his interpretation of the Bible. It actually had nothing to do with the law. But since I started studying him and seeing his, um, practicing his methods, um, I read about other people and I would read, um, I'm not going to name them, but I would read other teachers. And there's a big emphasis on being happy, I noticed. Like, it wasn't a problem if you had an emotion that wasn't happy. Now there's nothing wrong with being happy. I know I actually know people who are, who are almost always happy. I know I'm not <laughs> always happy, um, but it's okay. And here's I can tell you why it's okay in terms of Neville's uh, teachings. So the this comes from the um, I can't even remember what. Let me see if I can even find the scripture um, because be angry and sin not comes from Paul, uh, from the letter of the um, Ephesians, and, you know, this is somebody, Paul, who I think clearly knew the law. Um, obviously, there's some problems with the letters, if they're even his letters, and that's a whole different topic, but um, he coined the term, basically, be angry, but sin not. And Neville, um, in many of his lectures, has stated that, you know, maybe there's a day where it doesn't go the way you wanted it to go. Or maybe you fell into a state uh, without even realizing it. You fell into an old pattern that you didn't even realize. Um, maybe you're angry about that. Or maybe it wasn't just the day didn't work. Maybe it could have been just been a little bit better. Um, Neville tells you to explode. <laughs> he tells you to just get it off your chest, say what you want to say. Say it all out. Don't don't re um, repress or suppress these feelings. Um, express them, and then he says, "But don't sin." Now, this is why I find Neville so freeing because it's not so much about like always riding a happy high or forcing yourself to be happy because we all know that 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 doesn't work. I mean, anybody that tells you to uh, any teacher that tells you to be happy all the time, it's not gonna work. Um, it, it's you're going to have tons of resistance because it's just not natural. Um, if your day didn't go as planned, it didn't go as planned and or didn't just go the way you wanted it to go. Um, so you're angry about it. Well, yeah, get it off your chest. Um, vent. Uh, maybe just, maybe you don't have to vent to anybody. You can just vent to yourself. Um, but don't sin. And he basically says, don't let like, the day end with you sinning. And sinning, <clears throat> has nothing to do with um, committing some immoral act. It has to do with um, right. It has to act, it's the opposite of righteousness. So to not sin is to be righteous. But to be righteous means to be in fulfillment of what you want to be. Um, so you can think of it like fulfill or sinning is basically saying I am not or I hope, or I was, or I wish I could be. It's But fulfillment, righteousness is I am. Um, I want you to see that it's actually I am is what you're seeking. That is actually what you're seeking. Um, but what happens is that many of us go into imagination and we'll say things like, I hope I will become this one day. I'm going to imagine this so I can become it one day. And I understand why we do that. Um, but I want you to see how the thinking is actually uh, just needs to be tweaked just a little bit. It doesn't need to be this um, huge, huge understanding. It just needs to be tweaked. And this is what it needs to be tweaked too, is that when you say like, I'm going to imagine this so I can become it. Who are you speaking to when you say, 
I can become it, the I there. Because I want you to see that what tends to happen is we, we tend to say, I want to become this. When we say I, we mean the outer body, we mean this outer person. I want the outer person to become it. But the outer person is simply reflecting what the inner man's doing. And I want you to see that the, the one living inside of imagination is the one who wants to be freed or he wants to change himself. And his name is not I hope, it's not I was, it's I am. His name is I am. So the one within you wants to change. Everything can be said yes to this being within you because everything exists in imagination for you to have. It doesn't matter what it is. So when you are... Um, living in sin you're basically living you the inner self is living in imagination not in fulfillment of what they want they're living in either an i was or i did or i i wish but not i am i want you to see that i am is everything you want you want to say you want to be free from something know that when you say i want to be free the i there is the one within you the guy or the the person within you that's who wants to be freed. And they can be in imagination. You know, there's a... Um, speaking from personal experience, I remember um, I had a big problem with... Uh, I guess you can call them intrusive thoughts, but they are really just like... Um, I had this fear of just my scenes being ruined. And... Um, I would loop them and loop them and loop them and then eventually they'd be ruined. But I want you to see that looping a scene is actually the same. If you loop a scene without actually feeling you are it, that's the same as a f just doing vain repetitions with your mouth. I mean, it's the same. It doesn't really do anything. You're just, um, they call it, I think it was Joseph Murphy who called it like you're like a parrot. A parrot doesn't really understand what they're saying. They just repeat back to what they hear. And uh, that's similar to what we're doing when we are just looping a scene with no with not feeling that we are that now so the goal is to get to i am um but i am i like i said he's the one within the, it's the person or the i don't know what you want to call him it's the bodiless one within you the voice that's the one who wants to claim what they want to claim about themselves to be true and if you could see that um that when you say I want, it's actually the inner self who's saying I want. The I there is the inner self. It creates a huge freedom within you. Because righteousness and sinning does not depend on this world, but it depends on the one within you. Because the one out here is reflecting the one within. So when I was having intrusive thoughts uh, that were ruining my scenes, here's it let's let's go to I statements. I was actually going into into my mind me the inner self and I was feeling and saying I hope my scenes don't get ruined but I was feeling fear that they would be ruined that's a I am statement I am afraid um, that my scenes will be ruined but if I just change my I am to saying I am no longer afraid and I am is fulfillment I am is not I'm trying to be or I'm trying to get it's I am you never say I am in terms of I hope I can be that one day. When you claim things about yourself now and you say I am this, I am that, they're factual claims or present tense, factual claims or present tense feelings that you have about yourself, about the inner self. When I say self, I mean inner self, the one inside of imagination. That is the one you need to free. That is the one who is sinning, meaning he's, he's not living in the in the way you want to live in imagination. You don't want to fear there anymore. Maybe you don't want, to, maybe you want to feel that you can finally be what you want to be. Maybe you want to be able to finally claim I am whatever it is. Um, you don't have to live in, um, in a, a bondage inside of imagination. And if you can see that whenever you want to be free, it's the, inner self the inner man who wants to be free that's the one and i keep repeating this because it seems to, we seem to forget it but it's so important to see that it's the inner one who is desiring he's the one who wants to be fulfilled or they are the one who wants to be fulfilled it's them and it can be every time no matter what it is no matter how small of a desire 
it can be given. So give it to yourself in imagination. And when I say self, I mean the inner self. Um, when you imagine, I remove, so when I imagine, I remove concepts of the body and time. I let go of it all and I go into imagination and I, and I know that deep down what I truly want is I am. And what I mean by that is I want to present tense factually feel what that I'm free. And you can just feel, and, and when you start to actually uh, go towards the I am, whatever it is you want to be, you'll give, uh, you'll be given a, a freedom, um, a certain ease to your body. But don't be afraid of that. That is you actually entertaining and feeling that I am. You're, that's you freeing the inner self. And you, well, you'll see that you freeing the inner self actually opens this body up. It actually makes this body more uh, feel wonderful. So it really is interacting with, you really are, so say your body really is reflecting the emotional pains that your inner self is experiencing. So it's really important to see that um, it's not about forcing yourself to be happy. It's about fulfillment. It's about fulfilling your desires within yourself. That's righteousness. That's the antidote to sin. And this is so much more powerful than trying to uh, be happy. Don't try to be happy. Um, fulfill your desires and be what you want to be within. The happiness will come. All of that, all the ease, all of that will come. But learn to um, exalt yourself within. Um, I always, you know, you know how there are people in this world that they live in very, very um, lavish places. And there's also people who live in very, very uh, slumps in this world. The same goes with an imagination. The inner self can live in slumps. It can live in this desperate desire to always want and want and want and never gets fulfillment. I grew up with a deep fear that once something good happens to me, it's going to be taken away from me. And um, this fear really plagued me in my life. And I wanted, I wanted it gone. I didn't realize it was my inner self who wanted it gone, and he wanted it gone inside of imagination. I wanted, I actually wanted, I noticed that the thing I wanted, um, when you grow up in a way that, you know, isn't loving, I grew up in a way that was very abusive, um, you don't really desire money or objects that much. You really don't desire anything physical. What you really desire is to not be afraid anymore. You desire to feel fearless. Which is to to say you're in, you're in you want to be in love to be in love is to not be in fear, and um, that's what I wanted, but I didn't know that it was my inner self who wanted that. My inner self wanted to stop being afraid inside of imagination. My inner self wanted to feel confident that no matter what I say, it happens, and nothing takes it away. And when I saw that it's just me taking it away from myself. I was able to stop, but I had to take responsibility for that. It was the, it was myself, my inner self who was creating it all. I was creating my fears inside of imagination. And that's actually where I wanted to be freed. And when we see that it's actually the inner self inside of imagination wants to be freed, um, that's why Neville says to desire is to have. Because when you desire something inside of imagination, you can have it. So you live in that type of fulfillment, no matter what it is. And um, I can tell you just from experience that feeling fr there's no price you can pay on feeling free and feeling unafraid or feeling like the thing that has been frustrating you inside your mind is gone. I mean, it's priceless. And you can have that because anything can be given. The imagination, here's something I learned as well, was that not only was I creating the feeling that it will be taken away from me or something will be ruined and I was doing that all, the imagination never takes. It only gives. I'm going to say that again. The imagination never takes. It only gives. It's only giving. It always says yes. It never takes anything from you. It can't because it's all, all things exist within it. So 
you can go into a dream where things are being taken from you, but you can, the, the dream of things being given to you also exists. It gives you all things, everything. You, 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 you know, it's up to you to choose. But I want to read an excerpt from uh, this lecture. Uh, it's called uh, You Find Jesus Christ as Yourself in 1966, lecture from Neville. And he says this, Be angry. The day didn't go as you wanted it to go. Be angry, but sin not. Sinning is missing the mark. Don't let your anger go with you into the deep of sleep. Don't stop. Be angry. Get it off your chest. At that moment, having blown your top, as it were, now don't sin. Sinning is missing the mark. So you have an objective, a goal. Now commune with your own heart on your bed and be still and be silent. And now you're told, what to do. Bring the right sacrifice. The word translated right in the King James Version is the sacrifice of righteousness. Righteousness is right thinking. Forget now, having blown my top, and then start the right thinking, and commune and say, I want. Now don't, now what I didn't get today, what I want. Now the opposition to what I want, I wanted what I want. <laughs> that could talk so interesting. Then as I commune with myself, reach the point of being thankful. Thank you. And then we are told, trust in the Lord. Bring the sacrifice of righteousness and trust in the Lord. Just go to bed that way and see how it works. The whole thing works quickly. Don't postpone it. And don't try to aid it. It's all within you. And the rearranged structure here in here rearranges it there out there it's only a reflection it's only a response so let no one say to you or convince you that because of your background or your limitations of birth that you are stuck apologies for that no one is stuck save he who sticks himself. Now notice the importance of forget that you even blow, you know, maybe you blew your top and you went angry, but he says, forget that. Now be who you want to be in imagination. Don't sin. Don't postpone it. You want to claim I am and feel what I am means to you. I am is the most important word you can say. It's a factual feeling, present tense about yourself. It's not something you're going to become. That is changing the self because the self's name is I am, the inner self. So you say, I am free. Really feel what that feels like. Free the inner self and exalt them and continuously reaching higher and higher states. But don't postpone it. Maybe you had a bad day. He says, blow your top off. Get it off your chest and then forget you even said any of those words and commune with yourself and grant yourself everything you want. You, you will naturally, um, I, I dislike gratitude work. I don't like, I don't like, it's the same thing to me as forcing yourself to be happy, it's forcing yourself to be thankful. These aren't forcing. Once you fulfill things within yourself, you will naturally feel gratitude. It's just a natural response. You just can't help it. You feel so thankful that you're free. It's that simple. You can't help but think imagination for how giving it is. So don't postpone it. I'm going to repeat this last sentence. No one is stuck, save he sticks himself. Imagination plus faith. Um, imagination plus faith uh, is, a, is something that Neville always spoke about even towards the end of his death. And I, and I think that from experience that you really only need these two things to change yourself. It's that simple. And um, I'm going to explain what I think faith is and um, persistence and imagination. And I'm speaking from somebody, <clears throat> I'm speaking from somebody who's, I've tried many, many things. I've tried subconscious impressing, I've tried gratitude work, I've tried um, just repeating affirmations all day. I've even put in like headphones and 
fell asleep to eight hour affirmations. Like I thought this stuff would like do something for me that would, I guess I wanted it to one day just magically change me. But it, it, I'm gonna be honest, it, it never really worked. And um, I actually realized that the reason why it didn't work is I didn't have faith. I didn't know that at the time, but um, it's true. All you need is imagination and faith. And um, faith, you know, you can re- if you don't like the word faith, just replace it with trust. Maybe tr- I think trust is more of a better word for our modern tongue. But faith is also it's also a good word if you view, if you use the definition um, as Neville did from the Bible. It's actually a pretty good definition. Um, um, faith, as it says, is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. So you feel a conviction of you know your imaginal acts. And that's what faith is, completely trusting in those imaginal acts as real. And um, in this lecture, Neville gives the example of him walking on the gangplank and, you know, leaving Barbados when he was stuck there. And he said, you know, he made the scene just feel so natural to him, but he trusted in that scene at that. He didn't, he didn't argue against the scene. That's what trusting means. To trust someone is not to, or to trust the imagination is not to argue against it. It's not to fight or reason or debate it. It's just to accept what it's saying. That is that. That's what faith is. Um, and in this world of imagination, since the world's reflecting you here, there is no one to change but self here. So you don't have to change anyone. You don't have to force yourself to think. Well, I need to. Uh, I don't like this person. I need to change them. I need to change it. That, that you you would uh, over exhaust yourself. All you need to do is change self. And the self, as I said, is I am. It's the individual inside of imagination. This world of reflection, if you will, is I am. And the only reason why that's the only thing to change is because that's the only thing there is. There is only I am in this world. So there's only one thing to change. There's this unity between, you know, you the listener and me the speaker right now, where I say I am Edward and you say you are, you know, say you would say I am whoever. We both say I am before. There's a unity between humanity with this word I am. This awareness of being. And because because it's the only thing there is and it's the only thing to change, it's actually the only thing you fear. The only thing we fear in this world is I am because it's the only thing there is. And what I mean by that is you don't really fear the things that are happening in the world, or at least you shouldn't. You shouldn't be afraid of all these problems in the world because it comes down to your I am statements. If you were, you are actually afraid of I am um, rejectable, I am bad, I am ashamed, I am wrong, or I am ill. These are the, these I am statements are actually the things you fear. Because the world could be crumbling, but if you feel I am safe, you're safe. If you feel like I am, if you assume these positions and, and you trust in them, then it doesn't really matter what's happening in the world. It really doesn't matter. And since it's only one being here, um, you rearrange the I am there and everyone else would have to rearrange their position towards you in relation to you into that new state that you've, you've imagined yourself because there's only one being here. And I'm gonna say that again, the only thing you fear is I am. So the and the only thing you must change is I am. But then we're told something very interesting. Um, Neville reveals to us, you know, the Bible also stresses that it is impossible. It says it actually says impossible, which I find interesting. Um, it is impossible to please me. I think this is more of a um, hyperbole, but it's it's true um, in some sense. You can think of it like it's impossible. To, it says it's impossible to please God without faith and God as Neville describes is imagination and I describe that as the I am the self I mean the same thing the one the being within us the one within that is reflecting out of here or expressing themselves out so you cannot please this being within you without faith so if I conjure up a scene or I conjure up or I tell myself I am whatever If I'm not feeling pleasure from that, then I'm not trusting in it. 
Because if if I had a desire and it was fulfilled, you would bet that I would feel immense pleasure from that. I would feel if I've been striving or I've been desiring for years to be something and I imagine myself being it and I'm not feeling pleasure from that, I'm not trusting that I'm it now. See, it's trust that changes us like that. It's the trust that is trusting in that new uh, experience that I am what I want to be. If you can trust in that, um, or trust in the, as I said in one of my previous videos, if you say yes to being what you want or having what you want, if you trust in that yes, you will feel ecstasy. You will feel a change. And that change will happen in the body. So the body feels the um, the body feels the ease that is what's, what's being done within you in imagination from the freeing of yourself, the freeing of I am in imagination. Your body feels it. And if so, I can tell you an example. Uh, I remember when I first one of my one of my first manifestations um, with using Neville's work. Um, I was like, I want to manifest a um, hundred dollar bill. I was like, let's just see if I can get a hundred dollar bill. I was like, I don't really use bills. I wanted something that I didn't really use often. I was like, I use credit cards. I don't really use bills. Um, but I was like, let's just see if I can do it. So I imagined myself um, holding it with my imaginary hands. And I held a hundred dollar bill and I was looking at it and I felt that it was mine. And I just moved on with my day. I didn't really think of anything else after that. And then about a couple of days later, I was, um, this was years ago, I was in an internship and I was um, training these pe- these older folks for um, fitness. And one of them comes up to me and he just hands me a hundred dollar bill. And I said, oh no, I'm, I'm okay, thanks. <laughs> I thought it was strange at first. Like, Why is he handing me money? And um he was like, no, 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 take it. I, uh, I'm rich. Don't worry about it. And so I took it. And it didn't even occur to me until like 10 minutes later, I was holding it in my hand again. And I was like, oh, wait a minute. I, I just, I did imagine this. But if, but if we were to go backwards in time and see where the first act of change in reality happened, the first shifting, if you will, because Neville says the moment you imagine yourself in a new state, reality shifts itself, reshuffles itself. Well, the first act of the reshuffling actually happened in my body because my body is a part of this world. So the first act of change or reshuffling in this world happened actually within myself, which was the acceptance of the wish fulfilled, as Neville says, caused an outer change within this reality, which was first happened in my body. And then from that, it expressed itself. And I went across that bridge of incidents, which really is just living normal life. Um, you can think of it like that. It's just, I'm just living my normal day life and I'm actually walking across a bridge that I even know um, because it all feels so natural and it should all feel natural. But um, seeing that first change, you can have confidence that that the moment you feel that pleasure and that euphoria, that you are changing, you are actually changing reality in front of you because your body is a part of reality itself. Remember, you are not the body. You are the being within the body. The body is the same thing as the sweater you're wearing on the body. It's a garment. It's a thing you're wearing. It's in, and I mean, that's how personally how I see it. You can take what you want from that, but that's how I see it. And what I want people to do is to realize that they have these divine ears and these divine eyes within them that can hear and hear, what they, hear the things they want to hear and see the things they want to see within themselves. The question is, do you trust what you're seeing? Do you trust what you're hearing? Do you trust that that is now you, that you are now experiencing that? You can't experience it unless you are it. So you trust that you are it because you're experiencing it. I must, I must be what I'm experiencing. So use your divine ears and divine eyes and remold your world within you because you are the potter. You truly are the potter within. Um, these divine eyes and divine ears can penetrate the thin crust of this illusion. So if you want to understand what does it mean to trust in my imagination is the moment I say I am, I don't, I don't seek anything outside of me to do this. I don't seek anything in the world. I just say I am whatever it is I want to be. You, you, you really don't have to use I am statements. You can say, I remember one time Neville said like, maybe you want to feel that not a thing in the world can embarrass you. Not a thing in the world can shame you. If you want to feel that, trust and your imagination that that is now the case. Fully trust in it and you'll feel a change instantly. And then don't be afraid of that pleasure. That, that pleasure is you trusting in imagination. 
and I and I'm telling I'm speaking from somebody who's tried many many techniques and many many things and the way Neville broke it down which is imagination plus faith truly is the only things you need to change oneself it's the only things you need to change your world because it's the only things you're actually using we many of us just use these in a negative route or a fearful route we conjure up negative fearful scenarios about ourselves and we we trust in those scenarios and then those scenarios cause frightful feelings within us but if we can realize that we have to now start living now that we are aware of what we're doing within ourselves we have now the power to change self in a, in a and in a way that we can change it is by fulfilling all our wishes but if i'm fulfilling my wishes i should feel pleasure so that's how you would know that's the indicator to know if i'm trusting in it or not and i persist in that trusting that I am. I persist in trusting imagination. It's imagination plus faith. So I, I just persist in my faith in, in imagination that I am what I want to be. And I walk in that faith and that new trusting until it happens in my world. You can, uh, some, sometimes for me, I just forget about what I'm doing because I don't, if you feel like you don't need to continuously imagine it anymore, you feel that and you trust in that, just walk in that. You don't need to you know, as Neville says, burst a blood vessel. You can treat this lightly. Actually, I actually recommend you treat it lightly. You just imagine something great for yourself, trust in it, and then do, do it to something else now. Just start planting lots of seeds in your day. Just try to plant as many seeds as you can in your day, and you'll reap a good harvest. You're making sound investments with your mind. Because the, really the only investment there is is I am. And the only thing you want is I am, which by I am, I mean it's the present tense feeling of being. It's... You know, you're not working to become it. You feel that you are it now. You don't seek the world for it. There's a, a post that I've made called um, uh, The Less You Look, The More You'll See. And the reason why I said this is because um, over time what I discovered was it's almost as if if I just continuously imagine and plant seeds and live in my imagination and I don't seek anything from my world. I don't seek to look for it. I don't seek to change it. I do, as Neville says, I do nothing but let it express. I don't lift a finger. I don't even look at it. I've noticed I see more and more of my seeds that I've planted, which I found quite ironic. It's when we when, so when we keep looking to see, is it growing? Is it growing? Is it growing? It, it almost feels like it never grows. But the moment I turn my back towards it, all of a sudden it appears. So I just learned to not take the world in front of me as um, as this concrete fact that um, is difficult to break, you know, the mold. But I view it as, uh, I actually don't even look at it. I just know that it's my harvest and my harvest will change because I'm planting new seeds. But I just noticed there's over time, if I just move on with my day and I don't really think about m my outer world like that, I don't check upon it, I just start seeing more and more things that I've imagined come into being quickly way quicker so i'm gonna i'm gonna repeat that it was that the less you look the more you'll see and i i truly believe that from my own experience so um i want to repeat there is no one to change but self and the way you can change self is through trusting that trusting your imagination that you are who you want to be and that trust will cause a pleasure which is the first act of change in your reality and you keep trusting in that until it expresses fully. And, or, or you can go uh, another route, which is um, you just plant seeds all day. Neville did both. Neville would do both. He was like, I, there'd be times where I would feel immense ecstasy because I'm giving myself everything I want. I would just feel tons and tons of ecstasy and I'd walk in my day like that. Or I would just plant a ton of seeds. I would just move on and move on and move on. And Neville was very much like, I like to just think about one thing at a time, but that I don't stop there. Sometimes just throughout my day, I'll just go plant more and more things and that's how we have to view this this is like um we really this is truly like a garden it's like an imaginative garden that we're planting that's expressing itself from without and um you really are the gardener you're the one who plants the seeds you are the potter you know the that's why i truly love the bible because it always puts you in the position of the one who's in control the one who can shape and mold and you truly have the power to shape and mold your life because your life is within you 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 have to see that your desires are within you. Your fears are within you. So these, this is where you must change it. And you have the power to change all your fears. Everything is within you. So you have a desire, 
realize that desire is within the world of imagination and that's where it must be fulfilled. And you continuously live that life. And I truly view this as a lifestyle. To me, this was never like a one and done. Um, it never has been the case for me. I've always wanted to understand what is being said here because I wanted something that I could live upon. Um, and I recommend that for everybody. If you can understand this information, truly live your life upon it, you won't regret it. Um, but don't stress yourself. Use imagination and faith. The feeling we seek. I want to speak about um, the word feeling in the context of Neville's teachings because this is a word that is so commonly um, um, misused in my opinion. And for me, it confused me as well. But um, what we should ask is more of the question. Instead of asking, like, what does he mean by it? What, is he, what does he mean by that? And um, does it mean emotion? Does it mean this? Um, we should really ask the questions, well, what are we after? What feeling are we honestly after? And um, Neville actually tells us uh, quite clear what it is. It's actually the feeling of it being done. The feeling of fulfillment. The feeling of the desire being granted. That is the feeling we're after. Um, you know, Neville once quoted, I do not mean emotion, but the acceptance of the fact that my wish has been fulfilled or that my desire has been granted. The acceptance of that fact, that's, that's the feeling. Um, and then he also tells us what the feeling of the wish fulfilled means in uh, chapter four of Power of Awareness. He tells you right at the end of it, he says, the feeling of the wish fulfilled means you make the future dream a present fact. So that's what that means. You make a future dream a present fact to you. Um, now, to make the future dream a present fact, that means that you experience the reality of your desire as though it's a present fact to you. You just experience it. You don't do anything but... Um, you can just claim the words, you can just um, visualize a scene where you're just experiencing it because if you were who you wanted to be, all you would do is experience being it. You wouldn't do anything else. There wouldn't be this um, um, great, I guess you wouldn't, you wouldn't do anything unnatural. It would be so natural to you to be what you want to be. You just would experience being it. Maybe you'd have somebody tell you that you are it or congratulate you on it or you're simply visualizing yourself being where you're supposed to be. If you were who you wanted to be, you would just experience that version of yourself. You would feel what that version feels. You would hear what that version hears. You would see what that version sees. And that's all you would do because that's all you would do if you were it in the world. So you just experience it. You must be what you experience in imagination. You must be it if you truly experience it. And to experience is the easiest thing in the world. You're experiencing right now what um, what you currently are holding within yourself. You know, there's this story. Um, <laughs> I'm debating whether or not I should get into this story right now. No, yeah, let's get into it. Um, there's a story about Neville where he talks about this man who was rich. And he wanted to experience poverty. So he um, decides to imagine or he decides to go to Africa and... <laughs> To experience poverty so he goes there to uh you know not have any food he leaves his mansion in the united states flies over to africa for like two weeks lives with these people these poor people and basically you know doesn't have food or water and then he comes back to his house uh, after two weeks and he walks into his mansion and he goes to bed uh, and he thinks he experienced poverty and neville says that he did not experience poverty at all not one bit. If he experienced poverty, he would assume the state of being poor and he would really experience it. He would experience all those thoughts. He experience all those struggles that a poor person has. He would really experience it. It wouldn't be some fake where I have, oh, I actually have millions in the, at, back at home, but I'm just pretending. We're not pretending. That's pretending. When we imagine we are not pretending, we are actually immersing ourselves in feeling 
um, that we are already what we want to be. We just experience it. We don't question. We don't really think, well, I'm really just laying in my bed in my undesirable state, imagining myself, you know, being what I want to be, but it's not real. No, you completely let go of your present state. And you, as Neville says, you go mad and you completely assume you are what you want to be. You assume it. So it's not pretending. It's not like that guy. I always found that story funny because that that man did not experience poverty. <laughs> not one bit. <laughs> um, but when you imagine your desire being fulfilled, you so you imagine and you trust that you can almost do this. You can almost say, I want whatever it is you want. And you can hear your imagination speak back to you saying, yes, it is done. Now, if you trust in it, fully trust in that, you will feel no fear. There will, you, you won't feel it. You have to feel that there's nothing to defend yourself from. Um, you don't have to be defensive about anything. There's no one who's going to do anything to you. No one can take it away. You completely let go of all of those fears. There's no anxieties about it. Because you're trusting. Trusting removes all of those anxieties and all those fears. And then when those are removed, in comes, because uh, love is a form of, uh, or trust is a form of love, in comes pleasure. Um, or some sense of pleasure. So trusting in the acceptance or the um, in that yes hearing it from imagination you, you are you're trusting in your imagination from that which is the only power so you you can almost feel that i'm trusting the only creative power it says yes so it's a yes i don't question it now when you accept that that elicits an emotional response or a motor response the key word there is response so from feeling the wish fulfilled or my desire has been said yes to or it's been granted to me, that elicits an emotional response or a motor response. But that um, will be subjective to you. For me, there are times where I just feel immense pleasure because it's been granted or I just I feel intense gratitude. Um, these are not forced. They're responses to the acceptance of it being done. It's my trust or my faith in the fact that it's been done causes me to have emotional responses that are pleasurable to me. So I don't force emotional responses. I let it all be natural, just as if someone gave me a wonderful gift. I wouldn't force myself to be thankful. If it's something I truly wanted and they gave it to me, you, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't pretend to be thankful. I really fully trust and believe in that yes, and that causes, and by emotive response, I mean like maybe my body opens up or I just smile or I just gently smile. It's all natural. That's all I need to do. I've accepted it and, I've, and there's no forcing. It's just a, a very natural response to, um, like I said, something I've been wanting has been given to me. Of course, I'm gonna feel pleasure, um, but it's, I'm not pretending. I actually accept it's been granted to me. I believe in my imagination. And um, while I'm imagining, I do not worry or ask. I don't even entertain when it will happen or how it will happen. I don't entertain those. They're not, you don't have to, um, and to be honest, those are easier to let go of, in my opinion, to, because if you look back, there are so many times where you've imagined stuff and they, it's come into being, you don't even realize how it happened. So you can trust your imagination knows the ways and means, um, just from past experiences. I mean, at least for me, I can just go to past experience and realize, there's just no way I could have conjured up that. So uh, those, those bridge of incidences, so I don't have to worry about how it will happen. When it will happen, I've always noticed it's been on perfect timing. So I don't even worry about when. I don't care about those two things. While I am imagining, the future and the past are gone from my mind. I just experience as a, as a present fact what my desire is. So I don't, I make the, the, uh, the desire into fulfillment. And what I also do not do is I let go of all what ifs. I don't what if, which is to doubt. I don't, I don't say yes, okay, thank you, it's been given to me, but what if, what if something bad really happened? Or what if I get my desire, it's not what I want? Or what if, what if, what if? I don't say those things. I don't ask what, I don't ask how, I don't ask or uh, what if. I just accept it's been said yes to. And that's how you, that's, if you, 
stop doing all of that, you will understand exactly what I'm saying, that it elicits an emotional response. You will feel um, some response from it. You will feel very either delighted or pleasurable or you'll be smiling. That is your response to feeling it fulfilled. That's you not doubting. That's you trusting in imagination. You're no longer what ifing. You're no longer asking how or when. You let those completely go. It's not your concern. All your concern. There is only one goal here. And the only goal is to um, accept that it's done. That is the only goal there is. It's to experience it being given to you entirely with no strings attached. You mean, there's no strings attached. It gives, it gives you all things. If you accept it, it can give you all things. And I'm telling you, when you let go of what if and you just accept everything that comes to you that you want and you don't doubt it within your own mind, you, you will feel so much pleasure. It doesn't matter what it is. You can say, like I said in my last video, no one can embarrass you. Don't what if that, just accept it. Say yes and believe in the yes and move on and do it to something else and you just keep doing it to everything. You fully trust in your imagination and you will have no fear at all because trust removes the fear and it removes all your anxieties. And you can, and this is, um, there's a proverb that says, um, <clears throat> hope deferred makes the heart go sick, but a desire fulfilled is the tree of life. So if you want if you want to have life, it tells you to fulfill your desires. But hope deferred, you see, your desires being deferred or not being fulfilled, um, makes your heart sick. So if you want to heal your heart, you have to fulfill your desires within yourself. And when you and you cannot fulfill desires within you, if you are what ifing them, or if you're asking how or when, you're not fulfilling them. They're not. It's not about the when has already been answered. It's now. The how has already been, it's now. You don't ask these questions in imagination. They're already fulfilled. And there's no what ifs because you're the creator of everything within you. So you don't have to, well, what if something, what if this happens? What if that happens? Well, you have to create that for, that for it to happen. So don't worry about it. Don't ask how. You don't need to. You don't need to ask when or what ifs. So to, to heal your heart, you want to fulfill your desires. And as I said in my previous videos um, about this is about having an itch and you're scratching it. You have to think of it that way. But you can also think of it like if you, when you're hungry, you eat. But when you're desiring, why don't you give yourself fulfillment? And remember, desires are within you. So you fulfill them within you. You change them to fulfillments within. And uh, I want to give a... Um, to, to summarize all of us, I really want, I think Neville really in this lecture called uh, Grace versus Law, I think he really nails it. He says, um, as a quote, well, my work is to simply trust my imagination completely. Whenever I go to bed at night, the very last thought, just as I'm, as, just as I'm about to retire, I think of those I would like to help and those who have called upon me for help. And all I do is I just think of them. I know my father knows before I ask him what is asked of me. And so I think of them. And I know exactly what they asked me. I accept it completely and it's done. When, it, when it's going to be done, I don't know. How it's going to be done, I still don't know. I only know I think of them. And thinking of them, I know what they asked of me. And that was enough. And, go, and go, I go sound asleep completely oblivious of anything else. If I'm blessed that night with a vision, all the good. A dream, all the good. But the next day I do not wonder, I, want, I, do not, I do not think, I wonder if it worked. I have complete confidence in my father that it worked. Whether they tell me or not, I don't really care. I'm not seeking credit. I'm not seeking praise from them. I really don't care. Well, when they do tell me, I can share it with you and it encourages everyone who comes here to trust God. And may I tell you again, God is your own wonderful human imagination. He's not on the outside. He's actually sunk in you as your wonderful human imagination. Man is all imagination, and God is man, and exists in us and we in him. The eternal body is the imagination, and that is God himself, Blake. Trust it, believe it, and see how things work in, your, in this world. And um, I find that to be um, 
so important when you realize that he says, I don't ask how, I don't ask when. Um, I'm, I'm oblivious to it all. I just, I just think of them. I just accept it. That's all I do. And I move on with my day. And um, that is you accepting that. That is your faith that it's done. It's, remember, it's, faith is the conviction of things unseen. So you imagine yourself being something or you say you're being something. You can also say the conviction of things not heard by mortal ears. So you're, you're hearing things inside your mind and you're believing in them. You're not, you don't think they're false, forcing it upon you. That's delusion. You believe that they're true, fully believing that they're true. And then you walk by faith and not by your sight. And that is the feeling we seek. No conditions. Now, conditions are things that we um, self-impose we un upon our own desires. And that's why we struggle to fulfill them, because we think that we, we put conditions of time and space, our body, our present limitations, and we condition our desires that way. We say, well, I can't have this until that or because uh, until my life's like this, then I can imagine that or um, I'm not where I physically want to be. So I can't um, imagine what I want to imagine. I can't accept it. Um, perfect example of this conditioning was when um, Neville was asked the question, suppose I want to have a house, but the house takes six months to build. What should I do? Um, Neville says, imagine that you're sleeping in the house tonight. Don't wait. Remember, hope deferred makes the heart sick. So don't wait. Don't add the time, the condition of time upon it. And don't add the, con the condition of the, or the past, maybe your past mistakes. Don't, I'm going to speak about why that's important to let go of as well when you imagine. Why past mistakes and fears of the future need to be gone while you imagine these are conditions they don't allow you to experience fulfillment they re they restrict you from experiencing it in imagination and um the body as well as a condition thinking that well well by, by the body i mean like your present limitations where you're at physically also as a limitation thinking well i can't i can't be where i want to be because where i'm at physically um but also neville gave the example of somebody who was thrown in jail and they wanted to be free. They, they could imagine themselves free. They don't have to live behind the bars. And, um, and this is not a, you know, we're not, um, when I say let go of conditions, these aren't, you know, I'm not, you know, you don't have to force yourself to let go of them. There are things you get to let go of while you imagine they are free. Remember, conditions are restrictions. So the more and more free you feel, the less uh, conditions you're actually imposing upon yourself. And, um, Conditions of time and space seem to be very difficult to let go of because that's basically the when and the how. And it's really not up to us to condition. It's up to us to accept desires. That's what we're called to do when it comes to operating the law. When you're conditioned, you're not operating the law successfully because you're not being successful in imagination. Success and failure lie in imagination. The moment you are successful is when you successfully, for example, that guy who wants to be in that home, but it's going to take six months. He's successful the moment he feels that he's sleeping in that home that night. If he actually feels like he's there, he's successful in imagination. But if he starts conditioning it, he's never going to feel that he actually accepted the desire. He's never going to feel fulfilled. And um, when it comes to our past mistakes, and I think this is where the concept of forgiveness becomes so important, is that you know the, you know, the Bible tells you basically that if you are... Um, if God has forgiven you, then everybody else must forgive you because who can go against God? And the way I describe forgiveness is actually being the person you want to be in imagination. It doesn't really matter what you've thought of in your past or what you've done. Because if you can imagine yourself, or for example, let's take the case of the guy who's in jail. If he wants to imagine himself free and the imagination, the only creative power allows him to do that, then the imagination has forgiven him. And if the imagination has forgiven him, then who's to say he's not forgiven? We all must say he's free now because he assumed that he, he assumed his freedom. He appropriated his own freedom from imagination. And who can go against the imagination? The imagination knows every thought you've ever had. It knows every, and I'm telling you, I, I have had many, many bad thoughts in my life 
many unlovely things I've thought of others. Yet it still allows me, no matter what, to assume and appropriate what I want within it. It forgives me. It tells me that it's okay. You can accept something new now. You don't have to live in this muck and mire inside your mind. You're forgiven entirely. So you don't have to let the past mistakes be conditions you place upon accepting your desires. And um, I think the past is really what paralyzes us from accepting desires. But once we see that if the imagination has forgiven me, that's all that's needed. That's all that's, that's all that's expressing here. And that should be extremely relieving to those who have had um, past they're not proud of. You know, it's okay because you are still allowed, you're still qualified to imagine what you want. You're still qualified to be what you want. The question is, are you going to accept it? Now, I'm not telling you to accept things from some God in the sky or some, you know, I don't believe in, um, personally, I don't believe in like subconscious impressing and I don't believe in, um, like I don't believe in doing that as a work to try to get what you want. I think those are conditions. Um, I think it's already done in imagination and what we must do is accept it. I don't think there's anything, there's really no external God you must go to. There's no universe you must go to. It's all done within you. Because it's as within, so without. So if I want to be something in my world, then I must be it within me. If I want to express a certain attitude in my outer life, let me express it within myself. Let me forgive myself by expressing it. Let me not hold myself back with conditions and restrictions. Let me not hold myself back with time and space and say, well, I, I don't know how, so I can't accept it. Or I don't know when, so I can't accept it. Don't let, us, don't, don't let me do that. Don't, that. That's leaving me in the dust. I don't want to be left in the dust. I want to be forgiven. I want to be transformed and changed. And the imagination allows me to do that. Um, so I'm not asking you to believe in anything outside of you. Because these gods that people worship in this world don't do anything. They're, they're made with wooden, uh, they're made out of wood by human hands. Those gods can't show you, they can't show you you expressing what you want to express. They can't, say yes to you they don't even have you know they don't have divine eyes and divine ears that can hear and see what it desires why believe in those gods why believe in a universe that you don't even know if it heard you or not you know that's why i love the bible because it tells us in the book of john that if we believe he meaning the imagination hears us then we can be confident that our request has already been made of him so if i just believe my imagination heard me it's done that's how, that's how confident that author was in his own imagination. He saw God from within. He said, if God heard me, then it's done. That's how much of a, that's how forgiving and that's how forgiving God is. And I mean, I know you might not like the word God, but for me personally, that just, I just been used to it. But you can say um, anything really source or the one within that, or the wise one within, whatever you want to call it. Um, that has already forgiven you and it proves it's forgiven you by letting you imagine what you want. If you, were, if you couldn't imagine it, then you're not forgiven. But you can imagine all things, no matter what, no matter if you're behind bars, no matter what of your past, you're still allowed, you're still qualified to imagine what you want. Regardless of the self-concept you've held of yourself, maybe you're someone like me who's, who's been used to self-sabotage growing up, you're still forgiven. It doesn't matter. And if God has forgiven you, or the imagination has forgiven you, then who can stop the imagination? Who can say no to it? If it says, yes, you're forgiven, you can imagine what you want, you can be what you want, then everyone must conform. That's all that is expressing here. And, and I don't want you to feel like you need to force these conditions off of you. You get to let go of them. You get to actually let them fall down. You don't have to. You can almost say, it's not my business to know how. And you truly feel that. It's not my business to know when. All my business is, is to, as the Bible says, is to do my Father's will. And my Father's will is to imagine myself being what I want to be. So that's all I'm concerned. All I'm concerned is being who I want to be in my mind. It's not, I'm not told to be afraid. I'm not told to be afraid of my future or let my past ruin it. I'm not told to do that. I'm just told to imagine just as though I am and to accept that. That's all I'm called to do. So I think forgiveness is such an important message because um, to feel forgiven of everything um, truly can 
cause of freedom within you that like you're, you're not doing anything wrong. And even if you've done something wrong, you can always correct it. You don't have to live there. And I, um, I want us to reach a state of mind that allows that. Don't be in a state of mind that is wondering if you are forgiven or if you are allowed to imagine this or that or worried about the how. I want us to be in a state of mind where we know we're forgiven, where we're, we know we can imagine what we want, that what I assume becomes, that's the state of mind we must be in. And uh, I want to end this with a, um, a quote from Neville that um, I found very powerful. And he says, Now you may think this horrible thing I, in my ignorance, imagined so many unlovely things. Must I live with it? I planted it. If this is a law and it endures forever, I can't deny, if this is God's law, that whatever is taking place now in my world, I brought it into being because I imagined it at some moment in time. A moment, if is unpleasant, when I was ignorant of God's law. Nevertheless, he is no respecter of persons, and here I am living with horrible fruit, where I in my ignorance planted it. But we need not despair. There is still a greater law than that which, than that, a much greater law. And that law, as we are told, he quotes, With the pure thou showest thyself pure. With the crooked thou showest thyself perverse. That confirms that law that the universe is only an infinite response. So, I think him to be what he will be to me. But in the 130th Psalm, you will find something far more profound than this. Here the psalmist makes the statement that if you would mark the iniquities, who can stand? And he quotes, If thou, O Lord, mark the iniquities, who can stand? But there is forgiveness with thee. So you need not ask anyone in this world why he did or what he did to bring about the conditions he is now in. Don't analyze him. Don't dig as to why he did it. He could have done it deliberately. He could have done it in ignorance. But here's a law that transcends this law of planting and reaping. It is the law of forgiveness. Forgiveness is simply revision, or you may call, call it repentance. But the Bible speaks of it as repentance and speaks of it as forgiveness. You come upon a scene, all right? You don't like the scene, and it's factual, no question about it, and you know that some someone somewhere brought it into being by first imagining a scene of that nature because it couldn't have come into being unassisted by an imaginal act. So it is brought into being by an imaginal act. Well, forget it. Don't condemn her. Don't condemn him. Just now do something about it. And do it now. And that applies to ourselves as well. I'm done quoting Neville. I'm talking now. Is that regardless of what you did, forget it. Do something about it. Don't worry, you know, worrying and about your present limitations or letting your past paralyze you or letting the, the uncertainty of the future terrify you and petrify you and stagnate you. These things, you're not doing anything. You're not moving. We have to move and act. And we can move and act in imagination by becoming what we want to be through the law of forgiveness. It's forgiveness that allows us to truly experience a freedom within ourselves that we might not have thought possible before. But seeing that if I can imagine what I want, regardless of what I've done, then God's forgiven me. And if God has forgiven me, all must forgive me. Because that's, there's only here, the only one here is God. So practice this law of forgiveness by not allowing yourself to restrict yourself and condition yourself in any way. Don't let time, space, the when, the how, um, people, the thoughts of others, none of these things have to be restrictions. As soon as you assume it in the imagination, you become it in imagination. Now trust in your imagination. And don't trust any outside God. You know, God is not on the outside. The creator is not found in in a building that doesn't pay taxes. <laughs> he's not found in some, um, he's found within you. He dwells within us. Every single one of us, he dwells within. His name is I am. So shape and mold I am to how you want it to be. And allow yourself to be forgiven by accepting the I am's you would love to be. 
So um, it's important to remember that we are supposed to change ourselves from within so that it expresses itself without. And um, I think the terms like imagination, um, the world within, the inner reality, the world of imagination, these are terms I've used um, and they do um, make sense. But I think a term for me that's made the most sense is calling it my own personal reality. So the personal reality within, I find this to be a very good term. I think it kind of opens up a uh, new understanding to what I'm trying to say. And in your own inner personal reality, your own imagination, um, you can change yourself there. You can change things. You can remold them. And in this world, everything is reflecting you because there only is you in this world. Um, everything within it reflects your I am's and, or I should say your assumptions. If you assume new things in this world, it happens automatically. And Neville says, this is the only reality that exists. To him, that's, that was the only reality that existed. And that's how we must view our lives is that my inner reality is my true self. It's my true reality. And what I am in here, I actually am. I believe in this. So in your own personal reality, you are the creator that, you know, you can remold this by changing all your assumptions about yourself and you'll see the, the entire world shift in front of you. And um, it's important to note that when you're changing your personal reality, you're not trying to make something happen in the 3D. You're not trying to force anything. You're not really thinking about the outer world. The, all that is important to you is that you change yourself from within. You're not like changing, but in the back of your mind, you're thinking, yeah, but I'm doing this so I can get something on the outside. Remember, it's as within, so without. So don't be so concerned with the outer world. This is your harvest, and your harvest is what you're planting from within. So just just focus on being it inside your own personal reality. And since it's personal, you can mold it to how you want it to be. And you can, you know, you don't have to feel guilty for making people say what you want them to say. You don't have to feel like anything, really. It's you can you can have people compliment you on the things you have in there. You can have people, uh, you can change who you are and make everybody see you that way. You can have people congratulate you on your new success. You can um, have a loved one tell you how much they love you and support you. And you can do anything you want in here. You don't have to be afraid of anyone because nobody in here can even speak their own words. So no one can do anything to you unless you allow it. It's your own personal reality where you're in total control. And you don't have to feel strange about it or guilty um, or anything like that because what you have to understand is that you've always been doing this. From the, from the beginning of your time, you have always put words in people's mouths in your mind. I mean, before, even, before you even knew who Neville was, you were, I'm sure at one point you argued with somebody in your head, you told somebody off, but they weren't speaking to you anything that you weren't putting in their mouths. They were only speaking and responding to you until they were really just obeying you. You know, there's this great, um, there's this great scene in Vanilla Sky, where, you know, uh, I forget what the what his name is in the movie, but Tom Cruise, you know, he wakes up inside the lucid dream, and um, the tech support guy tells him, like, you know, this is your dream. You're 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 everybody's god here, and you can they obey you. They can you know aid you or destroy you. It's up to you, and. Um, and that's exactly how it is in your own reality within yourself. People can obey you and they can either aid you into what you want, they can support you, or they can destroy you. It's up to you how you decide. And they do this based off of your assumptions towards yourself and what you're willing to accept within your own personal reality. But it's really important to know that you already do this. Every argument you've ever had inside your mind was caused by you and they were that person you were arguing with was just obeying you. They had no choice but to say those words because those are your words. So every time you have people shaming you or condemning you in your mind, or like imagine someone pointing the finger at you and blaming you for something, that's you doing it to yourself. They can't point that finger unless you allow it. They can't say those words unless you put those words in their mouths. So I know at times people might feel like, am I allowed to make people say what I want them to say? It's like, you know, am I allowed to make people compliment me? Am I allowed to do this? Am I allowed to do that? It's like, you already do it. If you don't do that, you're going to do something else with them because there only is you in here. So 
always feel like you were allowed to completely change yourself in this imaginative world that's because it's your own personal reality and you can shape it and mold it exactly how you want it to be and this is what i meant by making imagination your refuge making it a heaven for you because um many times i've seen it in my life people um who don't like what's inside their imaginations they don't like the way they've molded it with their with their assumptions they tend to distract themselves with the 3d they do things they don't really care about or they distract themselves and they go, they do things for a very long, I mean, I've done this since when I was growing up. Um, you know, I was shamed and blamed for a lot of things that really weren't my fault. And I took upon those assumptions and I lived the, that way inside my own mind. And I didn't like being in my mind. I didn't like the way I felt. Uh, I didn't like the things I was seeing. I didn't like the arguments I was in. So I distracted myself with video games and reading and things like that. But I knew deep down I was distracting. I wasn't really comfortable in my own skin. But once I saw this, that I can shape and mold my imagination the way I want it to be, I became so much more comfortable and more relaxed than I didn't even think possible. But, um, and once you do this, I've noticed that once you start shaping your inner world, your personal reality, the way you want it to be, you stop reacting so much to the 3D world. If you start living inside your personal reality, which you already do anyways, um, but you, you're, you're really just doing the same thing, but this time you're making it into heaven. If you do this, you won't react to things that you're sort of used to reacting to. You're not going to be triggered by this or that. You're going to walk with the absolute stillness because you know things are going to are molding to you. And um, they already do that in imagination. They will do that from without. And uh, it's important that you... You know, it's important that you hear the best things in your mind, that you grant yourself the best feelings, that you give yourself power in this imaginative world, that you give yourself confidence, that you give yourself wealth, that you give yourself love. It's important that you do this. You'll be far happier if you do this. Now, if you want to prove to yourself that you have these things, see it or hear it. Prove to yourself that you are respected by seeing people respect you. Prove to yourself that you have confidence by walking in with confidence inside your own mind. You already have all these things. Just learn to realize that you can express them now. And nothing can hold you back because there is no one else here but you. So you don't have to fear anyone or anything. You don't, you know, if, you're, if your scenes are being sabotaged, you're sabotaging it. No one else is doing No one else can sabotage it but you. And that's power. That's taking full responsibility for everything you've ever created in this own personal reality. That is taking back your power. You know, and that's very important to do when it comes to Neville's work. And be, be very critical of your, of your personal reality. Really see, like, what have I conjured up? What have I imagined in here? Is it lovely or is it unlovely? Is it a hell for me or is it a heaven? And, like, do I, do I really think this about myself? You know, is this a, do I like this about myself? Do I like that? And really mold yourself. You're allowed to. You remember, you have the freedom of expression. So express everything you want to express regardless of what it is. But I urge you, or I should, I warn you to make it lovely. Because if you don't make it lovely, if you don't imagine things you love, first off, you won't commit to them. Second off, you will be in a hell. You will, you will feel, um, at least for me, in my when I imagine things I don't love, I don't feel good. So I always go towards thoughts that make me feel very, very good and give me lots of pleasure. Um, and things that I feel that I would like done to me. Um, so... I found that that's the best way to make a heaven in your mind. And um, I want to quote uh, Neville. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure where, what lecture this comes from, but he basically says this. He who creates the evil creates the good, the wheel and the woe, the light and the darkness. He who kills is he who makes alive. He who wounds is he who heals. And there is no other God. If you really believe you are the one spoken of here, that it is you who create the evil, the good, the wheel, and the woe, that no one can deliver you, can, can deliver out of your hand, then you are set free. You will never again believe in another, but know that your life is self-created, that you create the storms as well as the peace and the calm. No longer will you believe he, she, or they did it. For you, reckon, you will recognize them as reflections, mirroring, mirroring either the storm or the peace and calm within you. Neville. Now, apply that to your own personal reality within you. Do you not create the woes in, in this world? 
do you not create the arguments and the you know or do you, do you not also create the stillness and the peace do you not create your own shame and your own relief your own bondage and your own freedom you do this do you not aren't you the one who sabotages and the one who uh, exalts yourself and redeems yourself you do both no one can do this to you they're just obeying you within your mind accept this and I promise you, you will live a life that is uh, so freeing. You won't react to the things you're used to reacting to. You, you, you'll have something in your day happen, and you'll see it. Oh, this is a reflection of me. I didn't like this. And you go, okay, I'm going to revise this. Because you, you'll start living life inwardly. You'll see imagination as the own reality. It won't even bother you what people say to you. Because it's all a reflection of you anyways. You don't give anyone control. And since people don't have that power and control, you don't react to them the way you normally would. Someone could say something hurtful to you. And it's happened to me before. And I just say, oh, okay, this is something to revise. I found something within me that I need to revise. It's a self-saving um, and a self-redeeming. So you become the actual redeemer in your own mind. And you redeem everybody within it because everybody is reflecting you. So you raise yourself up, you raise them up. And you continuously do this. You prune your own mind. You take, you discard the things you don't want in your own personal reality. And you put the things you do want. You know, it's a it's a very simple parable that Neville gave, or sorry, that Jesus gave, where he told you to cast the net to the side, and they grab they grab the fish, and he just discarded the bad fish, and he kept the good fish. That's all you're doing too inside your own personal reality. Take time and really discover the things you want to be in there. It's up to you entirely, and you mold it through your own assumptions. You just as, as soon as you assume something in imagination, it happens. Now continue having that, persist in having that in your own personal reality. Don't let it go. Don't sabotage. Don't get rid of it. Don't think you're not worthy of it. Everything is yours in this own person reality. And again, you already do this, just not in the way you want. You already put words in people's mouths. You already have self-concepts. All I'm telling you to do is just reshape them and remold them into the way you want it to be. So as I said in my previous video about this being your own this world of imagination is your own personal reality. This world within is yours and everything within it is yours. But um, what I hope is that when you enter into this personal reality, I hope that you seek out one thing and one thing alone, and that is God, the cause. I hope that you find the cause. When you go into the world of imagination, do everything you can to find the cause. And um, that's what I'm calling God. Don't find blame and don't find hatred. Don't find fault and don't find revenge. Don't find jealousy. Don't find shame and don't find fear. You don't have to f look for these things. Find the cause. Find God. And what you'll find is what I found is that the cause is me. I am. I'm the cause of all my experience within me. I'm finding the cause. And when I find the cause, no matter how horrific of a dream I have dreamt up, I'm still the cause of it. That means I'm greater than it. I'm its dreamer. And this is my dream or my nightmare. But find the cause. Don't seek anything else. And I think that finding blame is something that we tend to do that really I think is the most universal thing we do. Um, blaming something for how I feel or for how I am thinking because I can imagine anything to blame someone for why I'm imagining something when there's no one else within me is um going right back to sleep so try to seek and find what the cause is and you will find it's I am no matter how bad of a nightmare it's I am it's always I am and I want to share um this thought that I had and it's if I am the cause of my experience and I am experiencing thought, then I am the cause of thought. The cause cannot fear what he causes. He cannot fear his thoughts. Rejoice and cause a new experience. There is no other savior, but I am. For there is no other being here. Find the cause. And I want to repeat that first part where it says, if I am the cause of my experience, and I am experiencing thought, then I am the cause of thought. And the reason why I find this so important is because uh, thoughts are 
things that people can be so afraid of. You know, they don't even realize that they're actively using their imagination to frighten themselves. But remember, you are the cause. The cause cannot fear. It's sort of like the creator cannot fear his own creation. The cause cannot fear what he's causing. So you don't need to fear any thoughts or states for that matter. Because through the law, as I said, through the law of forgiveness, you can just forgive yourself and enter a new state. And you should. Um, if you're expressing something you don't like, you are causing that expression. You can now cause a new expression. And you can change yourself. And um, and really, the only thing there, since you are the only thing that's causing everything in here, the only thing there is to save is you. All you have to do is cause a new experience within yourself. And you can't be afraid of what you're causing. So fear no thoughts. Fear nothing within you because you're always greater than it. It has no power other than the power you give it. Truly. And... Um, <clears throat> You know, Neville says, I want to quote Neville now. It says, if you believe that I am not he, you shall die in your sins. He's quoting Jesus. And he says, unless, and then this is Neville speaking, unless man discovers that his consciousness is the cause of every expression of his life, he will continue seeking the cause of his confusion in the world of effects and so shall die in his fruitless search. So when you go within your mind, and you're having all these scenarios happening or you're having all these things happening to you that you don't understand or you're having intrusive thoughts, don't fear the thoughts. Don't find fear. Find the cause. No matter what it is, find the cause of it. That's what you're seeking. And what you'll find, it's always going to be yourself. So that's why there's no one to change but self. You know, leave the mirror alone and change self. Don't worry about the mirror, what it's reflecting. It's just reflecting. It's nothing to be afraid of. Just change self, and the next thing you know, your whole imaginative world starts to re reshape itself. Persist in that world and have faith that that is who you are now. And um, what you'll find is that you'll naturally start to express it. I mean, there are times where I will just, um, I'll be, let's say I'm at the mall and um, I'm walking around and I start feeling, I won't even notice. I'm just feeling, I'm not really aware of what I'm feeling. The next thing I know, I become aware of what I'm doing within myself. And I say, oh, well, I can feel better. I want to feel better for myself. The next thing I know, I just start having, I start feeling myself to be confident. Next thing I know, my shoulders fall back. I start walking in this confidence. I'm in this new state of mind. I just persist in that. And if the more you persist in, the more natural it becomes. But it's that simple to just change how you are to express it. It's it just, it's all natural. It starts to naturally express it. The moment you accept it as being done, as being who you are, it naturally starts to express. And you don't have to do anything. And um, all you have to do is change the state. But if you know you're the cause of all your states and you're the cause of all your expressions, then all you have to do is change the cause. But if you find blame or jealousy in another, you know, jealousy, true, this is really what jealousy is. When you desire things within you, and since everything within you has to express without, your desires are expressing without. So what you'll find is if you deeply desire something, somebody in your world will appear having the thing you want because it's expressing you. And then instead of realizing it's an expression, um, we tend to get jealous or we tend to blame them or bring them down because they have the thing we want. But everything is yours in imagination. Everything must express, even the desiring self must express. But if you live in fulfillment, you won't judge that. If, actually, you'll probably be happy that they have it as well. So it's all perception, expressing itself from within to without. But you don't need to find blame. Blaming things does not feel good. You don't need to find blame. All you have to do is find the cause, which is to find the power, the creative power. And when you go within, find that cause of everything within you. If you're blaming something, say, who is blaming? I am. If you're fearing something, who's fearing? I am. And do I have to be afraid of this? No, because I'm the cause of this. You know, I've had nightmares where I realized I've woke inside of them realizing that I'm the cause of the, the nightmare and all I have to do is change myself. The next thing I know, the dream changes. It doesn't matter how horrific the dream was. I found the cause. I didn't look for fear. I didn't look for being stuck or how am I going to get out? I just saw, I looked for the cause of the dream. And I also want to quote one more thing of Neville that I find to be one of his most powerful quotes. Um, and he states, I may not like what I just heard, that I must turn to my own consciousness as to the only reality, the only foundation on which all phenomenon can be explained. It was easier living when I could blame another. It was much easier living when I could blame society for my ills or point the finger across the sea. 
and blame another nation. It was easier living when I could blame the weather for the way I feel. But to tell me that I'm the cause of all that happens to me, and I'm forever molding my world in harmony with my inner nature, that is more than man is willing to accept. If this is true, to whom would I go? If these words, uh, if these are the words of eternal life, I must return to them, even though, even though they seem so difficult to digest. When man fully understands this, he knows that public opinion does not matter, for men only tell him who he is. The behavior of men constantly tell me who I have conceived myself to be. And that's true in the world of imagination. And to enter in your mind, you'll see people are just doing what you're telling them to do. Find the cause. Don't find blame in another. And when you find the cause, you'll grant yourself more and more power within you. And you'll find yourself living in more and more of a stillness. So, um, truly, become the savior within yourself. And redeem everyone. Redeem yourself. Um, because regardless, you're the cause of either your destruction or your salvation. So the, um, the inner critic is something that I personally have dealt with for many, many years. Actually, as far back as I can remember, I've always had one. Um, and this inner critic is very good at stopping you from, uh, achieving things in your mind and, you know, I always wondered, how is it that I, how is it that this thing knows exactly how to betray me? It knows exactly what to say. It knows exactly what future scenarios I should conjure up to frighten me. It knows exactly things from my past to stop me, to tell me I'm not enough to become what I want to be. Um, how is it that it knows this so perfectly well? And, well, the obvious truth is that the inner critic's me. Um, I am the inner critic and it's through my, um, unwillingness to be responsible for it, for everything within myself that I don't change it or I didn't at the time. Um, I couldn't see how this could be a part of me as I, why would I, why would I sabotage myself? Why would I treat myself this way? Well, on some level I was taught to do that. And on some other level, I didn't recognize that it was me doing it. I blamed it on something else. See, if you don't take responsibility for you being the inner critic, um, you're going to blame someone else for it. But you're not looking for blame because blame doesn't get rid of it. Um, you're looking for the cause. The cause is what you're always seeking because the cause, if you can find the cause of it, then you can get rid of it. But the cause is always you. And that's where it becomes difficult sometimes to accept that maybe I am the inner critic. I am the one sabotaging me. I am the one stopping me. But you wouldn't want it any other way. And, um, you know, there's this uh, story that Neville gave where he he saw a um, a person in his, or he saw these two beings inside himself. And one of the beings was this monster it was this monster of a being and this other one was very very beautiful and the one beautiful being was everything he all his noble thoughts uh personified and then the uh monstrous being was all the ignoble thought uh, ignoble thoughts that he had um and he said that this other being loved violence this horrible being spoke violence it always just fed on it and it grew from violence and he pummeled it and pummeled it and it just kept growing and then he decided to say you know what i'm going to redeem you if it takes me eternity so he redeems it and then he said he felt like he had a power that you know that was all his misspent energy came back to him he felt like he had power again now from my own experience i've had a very very similar dream where i was um i found myself fighting this mummy looking monster and no matter what I did, if I punched it, my arms would go through it. If I shot at it with a gun, the bullets wouldn't work. Uh, no, no matter what I did, it, it would just wouldn't, I, there's just nothing I could do. And I felt like I was getting frustrated because I couldn't defeat this thing. But it wasn't until I stopped fighting entirely in the dream and I just started to feel unafraid. I stared at it and I stopped feeling afraid of it. And the next thing I know, it got smaller. And then I stopped feeling more afraid and it got smaller and then more unafraid. And 
It got smaller and smaller and smaller. The next thing I know, I felt fearless. And it was gone. It just disappeared. My attention wasn't placed upon it. And I wasn't placed upon fear anymore. And there's this um, common theme in ancient myth that when something is burned up or something is lit on fire, it usually means that your the attention is taken away from it. When you take your attention away from something, it burns up and withers. And um, actually in the story of Hercules, when he fights the Hydra, the Hydra is a very, very good symbol for fear. Um, you chop one head off and another one comes. And that's very similar to how we live our lives, that maybe one day you tackle one fear today, but tomorrow there's another fear coming that you got to fight against. And it feels never ending. There's some, some days there's more fears than you felt like you tackled one fear, and the next day there's five more fears. And you're not understanding why is it that I can't defeat this thing. And Hercules thought the same thing. But he uses fire, actually, to destroy it. And fire is a he, you know, he chops the necks off and burns them. And again, fire is taking your attention away from it. See, it's not the thoughts or the heads that you're, that are important to fight. It's the body where it's coming from, where the heads are growing from. And these thoughts that you're fighting against are actually coming from the feeling of fear. You see, if you don't live in love, you will be subdued by fear as Neville, as I'm sorry, as William Blake says. And, um, that is such an important statement that if you don't fully um, think thoughts that you love to think about, you will be subdued by fear. Eventually you'll go to fear. It's one or the other. So you stop fighting these thoughts. Stop fighting them and go to the feeling and stop feeling afraid. And, you know, I fought this mummy thing and it's the same thing as the Hydra. It's the same idea that I would punch it, my arms go through it, you chop one head off to grow. It's the same concept. But I got rid of it not by fighting, but through becoming unafraid, taking my attention away from fear. And um, the inner critic, you know, it knows exactly what to do to stop you because it is you. It's very important that you take responsibility for this because if you take responsibility, um, that's power in imagination. Responsibility is power in imagination. Um, things cannot harm you unless you allow it. And yes, you are that powerful to create this inner critic in you. Maybe at one point it was useful, but now it's not. Life's a lot better without living um, with this thorn in your mind. And um, I know from my own experience how terrible this inner critic can become and how it can lead you to dark roads. Um, but again, it's just yourself leading yourself there. And the next time, you know, you can test this, that you can see it yourself, is if next time you assume uh, being something you want in your mind, something great, assume something really outlandish in your mind, be a little crazy about it. And when the inner critic comes to tell you about how you're not this and how you can't be that, or some fearful thing in the future, tell yourself, instead of viewing it as something separate from you, say, I'm not going to sabotage myself. And then you will see that it's you who's doing it all along. It's not this thing that's separate from you. And to be honest, your assumptions are so powerful in imagination that you could assume there is no inner critic. Assume there is no inner critic. Don't allow, don't allow yourself to hear anything but that. You know, practice uh, hearing yourself fulfilling desires within you. Like say, I am beautiful. And don't allow yourself to hear anything else but that. And... um if you can practice restricting the urge to hear anything but your desire being fulfilled, it will become easier over time. You won't need to sit down and meditate for 20 minutes, an hour. You can be do it, you could do it while you're walking somewhere. You can totally detach from your present reality and assume something about yourself and then live in that assumption. And there is no inner critic to stop you because it's just yourself. You know, it's you once once you realize that you don't need to be afraid of the inner critic because it is you you will feel so much power that you never felt before. I mean, for me at least, because I grew up with the inner critic in my head. So um, for me, it was like infinite power. I felt like I could do anything and um, persist in that. Don't allow yourself to go back and listen to the your inner critic's voice because it's just you. Um, and I say that because uh, I'm speaking from experience. I'm not speaking from... Um, a theory. I'm not 
theorizing to you, telling you, um, this is what I think it's like. No, I'm telling you from experience that when you remove the inner critic entirely, assume there isn't one, <laughs> assume there are no Satans, no demons, no evil in your mind, uh, make it into a heaven, make your imagination into heaven, assume there is no inner critic, because uh, it's just you in the end. Um, the amount of freedom you feel within your mind is, it's, it's, um, I don't know how to put it into words. It's a euphoria. It's like a, a powerful euphoria, like a euphoria where you're in control. It's the best way I can explain it. And you don't have to live in desire in your mind. You don't have to desire the inner critic to be gone. Stop desiring and get rid of it. It's just you. You could just assume there isn't one. It's a simple way of doing it. Or you can just take responsibility for it being you and realize that I'm the only one stopping me. The inner critic's not separate, it's me. And that can give you some confidence. Whichever way you go about it, um, I want you to come back to being the cause of it. I repeat myself over and over in my videos and uh, I'm going to keep repeating myself all the time because it's necessary. Because all it takes is one repetition for someone to hear. In a certain, a certain way, it just needs a, a certain string of words for some reason in this one fashion can make someone, it can finally click in their mind and they can see what I'm talking about. And uh, you might need to re-listen to my videos over and over again to finally have that click. Sometimes it's, it is the same sentence, but it's just you need to hear it again and again for it to finally understand what I'm saying. And um, I'm willing to repeat it because I know it's true. And um, I'm not teaching you knowledge. This is a type of wisdom that this would be true regardless if you, whatever time period you lived in, you, you are the inner critic regardless if you're in the year 4000 or 2022. It doesn't matter. So I, I'm trying to, uh, I'm not teaching you knowledge. This is wisdom. And um, this is where I've learned over the time of practicing these teachings. And it is a practice. You have to do this daily. Daily learn to say what you want to say and hear nothing but what you said. That, you know, have a desire, you know, have someone tell you that you are wonderful and allow it to feel as if you heard it externally, as if someone told you, someone walked up to you today and said, hey, you're beautiful. Hear that in imagination and, and feel as if there's no difference to you. Respond to it as if there's no difference. And you'll start to live in your imagination. You realize that the inner critic has always just been there and it's been, uh, maybe it was a protective, um, it was protective at one point, but now it's destructive. And now it's time to move on and to, maybe you are desiring to get rid of it, but you're not sure how. Well, use the law of assumption. Assume there is no inner critic. Remember, this is your imagination where you get to make it into heaven. And uh, again, I'm repeating myself because it does take several times to hear uh, for it to finally click. And um, you can like you can go about these ways in a, and through assumption, or you can also go about them through responsibility, which is I am the inner critic, so I do not need to fear. I am my own worst enemy because I know exactly how to sabotage myself. And I won't do that anymore. That's an assumption. You can do that. You can also say there is no inner critic. You know, there is no evil in my mind. I only see the good in myself and in others. Up to you how you want to shape your perception, but it's up to you. Truly, it's up to you. And I hope you do take this responsibility because you will become more and more free um, when you realize it's all you at the end of the day in your mind. You take full responsibility for everything. And you live life from this new responsibility that you are in control. You know, maybe you're desiring to have some control in your mind. Assume you have it. Don't live in desire anymore about anything. You don't need to in imagination. The version of yourself that is in control in your mind, you are already that. Just become aware of already being it. You don't have to become things in the mind. You already are things. They are already finished. All it takes is your awareness or your moving your state of consciousness that you're currently in and moving it into that state of consciousness. It's already finished. There's in imagination, things already are. There, there's nothing created here. It already is. And what you must do is credit it with reality because you are the life. Your life in front of you is actually dead and it's only responding to you. You are the life. I am is the life. And I am is the only reality. So you take a scene that might feel fake to you at first, but credit it with reality. Maybe it's a wonderful scene and you it's something, some wish you have. Credit it with reality inside your mind. Don't listen to anything else but this scene. 
and you'll find that the inner critic has is just that you it's just you at the end at the end of the day it's always just been you but if you want to um have some practical um if you want to, i guess if you want something that's practical i guess before you go to sleep every night fall asleep feeling present tensely what you want it doesn't matter what it is it could be something small that you've wanted since you're a child i don't care what it is but feel as though you have it now and don't allow yourself to hear anything no fears from the future and no shame from the past or stagnation from the past be there in the present of being it now and the inner critic will slowly vanish away and you find yourself stopping yourself say i don't need to stop myself i'm allowed to feel this as much as i want it's my own imagination i can shape it to however i want and you allow yourself really truly allow it allow yourself to walk in your imagination how you want to walk hear what you want to hear say what you want to say be respected you know at one point i i, I grew up totally being disrespected growing up and i i was never listened to um at all and um nothing i said was really taken seriously and now i have people listening to me i assumed i was a great teacher i went to sleep feeling i'm a great teacher why would i assume i'm a bad one i want to assume i'm a good one so i fell asleep not as though i'm going to become a good teacher i i assumed what i already am i became aware of what i already am these are a part of myself these things are a part of me so i don't reject them anymore i accept them there's a part of me that could be a very bad teacher there's a part of me that could be a very good one and it's up to me to decide which ones i want to be it's my choice within myself so um you don't have to ever feel stuck in imagination you can always assume um even if the inner critics making you feel so stuck assume there isn't one and feel that huge relief that it's gone and don't allow yourself to hear anything else but that. You can start there and you will see what I'm trying to say to you that you can make imagination into a heaven. So in as I mentioned before Neville tells us that in the end of power of awareness he says we must feel the feeling of the wish fulfilled. But he tells you what that is. He says the feeling of the wish fulfilled is making the future dream a present fact. In consciousness we're supposed to do this. In imagination I use those interchangeably. And um I want to explain how I view the future, the past, and the present and how I shape these um or how I define these things. So first I want to define um what I am means to me. I am to me is a present tense feeling of being. And what we're supposed to do is we're supposed to shape the i of ourselves. You can think of the i of man is the inner self who lives in imagination. That's you. And the i of man can only be you can think of his power to create comes from the am. Not from the i will be or i was or i hope to one day be. You create from the am. The i am um because life reflects what you are not what you want it reflects what you are but you can shape yourself into what you want in imagination you can start there and shape yourself the way you would like to be so if you um so when i say the words i am to me it means so much it's not like i'm not just parroting i'm not just saying words to me the i am is the creative power it's the i am to me is where the future and the past do not lie and If you can see that these are the future and the past are more like i statements then um it's much easier to let go of the future and of the past and go focus on the present it's from the present we create from the now and um as i said before if you're saying things like well I'll, let's take let's take for example the guy i like to give this example a lot which is the man who was just put in prison because it's a metaphor and i think and and i think everybody can relate in some level that we've all entered into mental prisons but let's just take this man who's physically was put into a prison and he's behind bars and he wants to be freed that's what he desires he just desires freedom well he goes to imagine himself being free he says i am free and 
you know, what he should not do is go to the future and say things like, I am free and what if I get let out and I actually like mess up again and I come back into jail? <laughs> um, that's that's a that's what if that's going to the future tense. When when you start fearing your desire or you start fearing the fulfillment of it, you're going to the future, right? Because you can't really be afraid of the past. You're afraid of the future, the unknown. And then when you go to the um, the past, when you say, "Well, I uh, I'm just you know I'm a criminal. I can't just be free. I'm not allowed to be free." Um, again, that's not fulfillment. This is this is. Um, I am this, so I can't be what I want, or I want to be this, and maybe I can be, but I might ruin it. Again, these are not fulfillments. You can only fulfill in the I am. So if he were to successfully become free, he must claim, I am free in the present tense now. And what that means is you basically imagine, you can do this, you imagine just with a little practice as if there is no present or there is no past or future. You imagine as if these things don't exist. And, okay, well, how do I do that? Well, imagine as if tomorrow is not going to happen. And imagine as if yesterday didn't happen. You just imagine in the now. You don't imagine what's going to be like five minutes after you imagine or what you're going to, you know, after you come out of meditation. You don't worry about that. Your only concern is to experience the freedom, to feel that freedom that has been said yes to. And you experience it in the present. And what you'll find is um, if you do this successfully, you'll be given a deep, deep fulfillment feeling because you aren't going to the future to sabotage it. And you're not going to the past to sabotage it. You're remaining in the present. And like, for example, I can say to you, like, when I say I am Edward, I know I'm Edward, right? Um, I don't question whether I'm not I'm Edward. That's how it should be when you say, I am free. When he says, I am free, he shouldn't even question it. That's what he is. And if you are, um, you know, your imagination must become your evidence. So if he, if you were to say, well, well, what if I'm not free? Um, but remember, if he associates himself with the I, the inner self, the inner self is free. So he is free. The question is, who are you going to associate? Are you going to associate yourself with the man of the senses or the inner man who's free or who can become what they want to be? It's, it's, uh, it's really a, a choice. We can look to our worlds of the facts and we can say, well, uh, these facts are just too strong. I can't change them. Um, but you can in imagination. The question is, are you going to trust the change that you did inside yourself? You experienced the change. The man behind bars closes his eyes and he says, I am free. The next thing he knows, he sees himself outside of these bars, inside of his imagination. He's walking around the city. Now, can he associate himself with that? Can he become, can he take on that consciousness and persist in that until it feels natural to him and then it naturally enters into his world? Um, so in the present moment, in the I am, there is no doubt. There is no fear. There can't be because fear comes from the future. And there's no doubt um, because doubting comes from the past. You doubt yourself because of who you are right now. Well, that, again, these things can't exist in the I am. If you successfully go towards I am, um, I am is truly the, the way to create. It's the way to fulfillment because life reflects I am. Life does not reflect I will be. It doesn't reflect I was. Um, it reflects who you are now. And the beautiful thing is all you have to do is reshape yourself in imagination and um, associate yourself with that inner man, not the body, but the inner man, who is the thing, who is expressing what he wants to express. And you don't have to, um, you don't have to worry about, you know, the bridge of incidences that are going to happen or what's going to happen tomorrow. Like I said, tomorrow doesn't exist when you imagine. And when you see that, when you, when you remove the tomorrow and you remove the past, the future and the past from your mind, you'll find yourself truly experiencing the present where you your mind won't go towards um, what ifs or your mind won't go towards like feelings of inadequacy because there is only I am. You are it now. You are um, increasingly becoming aware of what you already are in your mind. 
and these are part of yourself. Um, the man who's behind bars experiences freedom inside his mind. That's a part of him. He shouldn't reject that part of him. He should accept it the same way you must accept the parts of yourself that are confident, that are loved, that are cared for, that um, are most excellent, that are brilliant, that are intelligent, whatever it is you want to express. Um, you can do that in imagination. The question is, who are you going to associate yourself with? The man of the senses or the inner man? And what you'll find is the man of the senses is simply expressing. It's a strong illusion, but it's simply expressing what the inner man's doing. Remember, God is not mocked. The I am is not mocked. And um, what that means is we look at an orange tree. We can look at an orange tree and we know trees by their fruit. When I plant an orange tree, or sorry, when I plant an orange seed, it grows an orange tree. Orange trees, you know, oranges grow on that tree. But if I plant an apple seed, apples grow, right? We, we go, of course, that's so obvious. It's self-evident. And we can look at that. That's the, you know, the fruit kingdom. And then we go to the vegetable kingdom. Same thing. We go to the animal kingdom. Mon monkeys produce monkeys. Giraffes produce giraffes. Humans produce humans. We all agree with this area. But when it comes to the mental area, it's the same thing. The, your seeds are your thoughts. They grow after their own kind. Or you should say your states grow after their own kind. It's not random that you're experiencing what you're experiencing inside your mind. Um, it was planted by you at some point. But you, or you know, you dreamt it up at one point. You being the farmer or the gardener or you being the dreamer can redream something new. And you can always revise and reshape. Remember, you're the potter. You're the, you're, you're the potter who's always able to reshape things inside your mind. You don't, no matter how much of a fact the day was, revise it in imagination and accept that was the day you had. Um, if you're willing, you, can, you will experience freedom. But it does take a certain level of bravery to accept that. But you can do it. Trust me, if I can do it, I, I know anybody can do it. You can do it. All it takes is your willingness to credit it reality. All it takes is your willingness to accept that was the reality, that, that your imagination is the reality. And since things grow after their own kind, you don't um, have to worry about tomorrow because tomorrow is what is done. Your tomorrow is what you do now. I must repeat that again. You do not have to worry about tomorrow because your tomorrow is what you do now. If you imagine after um, brilliance, you're not going to receive something that's, that grows after its own heart. You're not going to receive like stupidity. <laughs> um, you know, there's a story that Jesus says is that your your father. I can't remember the scripture perfectly on top of my head right now, but your your father is good. Think of your father as your imagination. That your he says your father is good, and he's not like an evil parent who you ask for present. You know, you ask for a, a fish and he gives you a snake. No, he says no. The father's good. If you ask for something, he gives that to you exactly. And when you, when you see it that way, that imagination gives you what you give yourself, you can see that it actually is good. It's not going to give you something opposite. Things grow after their own kind. So if you want to express brilliance, you keep sowing seeds of brilliance. Well, how do I sow a seed? Well, I assume that I am it now. That's how I sow it. I don't worry about tomorrow or about the past. Because the past and the, but what I'm doing right now, speaking to you, is creating my future. I'm going towards the future, and it's creating my past. I can reflect. I can tomorrow. I can look back and see myself doing this audio recording. So, you, the the future and the uh, the past are in one present moment now. So, what you do now is all that matters. This is what shapes right now. Is what shapes your future. So, in some sense, there really isn't any future. If you want to know what's going to happen tomorrow, just look at the states you're in now. It's no secret. There's nothing hidden in secret. That's why I don't care about sub the subconscious mind. I don't care about these things. All I need to do is look at my world or I need to look at myself within myself and see, okay, this is what I'm expressing inside my mind. This is how I feel about myself. Well, then I can expect tomorrow will be my harvest and it'll be just like this. But if I want to change myself, I am the seed. I am the seed. So I need to sow myself and I will become what I want. Um, so you won't, God isn't mocked. You won't receive opposite of what you're imagining. You can't, and you can prove that in imagination. I mean, if you start fearing something in your mind, you instantly will find yourself dreaming up that fear. But if you find yourself 
feeling like there is nothing to worry about in your imagination and you can have exactly what you want, you'll, you'll have that. The imagination is good. It gives you what you give yourself. And it won't re uh, reject you because that would just be you rejecting yourself. That's why uh, I mentioned in the past, um, one of Neville's students, uh, Lendl, he said that, you know, all denial, self-denial. And that's really important to understand. It's self-denial. I'm denying the I, uh, the I am of that, what I want to be. I'm denying only myself. And there's this uh, scripture that says, he t uh, it's David speaking to God after he committed these atrocities. He says, you and you alone, God, I have sinned against. So we only sin against God because that's all there is. But God is all forgiving. You only sin towards the imagination and the imagination has already forgiven you. So you can now become what you want, but you only become things by the I am. You do not become them with I will be one day. That's not fulfillment. So fall asleep. A practical way to use this information is to go to bed tonight, um, allowing yourself even if it's just, maybe you have never done it, but just for once, allow yourself to feel that you are what you want to be, regardless of limitations. Don't impose any conditions upon it. Don't impose the condition of time or where you're at physically. Don't impose and associate yourself with the inner man who already is it. Things already are, as I said, you already are it in imagination. All you need to do is become aware of being it. Um, and don't look back. You don't have to look back and feel that euphoria that you don't have to worry about tomorrow because your tomorrow is shaped by what you do right now. Um, again, God is not mocked. And if you need proof, <laughs> uh, look at an orange tree and look at the seeds. They produce after their own kind. And we take that to the mental area. We leave that, we leave the um, animal kingdom and the, you know, the fruit kingdom and we, the plant kingdom and we go towards the mental kingdom. It's the same scenario. So keep sowing seeds as I said, through the I am of what you want to be, and you will express it. Um, you will, will not fail if you go to the I am, because there is no failure in the I am. I am is an, a present tense factual claim. Um, it's a factual feeling or a factual knowing. It's a factual awareness of being. It's, um, and like I said, I am is present tense. This is so crucial to know because you will feel a euphoria and you will persist in that euphoria. And then eventually that euphoria will become natural and it will naturally, and when I say it naturally expresses itself, um, I mean that literally, like it, it, you will think this would have happened anyway. And Neville's right. I've experienced this. It's like, um, I used to think that using the law of assumption, I was like, I was gonna be walking in a bag of, um, you know, money was just gonna fall into my lap. I thought that's how it worked. But now I see that we live in a natural world and we must become natural within it in the mind. And I notice it just happens. It's like you don't even realize you're on the bridge. All you're called to do is to persist in the I am, to trust that you are it now. And you'll find yourself unfolding it naturally. You won't even realize the, the bridge is happening. It's all so natural. The next thing you know, um, people are coming up to you and they're telling you things that you said to yourself the night before. And they're repeating to you the things that you've said in secret and you realize it's just a reflection and speaking about reflection i want to say this if you are living in fear it be, it's because you are in the consciousness of separation you are thinking in terms of separation when you are living in love which is to not be in fear you are thinking in terms of reflection remember seeds grow after their own kind that's reflection People will speak to me things I've said in secret. It's a reflection. So I don't need to be afraid. There's nothing to fear. And just assume that for a little bit. Test that out. Assume that everything is just reflecting me and feel the uh, relief of that just for a little while. And then once you move that, move on to, okay, well, if things are reflecting me, let me assume this about myself. And let me assume it in the I am. Forget I will be. Forget I once imagined it. Let me imagine it now. Let me be it now and persist in that now until I feel like I am it, until I actually feel natural. And you, I promise you, you'll see it just unfolding in your life and you won't even, like every, most times when I imagine things I don't, and they appear in my life, I, I honestly forget. Um, I'm more aware of it now and you know, it doesn't surprise me when it happens, but certain things it's like, wow, I didn't even realize, um, didn't realize it till the next day that yeah, I once imagined, I, tr I can trace it back to a thought that I sowed earlier that week 
So um, I want to leave this um, with some I am statements. I am is the end. When Neville says to imagine the end, I am is your end. I am is the way to sow seeds. I am is the bridge to get you where you need to be. I am is the fulfillment you are seeking. So now we're going to talk about states. It's crucial to know that we are in a world of states. It's crucial to know this because states are beliefs or they're feelings that we have towards ourselves that we feel are true as a present tense fact. And that is what reflects in our world. And you are the I am that precedes all states. You are the being that enters into and exits out of states. You are the being that occupies and leaves states. Um, but you are always that being. You are never the state itself. States come with behaviors. They come with, um, it's a perception of life. That's why two people can um, experience a very similar, someone can you know, be at a concert and experience totally different experiences at the concert because it's their state of mind that allows them to, that makes them perceive reality a certain way, which makes them react to reality that certain way. Uh, so no two really see reality the same way. But um, it's always important to remember that you aren't the state itself. So that, that means you aren't those behaviors. Those behaviors came from the state. So there's no need to guilt or shame yourself for the behaviors you've done. It's just f states fulfill themselves. You have to fulfill the state you're in. So you have to let go of everything you've done in the world because it's not even you. You were the state. You just occupied that state for that time. And um, it's important to know that that the celebrity and the man under the bridge are made of the same substance I am. It's just rearranged differently. There is a oneness between all of us. No one is better than the others. From a spiritual point of view, it's the same I am just playing a different character. That's all it is. And speaking of speaking of the poor man and the celebrity, it's important that you take responsibility for both states, that you're not just one. This is crucial to understand because this will open your identity up. It won't restrict yourself anymore. You're not just poor. You're also wealthy. You're not just unknown. You're also known. You're not just uh, afraid. You're also fearless. You're not just... Um, unloved, you're loved. You're not just abused, you're also praised. You're both things. If you take responsibility for being both, then you can move in and out of them. And you know you're both because you can imagine being both. It's just dependent on which one do you want to actually persist in choosing. The one that you consistently, the state you consistently go to um, shows you your dwelling place. It shows you your inner home, the one that you consistently go back to. That's what will manifest. Now, remember, um, remember what I'm about to say is going to be extremely important to understand. Imagine not to get things, but to become. Imagine not to get things, but to become. You know, Neville says that, um, I'm just going off the top of my head, is that, we must die to our sins, and our sins are missing the, missing the mark. Now, let's remember, remember what I said in my past video is that David said to God, you and you, you and you alone, God, I have sinned against. So we only sin against God. We only sin against the I am. Okay? So sin comes from not being the thing I want to be. Now, Neville says this. He says, we must die to our sins. And he's, the common mistake he found when people, when using the law of assumption, is that people would focus so much on a bigger bank balance, nicer furniture in their home, they would focus on um, material objects. But they wouldn't, but he goes, that's not the conscious, consciousness by which you die to your sins. That's not righteous thinking. Righteous thinking is becoming the person, the individual who has already those things. It's not focusing so much about getting the object. It's about becoming the one who already has it. It's so crucial to know. It's remember we only sin against the I am. So we must um, to not sin for us to be righteous. We must become um, a certain I am that already has the thing. 
It's very important to know this. So when you go to change, we must change the conceptions of ourselves, not so much focusing on getting objects. And, you know, for example, um, two people could be, one could be in a middle class state and the other one could be in a wealthy state, yet they're wearing the same clothes. They can afford the same clothes. Um, but one knows themselves to be in a, it's not, just because you have the objects does not mean you are the person. It's important that you remember to become the person. And when you go to change your conceptions of yourself, you must leave the world alone. Now, what does that mean to leave the world alone? Well, from my own experience, this is what I do. I do my daily tasks. Do your daily tasks during the day. Do whatever you have to do. But learn to not react to your day the same way. And you won't react if you truly do this at nighttime. When it comes to nighttime, this is the best time, in my opinion, to learn to imagine. Because the day's over. There's nothing really to, else to do. And as I said in, my, in the past video, you must remove the future from as if tomorrow's not going to happen and as if yesterday didn't happen. So you remove the past and you remove the, the, to, uh, the future from the mind. But also now remove the entire world from the mind. Remember, we have to make imagination the only reality. And for it to be the only reality, there can't be things from the outer world affecting it. Now you leave the world alone. What does that mean? Well, you don't try to change it. You just change the self within you. You leave the world alone with all its doubtful words, with all its fear and all its worry, um, with all its limiting facts. You leave it entirely the way it is. You don't, don't bother with it. Don't bother changing it. Truly see it as a mirror. Just leave it alone. And what you do is you go within and change the conceptions of yourself within imagination. And then you associate yourself with that inner self that is already changed. You make imagination the only reality by dropping and letting go of this temporal world. This world is made up of persistent assumptions. So learn to persist in a new assumption about yourself. And it's not delusion. Delusion is thinking the, the belief is false and you're trying to force it upon yourself. No, you think this is true about yourself and you persist in being it. And you don't need anyone's permission to do this. You don't need to ask anyone. These states, like I said, they're, they're, you're both states. You can just appropriate the one you want. You take it as yours because it's within you and everything within you is yours. Everything within you is yours. I'll repeat that again. Everything within you is yours. Take it. Do not be afraid to take anything within you. You don't need a permission from anyone. There's no one else to ask. There are no others in your mind. So don't have to fear anybody. Everyone's reflecting you in your mind. So um, it's important that you learn to Learn to fall in love with states you want to be, with a version of yourself that you'd want to be. Learn to fall in love with it. Because if you can fall, if you can create a version of yourself or a state that you would like to be and you love it, you will naturally commit to it. Um, you won't find yourself swaying between other ones. So take some time and think about what would I love to be? If you find that and you fulfill that, not only will it feel wonderful, you will, and it will feel natural to you. You will naturally persist in being that. It won't feel like a work. You know, there's this example that Neville gave. Um, this woman wanted to be an author. And she said, um, what should I do, Neville? Like, I want to be an author. What would you do if you're in my position? And he goes, here's what I would do. This is Neville speaking. He goes, I would imagine my book already being finished. And I would see it. Um, I'd see it outside of a window. I would be looking at it from, from the window at a bookstore. And then I'd have people lined up, eager to buy my book, waiting to get into the bookstore before well, it's closed right now and it's about to open and people are lined up to buy it. And then I'd have people wanting my book so badly that I can't keep up with making copies of it because people want it so much. That's what I would do. And people would just, I'd have people just praise me, tell me how wonderful my book is. Now, if you, if you really wanted to be an author and that was the case, you would feel wonderful for that, right? Now, think about this for a moment. How hard is it to honestly persist in that? See, persistence is not a chore. It's Persistence is simply experiencing, being the thing you want to be. 
That's all it is. It's being the person that who that is happening to. So persistence is actually wonderful, but we only need to persist because we need to make it natural to us. That's the only reason. You don't persist to become or persist to get. You already are. You persist in already being it. Because there's only I am in the world. So you must be in the I am of it. So you persist in being it now. Now, take this. Um, this is a, an, uh, you can think of it as a mantra or something to keep in the back of your mind. This is something I've used, something I say. Um, and basically it's this. As far as I'm concerned, I already am what I want to be. The only thing I'm waiting for is for confirmation in my world. I'll repeat that again. As far as I'm concerned, I already am what I want to be. I'm only waiting for confirmation in my world. Now, um, we must learn to you know, assume in the I am. And to assume in the I am takes a, a, a sort of madness, a sort of bravery. But you can do it. You can do it if you know that everything's reflecting I am. You truly can. And, um, you know, Neville said this one time. He said, he said that he had at one point, he was in a world where he was, it was so dark and he could not find the light. He said he didn't know where to turn. He goes, I had no money, none of this and none of that. And I dared to assume that I was the man I wanted to be. And I was where I wanted to be. And strangely, strangely enough, it came out of the nowhere. I didn't have to put my hand in the pocket of another to get it. I did nothing of which I was ashamed of to get it. It just happened. Now, from my own experience, things just happen when you feel natural about it within because it naturally expresses. Natural means effortless. It's just effortlessly expressing. And that's what you want. You don't want to have force anything. Remember, when you, when you feel like you're forcing yourself to do anything within yourself, you... Um, Force implies multiple powers at play. There is no other power but you. There are no other powers within you. It's just you creating it all. Take that as the assumption when you go into the mind. And feel that relief that there is nothing imposing upon you, stomping you. It's just yourself. And um, so, you know, go within your imagination tonight. And feel as if everything you de desire within it has already been said yes to and learn to become instead of trying to be desperate and getting learn to become things in the mind focus on the state of being not necessarily the objects focus on being it now and persist in being that now and make it wonderful make it lovely make it something that you would love to stay in for longer and you know lose yourself entirely in it when to lose yourself means to let go of the future, the past, and the outer world. Completely lose yourself in this imaginal act. Yes, it's a dream, but you won't fail if you completely yield into that dream. Because the moment you yield into it as if it's the only reality, it becomes the only reality. So we turn dreams into realities in our minds. And you have the power to do that. All it takes is your willingness and uh, of the acceptance that it already is so. What is so in imagination becomes so I want to speak about a statement that I made in my last video that may have brought confusion and I want to bring some clarity to it. And the, uh, the statement was this, as far as I am concerned, I already am what I want to be. The only thing I'm waiting for is confirmation. And I understand why this could bring up confusion if it's seen as an affirmation. Now, I want this to just be seen as an, as an understanding and a knowing about reality. Not necessarily an affirmation. Personally, I do not believe in using affirmations to get things. I think unless the affirmations said as a present tense fact and felt as that, then I think affirmations are useless. They have to be felt as something you are now 
or have now. The most important is the now. And um, and I think that I'm going to read some Neville quotes, and I think that this will bring clarity to that statement, that the confusion was mainly, well, if I already am what I want to be, um, why am I waiting? Waiting is also a state of mind. So I'm doing two things. Like, how can I be in two states like that? I either am it or I'm not it. So I hope that this um, these quotes can bring some clarity. Neville states this. How long is it going to take between this imaginal act and its fulfillment? I do not know. But if the law is forever, well then, regardless of what is going to happen, do it now anyway. What would it feel like to be secure? What would it feel like to be wanted? What would it feel like to contribute to the world's good? Well then, assume that I am doing all these things now. And he says, tomorrow may not bring confirmation of what I've done, but do it anyway. And if I do it, then in a way I do not know, it will come to pass. So he tells you that, you know, you may imagine a imaginal act and its fulfillment within you. But tomorrow comes and it still hasn't fulfilled itself in this external world. Don't get discouraged. Mainly the mantra was more of a, uh, an understanding and to bring confidence to you. That's all it was for. It wasn't meant for an affirmation. And, uh, but it's very important that we address this because um, it does bring confusion when you think about it in terms of like, well, if I am it, why am I waiting? And um, an example I want to give is, is somebody who, who wants to be happily married. So they imagine themselves in their mind having a ring on their left hand, on their ring finger. No, typically that's what we do. And they feel proud to be wearing the ring. They feel proud of their partner. They feel they're in a loving relationship. But, and they lose themselves entirely in this imaginal act as if it's, ha as if it's real now, okay? And they open their eyes and they see that they look at their hand and there is no ring physically. Well, um, as far as they are concerned, they are married. Who's married? Well, the one within them is married, and that's who they are. They associate themselves with that being. So they are married. Um, now, the external world may not show that in it, instantly, but don't get discouraged. Um, associate yourself with the inner man who already is married, who already is experiencing the wonderful relationship, who already feels these things, and associates themselves with that state. And um, basically walk with that knowing that my external has to conform to the inner man. And as far as you are concerned, um, you are that. It's more of a confident knowing is what I'm trying to get across. It's not a mantra or a, uh, um, an affirmation to get something. It's, a, it's an understanding that you already are. And when you say I already am, the I there is the inner self that already is expressing what you want that is who you are uh, you feel that and you be that in the present tense feeling of being and uh neville also says that you know he says that before he falls asleep at nighttime he'll think about other people for what they've asked of him things they've asked um, that they want he says i have a conversation with them as though i'm hearing them from the premise of their fulfilled desire and then he says this i do not ask them the next day or call them or write them they call me if they are given some uh he says um somebody will come to me and tell me have you heard the good news and they will tell me the good news about that individual that i imagined if i'm faithful to my planting and he says every state produces its response for the world is an infinite response if i'm faithful and this law is forever then everything must bring after it forth its own kind so he's saying that i don't when i imagine for someone i don't check upon it to see and uh, that's not what I meant by waiting. You don't consistently check, well, is it happening? Is it happening? Is it happening? The only thing you're called to do is persist in being it now. And as far as you are concerned, you are it now. If you must be concerned about something, you are it now. I'm, I don't think you have to be concerned. But if you associate yourself with the imagination and trust it, you don't have to be concerned. The only thing really that you have to do is just await for the confirmation. It must come. It has to come in this outer world because it already has happened in the mind. And... Uh, he also says this, he says, um, well, I did it, I made it. He's talking about in your imagination. It's unseen as yet. It isn't clothed in three dimensional form, but I did it. He is the one who does everything. He's speaking about the imagination personified. He is the one who does everything and all things are possible to him. 
So my reasoning mind will tell me, well, you don't know how it's going to happen. And then he says, as far as I'm concerned, it has happened. I'm only awaiting confirmation. It has happened. So the confidence is that, um, for example, let's go back to the example of somebody who's happily married. They already are that. It has happened. As far as they are concerned, they already are. They already have. Um, they are already experiencing. It already has happened. The only thing they're waiting for is confirmation in the external world. But they don't. you don't walk in waiting for it. You walk in being that. It must conform to the eye of man. Um, so think of it more as like a, if you have a doubt in the day, like as Neville says, like he says, oh, you know, my reasoning mind will say, well, you don't know how it's going to happen. And I'm sure we've all been there. Go back to this statement that, as well, as far as I'm concerned, I am that. I'm only waiting external confirmation. It's a it's intense conf- say, say it with intense confidence, because it's true that the only thing you're waiting for is for it to shape to the I am. It must shape to the I am. It's not um, moving to the state of wanting and waiting. But you've already uh, gotten rid of that. You already are it now, and you've already fulfilled that. Now the only thing that's going to happen now from now on is it's going to express and externalize in this world. So have full confidence that um, that even if you know you doubt, go back to this as far as you are concerned, you really already are it. And you can prove to yourself you are it. Well, who's the you, the inner man? That's who's expressing in this world. If you know that the only thing that's expressing is the inner man, then you really can associate yourself with that inner man being the thing you want to be. And um, if you truly move into that mindset where I am the inner man, I'm the inner self, and the inner self can shape themselves in the way I desire, or I can shape it in the way I desire, then um, reality becomes fun. It becomes, uh, you start, no matter what the world of, as Neville says, the world of Caesar or society says, it doesn't really matter. All that matters is how I shape the inner self because that's all that's reflecting. And as far as you're concerned, that's who's reflecting. That's what externalizes. So don't, you, you walk with that confidence. And it's true. And um, I also want to, want to stress this is that if you're struggling with these, understanding these concepts, as I said before, if you are thinking in terms of separation, uh, you're thinking in terms of, or you start feeling fear. If you start thinking in terms of reflection, you start thinking more in love because life's reflecting you and you get to shape it the way you want to. But you don't have to fall asleep in states of mind like, oh, um, wealth or marriage or, or um, those kind of um, outwardly states, I like to call them. Like, You can also fall asleep in the understanding of this, is that many times I have fallen asleep feeling that the world's reflecting me. I just fell asleep in that mindset that life truly is my own reflection. And I felt that ease and that um, ability to feel fearless because what's there to fear if it's my mirror? And I would fall asleep in that. You can fall asleep with these um, uh, these statements, you know, like like life is reflecting me, and fall asleep with the understanding and allow, allow that understanding to really let go of all these fears that you realize. Well, there really isn't anything to afraid, be afraid of if there are no others. Really feel that that life's just reflecting me, or like that I am the power of my life, that I create my life. Fall asleep in those states that what I assume becomes, and. Um, these states of mind will, you'll find yourself removing so many fears from just doing that. And it'll become much, much easier to uh, assume the states you want to assume. Um, you won't catastrophize them. You won't ruin them. You'll find yourself feeling, um, you find the inner self of you becoming utterly confident in everything you imagine inside yourself. You will know this must come to pass. This must come to pass. And you just move on with your day. And as far as you are concerned, you already are what you want to be. And um, one more thing I want to stress is that everything is yours in imagination. If it wasn't yours, you wouldn't be allowed to imagine it. So everything within you is yours, no matter what it is. The fears and the lovely thoughts are yours. All of it is. You get to choose what you want. Every state you want to be in is yours. How you want to see yourself is yours. How you want others to see you is yours. And I want to, uh, there's this, um, this, I don't want to call it a technique, but it's a uh, sort of thought process that Neville gives. He says this, he, it's, I like to think of it as like the freeze method. He says that you 
imagine everybody in your mind, almost as if they are statues and they're frozen and you, you kind of observe them. And then you say, it's like, and then you tell them, you tell these frozen beings who you are and how they are going to see you. And then you release them. And then they start to, they reflect who you are. They empathize with you, not sympathize. They empathize with you. They see you the way you see yourself. And they're, they're happy to see you that way. And he says, then, Neville says, then you're confident that, that will be executed in this world. And um, I love that method because that type of thinking, because it puts you in so much control in the mind that you freeze it and then you let it go and that you change it and it uh, reflects and it happens uh, in harmony. And you don't have to feel that, well, is it going to, is it going to? No, it is. It will happen. You are totally in control here. And I, um, I'm going to link that video in the description. I, I absolutely love this video because it, it really uh, illustrates the point who you are in imagination, that you're not just this thing that has to have fears attack them and has to defend themselves in their own minds. There's no one to defend yourself from. There are no others. There never has been. And once you can accept that, maybe that maybe you struggle to accept that now, but fall asleep accepting it. Fall asleep allowing yourself to not be afraid anymore. Regardless of what, just fall asleep feeling unafraid. You don't have to have a, a certain string of thought. Um, you don't, you know, think what you want to think, not what you have to think or what you think society wants you to think. Think entirely of your own wants. And I mean this when I say this. Be as selfish as you can be in your mind. Because it's your imagination. And everything is yours within it. Don't allow yourself to um, just think that you have to think certain thoughts. Think entirely what you want and live from that premise. I'm going to imagine what I want for myself and for others, what they want for me. You know, they, someone tells you, hey, um, maybe they don't understand imagination. They start telling you troubles in their life. Imagine as if those troubles are gone for them. And you just keep making everything into heaven. You really truly bring heaven upon this earth. Um, so I hope that clarifies what I'm saying, that I understand the confusion. I understand why somebody would think, well, well you're going into the... Um, into the state of waiting. And actually, I'm actually very glad this was brought up because it means that people are listening. <laughs> you know, um, means what I'm saying is important and it's being paid attention to. So that actually makes me feel good. So um, thank you guys for listening. So I want to focus on the, um, the practice of this information. And I think it's important to have a deep understanding and a potent understanding uh, behind a very simple practice. And in this case, the practice is to feel the wish fulfilled. And that means it's to take a future dream and make it a present fact in the mind. And through my own practice over time, like I had my own questions as like, do I meditate for hours on end? Do I um, just do it one time? Or what is it that I do? Now, um, as, as you know, from testing this out, I found that Neville was correct. He said that it's not so much the length of time, but the frequency that you do it. And... Um, no, I don't just take his word for it. I actually, you know, I test what he says and he's right. It's the frequency because it's the frequency that makes it natural. And you should do this. Likewise, do the same for me. Don't just listen to what I'm saying and believe it. Really test what's being said. See if I'm saying anything true. Um, and if you find it to be false, then just discard it and move to something you find true. Um, but in this case, the best analogy I can give is like going to the gym. When one goes to the gym, they... You know, I used the analogy in the past about like using the uh, I am is like an instrument that you you learn to play and you learn to attach harmonious and lovely uh, um, states to I am. And then you can express a beautiful song in your life. And in this case, you can also think of it like a muscle that needs to be exercised. It needs to learn how to be stable. It needs to learn how to the, for, the, the foundation and the, um, the form. And, you know, you don't just go to the gym one day, you don't work out for 10 hours one day, and then you have results. It's every every day, a little bit every day. Um, it naturally starts to shape the body, the muscle. And in this case, the imagination is the muscle that needs to be shaped. But the actions we're performing, the exercise, is to feel the wish fulfilled every day. That's what one must do. You must be consistent about it daily. Um, and I'll say this, and I mean this in all seriousness, is that Feeling the wish fulfilled one time is greater than 
listening to eight hour subliminal messages before you while you're sleeping or trying to impress your subconscious or um repeating a thousand affirmations a day and i'm telling you from experience feeling it one time is greater because what one once you feel it for the first time what you'll realize is that your desire is within you and the fulfillment is also within you and you must fulfill your desires in imagination and once you realize that you can do that and then when you do do it you have a um a profound peace that you have found it that you found what you've been looking for and um i speak so much about the understanding because i think it's important to have a deep understanding of this and if you take anything what i'm saying um take this is when you go within yourself find the cause don't become so attached to the desire find the cause of the desire realize that, the, that you are the cause of this desire and you are the cause of the fulfillment as well don't be so attached to fear find the cause of fear don't be so attached to certain thoughts find the cause don't be so attached to certain states find the cause of the state who's causing these states and what you'll find is that it's you you're the cause of everything within you everything within you the money the objects the states they're made of the same substance which is imagination but you are the imaginist which gets to choose what you want to make reality um these unoccupied things within you you can make them into realities within you and that is feeling the wish fulfilled that is feeling as a present fact now in the past i've shared that you know you must think of the past as i was or in the future as i will be and remove those as well and it's all about feeling it as i am that there's no working to get it it's already is an imagination you believe imagination now you can also think of it like um when you, when Neville says to leave the world alone and change the conception of yourself you must take that seriously which is to actually leave the world alone and what does that mean you know once i understood this it so much things opened up for me is when you leave the world alone that means you don't care at all what it has told you about yourself and you don't care what it is telling you about yourself and you don't care what it's going to tell you you leave it entirely as is you leave it completely alone you don't change anybody within it you don't change nothing within it all you do is go within and you change yourself inside that is what you do you make you find the cause within you and you change yourself the way you want it to be now um cuz honestly who cares what the world says like honestly at this point who cares i've i've tested this enough to where i really don't care um i've had a conversation with someone where they've said something and i have it was literally something i didn't want to hear <laughs> and it made me feel um kind of annoyed and i went to bed that night changed the entire conversation and it's like a few days, if they called me monday let's just say it went thursday they called again and they repeated those same words that i revised it's almost as if they completely forgot what they said in the, on monday now the reason why i can do that is because i don't care what the world says i don't view the world as final for me i don't i don't ask if my if it's a, if it's possible or impossible i don't care i just imagine it anyways because while i'm imagining i truly feel that i'm exercising the cause of my life and this is the cause of my fortunes and my misfortunes and i'm not here to blame people i'm here to find the cause and what i found is that the cause is my imagination so can i test this yeah if my imagination is expressing here then it's an imagination where i must be where i want to be it's an imagination that i must fulfill my desires and if i can make desires if my desires are expressing from my imagination so will my fulfillments if i fulfill them within me so i've tested this and it's true i found it to be true now i don't know the lengths of this i don't know like the limitations of this dream i don't know if there are any but we must test that and you don't you can't test the limitations of a dream if you keep thinking well it's impossible it's impossible while you imagine or well the world told me this before in the past you know i had a nasty habit of taking my past and using it to sabotage my my dream that i wanted i'd say well i can't really become that because of my past or or, or i would catastrophize my future I'd, i would become it and then I'd, next thing i know it catastrophize it in my mind well who's the cause of it and i'd be so attached to the catastrophe and i'd be so attached to the past in my mind but who's causing these thoughts i am it's me who's given importance to it so once i learned that i was able to not care at all what the world has told me 
Because basically what, what is being done here is the moment you look to your past or your future, your present, and the outer world, you're basically letting that dictate your I am's. You're, you're saying, I am X, Y, and Z because of my past. And you can't allow the world to dictate that. Who cares what the world says? You change your I am's within you. That is what you're seeking. You're seeking a change in I am. And there's nothing wrong with that. Um, everybody is. <laughs> Everyone in this world is looking for the cause. So don't feel, and on some level you found it. Um, but you have to accept that you found it. And from this, you can now completely mold yourself in the way you want to be. And you do it daily. The frequency is what matters. It's not about doing it one time. It's every day you feel the, some wish fulfilled. You practice this. Maybe it's for yourself or maybe it's for another. You know, don't, I've listened to people tell me that they, you know, their situation feels hopeless and they don't know what to do. And I just imagine for them. And then a couple of weeks later, the next thing you know, I get confirmation that it worked out for them. But I don't think about them in the interval of time. I just imagine it in that moment. It's much easier to imagine for others because we can be attached to things in our lives. But you're not so attached to them uh, and the, um, you're, you're, you're not so attached to them in the external. You're attached to them, um, so, for example, what I'm trying to say is that when someone comes to you for help, you're not attached to the external part of them. When you imagine them being, you know, fulfilled, you attach yourself easier to that fulfillment. But when it comes to ourselves, we're so attached to this outer world. We're so attached to the things we want. We have to see that we are the cause of the want. We're the cause of this. Because if we can see that, then we can be the fulfillment of it as well. And then when we're the fulfillment and the cause, when we're the desire and the fulfillment, then we have found the cause which is ourselves. We found what we've been looking for because we don't want the world to fulfill it. I want to fulfill it. I want to be the all, I want to be enough for me entirely. So you have to really, uh, when people come to me and say those things, I don't care what they're saying because when I, I want to hear them tell me that it worked out well because who is hearing that? My imagination's hearing it. And who's the imagination? It's the cause of my life. So I just trust in the cause. I don't care what the world's telling me. And the next thing you know, it naturally works itself out. Next thing you know, you revise the conversation and they repeat what you said. So I don't care what, the, what my past is, or what I've done or what others have done to me in my past. I don't care anymore. I don't care what's going to happen tomorrow because what happens tomorrow is what I do now. All that matters to me is completely letting go and leaving the world alone and accepting my desire being fulfilled now. And if I want to see it fulfilled, then I imagine it. If I want to hear it fulfilled, then I hear it. And it's the cause who's hearing this. It's the cause who's seeing this. And I believe in the cause. And you practice this every day with something. It can be anything. You just practice it. And you'll find it working in your life. And then you go bigger you know, for things that you really want. And you really can feel, you'll start to feel natural about using your imagination. You'll almost forget how the world was before you didn't even know about this information. You'll forget that at one point you didn't even think about your thoughts. You didn't give them a second thought. And now you're becoming aware of this thing within you that can cause um, a change in your life. So, and you can have more and more confidence if you do it daily. So it's, Neville's right. It's about the frequency. Um, there, for example, there's a lady who gave the, um, she used the lullaby method. And she, every day she would feel that something wonderful is happening to me. And remember, is is a present tense. So she would feel it as something is happening to her right in that moment now. And then over time, she, uh, she did that for two months every day. And then some man entered her life who, she was like an old lady who needed money. And there was a guy she knew from the past and he was very wealthy. And he's, he's like, you know, I'm going to pay for everything for you for the rest of your life. And he sent her like monthly checks or something. So she did that every day. So we must learn to, you know, don't be so attached or don't, while you're imagining, don't think, well, I'm imagining this so it can happen, so it can happen, so it can happen. Be more concerned about having it fulfilled within you in imagination. Hear it in the mind and feel as if it's as if it's real. You know, you're almost playing pretend, but you're forgetting you're pretending. That is what I do. And I do that daily, and I'm just used to it now. And you can be used to it as well. And, um, you know, you can take this phrase with you that I've said, which is, I have willed it to be so within me. And what is so in imagination expresses. You know, I have willed it to be so within me. And what is so in imagination expresses. Truly understand what's being said there. And fall asleep to that understanding. That you have willed it to be so. Which is present tense. You have willed it to be so. And what is so in imagination expresses. Hope that helps. 
So this is just going to be more of a video where I just talk. There's no real plan or notes or anything at all. So um, I want to talk about how we must become, since we're only seeing ourselves in this world, we're only seeing our own perception, we must become what we want others to be. So if, for example, every time you look to others, you see uh, inadequacies in them, you're actually just looking into yourself. That means you see inadequacies inside yourself. So if you want to stop seeing people as inadequate or not good enough, then you must start seeing yourself that way. So you must become, if you want to see someone as a friend, you must start becoming a friend to yourself. We must become what we want others to be because we're only seeing our own perception. And, um, and I mean that we live in a world now where, I mean, I think it's always been this way, but, um, inadequacies seem to run rampant in our minds. We don't know how to get rid of them. But if one can see that they're just assumptions, and they're, they're, they're assumptions inside of consciousness, then you can go in consciousness and assume new things. If you can see that the cause is consciousness, then that's where you need to change it. Then you can feel um, at ease because you know where to change it at. And it can be changed since everything can be changed in consciousness. So if you're struggling with inadequacies, these are just things of how you, how you feel towards yourself. You must just change how you see yourself in imagination only. Start there. Well, how do I do that? Well, if it's my own personal reality and it's my own inner world where I can mold it and shape it how I want it to be, and I have in some way molded it in a way that I didn't like, and I am the cause of this um, misfortunate state inside myself, then I'm also the solution to fix it. Since I'm the cause of it. I'm the cause of the problem inside my own head. So I'm, that can be the cause of the solution. So I'm going to repeat that we must become what we want others to be in our lives. And I think Neville mentions that in one of his books. I think, he, I think it's in the five lessons he speaks about this. But it truly is its true because if, for on the one hand, if someone is inadequate, remember, the imagination has to fulfill itself. So if you are in, that's why it says that he who has, more will be given to him, and he who doesn't have, more will be taken away. So it's like this fulfilling of it. Of It's, it's like the state continuously fulfills itself. So when someone has inadequacies, this, this is a state of mind. And this state of mind fulfills itself by finding it's a it, the person will always see other people which is really their mirror they will see other people as better than them on some level they will to, to continuously fulfill the state of inadequacy that's all that's being done here so if you wish to you know remove inadequacies you need to start seeing your you need to remove it from your own mind first and you you don't have to change anyone around you that's why it says uh take the log out of your eye before you take the speck out of your brothers so if you wish to um, see people as enough, just start seeing yourself that way. Just assume it in, my, in the mind. Let it be true just in the mind. So what I mean by that is you might, not have, um, you might not have something, but in consciousness you have it. And that's what you trust in. When you imagine something and you feel the imagination reply to you saying yes to whatever it is, trust that that yes is coming from the only cause in your life. If you can trust that, um, you would truly feel the wish fulfilled. Because, you know, we're trying to trust imagination, but how do we know imagination is good? Well, the way I know to trust it is because things grow after their own kind. That when I do, when I plant certain seeds of misfortune, they grow in my life. When I plant seeds of fortune, they do grow as well. So um, things do grow after their own kind, and that's how I trust my own mind when it says yes i just trust it okay it's been given to me if it's given to me in the mind then it will grow after its own kind out here so um so it's important for us to realize that states like inadequacy and are not things that you need to certainly you don't have to solve them they, they're states they are um positions you take inside your own mind that's all it is it's not necessarily you have to work your way out of inadequacy because it's just a state. You just move into a state of adequate, you know, of being adequate. That's what you would do. 
So if you can see them as states and not necessarily things that were given to you, you know, you're, you just have a burden with, you know, it's a burden from your childhood and you have to carry it and you have to, un, you know, resolve all of these things. I mean, things fulfill themselves. So your inadequacy, if you feel that, will always continuously reflect in your world because you're just seeing yourself. And if you can see that that's just a state of mind, then it makes it much easier to just move from that state, realizing that you're the being who moves in and out of states, that states are, are dormant. They don't have life. They don't, they don't have, they're, they're like uh, potentials of expression, but they need the self inside of, inside of the expression, which is you. So you need to occupy these states. So how do I occupy a state? Well, I imagine myself um, feeling adequate in my mind, and I have a frame of reference. So I bring people I know around me telling me that they're proud that I'm no longer feeling inadequate or something that implies the fulfillment. And I just trust in that. Or I just trust that um, I basically ask my mind, am I allowed to have adequacy? And I just say yes to myself, but I believe that yes is from the cause only. It's coming from consciousness. So no one could hear my yes with their mortal ears but I heard it with the divine ears, and I trust in those. So that's how I that's how I think that when it comes to removing these types of things that come from trauma, it's best to see them as states that you're in. It's not necessarily because what tends to happen is if you're in a state for so long, you simply identify with it as your own being. But it's not. It's just a, it's a skin that you need to shut off. That's all it is. And making it more than that, you have now made yourself smaller in your mind. These these things are just like objects and states. They're inside the mind. They're made of imagination. So, And everything that's in imagination is yours. So if you wish to be in a new state, go within imagination and find it, because that's where the cause is at. And you just trust in it. You experience being it in the mind just as though it's true. And you can feel entirely safe in your mind because there's... The only one who can ruin things, it's you. No one can ruin anything for you. They're just obeying your rules. And if you can see that, then uh, I really think a deep freedom can grow from there. And it's best to just contemplate on this information, not try to understand what I'm saying uh, from this one video, because these are things I've thought of for years. I mean, I came to these very simple conclusions through just thinking about it for a long time. So just contemplate on it. Um, Break down what I'm saying in your mind and see if it makes sense or see if what I'm saying is true. You know, do I really see in others what I'm really seeing in myself? Is it really just me in the end? Is that really who I just have to change? And when you find that to be true, again, you'll feel more freedom. That there is no one to change but self and you get to leave the world alone. So I hope that... um I hope that frees you seeing that even those, you know, I know sometimes when we think about states, we think of like wealth or success or something of some sort of attachment to some physical thing out here. But things like inadequacies are just in the mind. And you can remove them the same way. They're just made, they're made of the same substance, imagination. And you're the imaginist to change it. So take, you know, take your power back in your mind. Realize who you are. And if you don't know, spend some time contemplating and meditating on who am I in here? Really ask yourself, who am I in this world of imagination? Am I really the cause here? Or is there something else causing my thoughts? Is there something else that is in control? So I hope that helps. I hope that frees you. So I want to speak about a sentence that Neville used. And he always said this phrase sort of like it's denied by your senses, denied by your reason, um, assume the wish fulfilled, even though it is denied. And, you know, the first part we can all kind of agree on that our imagination can see beyond what our senses see. We all can agree with that. Our sense perception is limited, but our divine perception is infinite. We can kind of see whatever we want in our minds. And even though your outer world may be showing you something that is opposite of what you want. Um, Neville tells us to not depend on our senses, but depend on the uh, imaginative man within. And that's who um, dictates your I am's. Because the question really is, which world are you going to allow to dictate who you are? The one within or the one without? The one within will define you, but the one within 
you get to define yourself. Which one are you going to allow to define, define you? And um, But he also says this one phrase after, which is, deny your reasoning. So, in my opinion, your reasoning is what is stopping you from experiencing a heaven within you. It's your reasoning that keeps you in bondage. Because your reasoning, what it's doing, the moment you assume you are something, and then you start getting those questions like, yeah, but what if this happens? And how do you know you're not going to mess it up again? Or how do you know um, the bridge will be good? Or what if it's bad? Or all these re- all this reasoning. You must abandon all of that. It has no place for imagination. Because that is, what is it? what it's actually doing is that it's keeping you bondage and fear and bondage in your limited state. So if you want to expand yourself, you have to abandon your reasoning. That means abandoning anything that comes into argumentation or conflict with your wish fulfilled. So if you say, I am, you're desiring, okay, to be um, freed from this problem in your life, okay? Well, knowing consciousness is the only reality, the problem is in consciousness. So you assume you have that freedom in consciousness. But the moment you assume you have that freedom, you start to get thoughts like, well, how do I really know I have it? How do I, you know, what if I don't really have it? Or what if you're still thinking that from this position, your reasoning is still making you think in terms of separation instead of reflection. And then you can't really experience being freed from it because you're allowing your reasoning to stop you. And things go away in the mind. They don't ever die, but they go away, if you will, when your attention is placed off of it and placed upon something else. So you must become very focused on actually being who you want to be. Stop desiring that you want to be it, but actually be it. You have to let go of your reasoning. And reasoning is um, very convincing because it points to things that are truthful, right? Like your past or things that you made mistakes on or uh, your fears and worries of today and or of tomorrow. I mean, your reasoning is pretty convincing. But if you can see, again, don't be so attached to the reasoning. Find the cause of the reasoning. And the cause is you. And you create from reasoning, too. You keep yourself in bondage that way. Um, now... Here's what I do. Um, I want to explain, like, how do I imagine? So, when let's say, I, let's just take an example. I want to be at the mall, okay? Right now I'm recording this, but I want to be at the mall. So what I do is I see myself, which is my imaginative man, at the mall, okay? Now, I can do one or two things. I can either say, well, this is just imaginary, it's not really real. It's kind of, it, I'm just conjuring this up in my head, but I'm really just recording and that's not real. And, or I can grant it reality and say it is real and experience the reality of it. Now, this is where me and Neville differ. Neville was very, very big on adding sensory vividness. I am I understand why you would do that, and I think you should. I mean, why wouldn't you want to be, why wouldn't you want to make your desire feel as real to you? I mean, why why not? You get to really experience it, really experience it, if it's what you really want. Um, But I have found actually doing the opposite works better, is if you assume the reality first of the scene, then sensory vividness sort of just develops on its own. That's what I've noticed, because... For me, when I when I heard about adding sensory vividness, that caused me to have such a um, it was such a strain on my mind. It would make me feel like I'm not doing it right, or um, like how much is enough. <laughs> and I have found that if actually if you just abandon your reasoning, that is your reasoning is what keep is keeping you from thinking it's not real. You're convincing yourself it's not real because it's in your imagination. So, but if you remove your reasoning. Don't allow it to penetrate you with any kind of feeling. You just kind of ignore it. You just act like it isn't there. Um, you can actually start to experience that that I'm at the mall, literally. You, the more you let go of reasoning, the more it starts to feel real to you. 
So, and I abandon all my memories. Like I abandon everything. I give it all up. Uh, I give my present conception up. Like I give this body up. This body cannot get me to the mall right now. It's it's doing this recording. But my in, inner, inner man, he can go to the mall whenever he wants. And that's who I am. That's who I think I am. And where he goes, this body will go. Because this body is simply a, um, it's just a reflection. It's just an expression. So I when I say I abandon my memory, I mean, I don't allow myself to think, well, you know, in your past you did X, Y, and Z, and therefore you can't, whatever. That's just sabotaging yourself. So I completely let all that go. I don't think about my past. I don't let it affect my whatever it is I want to experience in it. And I can experience anything. Now, that is true freedom in the mind, is being able to experience anything as if it's reality. And what that requires for you to do is to abandon your reasoning Abandon your reasoning and to abandon really just your reason because you can think of memories as also you use your memories. It's, but I like to just call it just reasoning. You abandon this, then you can start to experience things in the mind as real. You can stop being so afraid of them. It's your reasoning that's keeping you in bondage of fear. There's nothing to be afraid of in imagination. I mean, it's funny because, um, we tend to do this thing where we say things like, well, you know, I'm being at the mall right now and it's so lovely. Ah, oh, it's just imagination. But then when we start conjuring up fearful thoughts, it's, it's no longer just imagination. It's this, oh, I can't get rid of these negative thoughts. They're, they're affecting my body and I'm panicking. And, but at one, but the, on the other, you know, side of the coin, you're, t- you're telling me that it's just imagination when it comes to something good. But yet when it comes to something bad, it's panic attack. You see what I'm trying to say how like we, we kind of give credit to one, we credit one reality, we don't credit the other one reality. They're both realities. They're both realities. But when if you can see that you're the cause of everything in imagination, you don't have to become afraid. Now the question becomes this. Well, let's say I'm not afraid and I do assume that I am. How do I know it's going to re- express itself? Now this question comes from the idea that life is happening to you. So you're questioning if it's going to happen. Remember, life is not happening to you. It's coming from you. This is not even the law of attraction. I don't, I don't, I, I read, I read no literature on the law of attraction. I have never read, I don't read that stuff. So I'm not like, I don't have any of their, their thoughts. I've, I just seen it from Neville's teachings and my own practice. Things are not, you're not attracting stuff. Stuff's coming from you. So the moment you feel Whatever it is you want to feel, you're calling forth its expression from you. You can think of it this way. Like the moment you feel safe and you start to feel safe and safe and safe, you are calling forth safe people into your world. You are calling for, it's coming from you. You're bringing them out of you. And then I, that's how I've seen it play out is that the moment you assume you are something, you're calling forth its expression because you are the expressor of life. You are the, and if you want to take an assumption with you tonight, to sleep is that you are the, you are reality itself. You are reality itself. And, um, I mean that you will feel an immense amount of freedom knowing that re- you are the reality, that it's not happening to you, that you're in this drama and you get to play in it how you want to play. But you have to must, you have to allow yourself to play and stop being afraid of it. And if you know it's all happening from you from within and there's nothing to be afraid of from within because you are the cause of it all, then you can start causing the life you want. You can start planting the seeds you want to plant. But if man doesn't know who he is, he's going to try to use the imagination and he's going to be really worried. Like if you, if you depend, if your safety depends on the external world and not from the world within, what you'll do with this information is that you'll give yourself all the feelings you want of safety, of love and respect. And the moment you re-enter into the outer world, you become afraid and you sabotage everything you've done within you. And you no longer can walk in that fulfillment because um, you're letting the outer world dictate your freedom. You're letting the outer world dictate how safe you are because you're viewing it as separate from you. You have to see it as it's coming from you, not, not at you. It's not coming at you. And... This to me is a, is one of the most powerful things you can learn from Neville's work is that you're not attracting. It's coming out of you. That's, that's who you are. 
And if you can think of, and it, honestly, I would rid my, I, I would, if I were you, I would rid myself from the idea that I'm attracting stuff because things are coming out of you. That's how I view this. Is that the moment I assume I'm in a state, people, people in my life, they're not, you can't judge after appearances. What they look like doesn't matter. It, they represent, they're in a state of mind that represents something about you. That's why they're there. You're surrounded by states. And the moment you assume a state, more states come out from you to, because man, you know, surrounds himself with his own image. How can, how can that be that man surrounds himself with his own image? Because it's not that, it's not physical image, it's the image of his mind. He surrounds himself with whatever happens to fulfill his own mental image of himself. So if he finds himself worthless, you bet he will be around people who will confirm his worthlessness. It will happen. If he assumes that he's respected and listened to, you bet he'll be surrounded by people who will listen. Because it, it, but he's surrounded by, I, I say people, but they're really just states. Like when you marry someone, you're not marrying their body. You guys are linked up on each other's states. It's not really each other. It's just you. <laughs> I know it's confusing, but... Um, you, you want to get to oneness all the time. You want to get to being the cause. Because, for example, if I, I had a dream recently where I woke up in the middle of the night and I woke up screaming. I was just yelling at somebody in my mind. I was very angry with them. And I remember when I woke up, I was convinced, absolutely convinced that li that, that dream was happening to me. I was 100% convinced it was, if you asked me, do you think this is happening within you? Or do you think this is coming from outside of you? I would 100% say it's coming outside of me. But then I woke up and I realized it was just a dream happening within me. How can that be? How could it be that I experienced something that was so real, just as real as this, yet it was happening all within me? And if you had told me, well, in, in the dream, if you told me, hey, I want you to assume this is just a dream that's happening to you, I don't think I could do it because I'd be like, no, this is reality. This is happening to me. This isn't just a dream. And then I come to find out that it was a dream. I found out it was. I was completely wrong. That thing that felt so real was actually happening within me. Now, I'm trying to tell you that that's the same in this world. Wake up and realize that it's just happening from you, that it's coming from within to without. It's not the other way around. And if you could do it that way, you won't have this self-sabotaging coming anymore because who's sabotaging? It's just you. you. Nothing can sabotage unless you allow the sabotage to be there. And if you imagine you, you are something, it comes from you. So you don't have to feel like some, you, you don't have to imagine and wait for someone to come give it to you. That's not how this works. It's coming from you. Life is coming from you. You are the reality itself. And you can tell you are because in imagination, you can have all these thoughts that don't really matter, but they become alive the moment you really enter into them and occupy them. And you, I start to, what I do is I assume that, let's go back to the mall. I assume that the mall's real, I, but my reasoning mind will tell me no, but I just ignore my reasoning mind completely. I just assume it's real. There's a, there is a dream where you're experiencing exactly what you want to experience and you're feeling exactly what you want to feel. Find that. Maybe you want to, for example, I had a thing where I was always, um, I always felt like I had a bad self image. So when I was around people, I would wonder if they're seeing that side of me and I'd get nervous. And that's me viewing everyone as separate from me. But in imagination, what I found was that I can be in this exact same position in my mind, but feel entirely confident in myself. There's a version of me where that, where, I'm, where I am experiencing that. Now the question is, do I believe it? That's the condition that's placed on. Can I believe that's real? That's all that's asked of me. Not to figure it out, not to do any, I don't worry about any of that stuff. I just ask myself, do I, do I believe this is real of me? That this part of me inside of me is very confident. Is that real? And I'd say yes. So then the more I abandon my reasoning, it becomes more real to me. Then I become it. Um, you can think of it as God abandoned his reasoning. He abandoned who he was to become man and completely forgot. He forgot his memory. You think of it that way. Well, we do the same thing. Like when I want to be in a new state, I must abandon. You want to move from the state of poverty to the state of um, having more money. You must abandon the memory of ever being poor. Abandon the memory of being it. 
Abandon who you are. Leave the body alone. It can't do it. It's useless. It's limited. And go within to the unlimited. Or the limitless. And take what you want in there. And be that person who's in there. Assume you are that person. And what you'll find is that person's God inside of imagination can do all things. And the more you associate with that being, what you'll find is reality, you'll go, wow, reality actually is happening from me. It's not necessarily happening to me. And then more, and what you'll find is fear has no place in imagination. Fear is an illusion. It's something you construct from thinking the outer world's real. That's what it is. You're afraid of this person and that person. You're not, you're not realizing you're afraid of states that are reflecting you. You can't be afraid of those things. All you have to do is change your state and then automatically people change around you. Because life's happening uh, from you. So I, that, I take it from more of a... I always try to find the cause and I'm the cause. If I start thinking that I'm attracting things, then I start thinking of something outside of me. And I don't think that way. I think that I assume it within myself and from me, my assumption expresses. And that to me is a much more powerful and potent way of understanding that when I imagine I don't have to, you don't have to be afraid that something will sabotage you. That's what I was always afraid of. I was constantly afraid of something coming in the way and the next thing you know, I, oh great, I have my desire, but it will be ruined somehow. I used to always think everything would have to be ruined somehow. I just grew up that way. But that's an assumption. And I'm the cause of that. And that makes me feel very, I credit it to imagination. That's what I mean by the cause is that I go within my life and all my experiences, I just give credit to the imagination. I say, you did this, you did this. Um, you did this good and you did this bad. I, credit, I give all the credit to you for my life because if I can give that the credit, then I can also realize that I can change that. That's what I must rely. I, I try to make my, my life rely entirely upon imagination. And the more I do that, the less afraid I become. And the less afraid I become, it becomes easier to imagine everything I want. And then I start to, my body starts to react and I start to have a very peaceful body from it. And I start to respond and react that way in my life. So I know from experience, if you change within, you change yourself completely. But to change requires an abandonment of your reasoning. You can't reason your way into a state. I'm going to tell you this. If you're looking for some logic and reasoning type of article, I'm not going to give it to you. That You will not get it from me because I don't reason. That's That's what I don't do. If you're looking for some peer-reviewed research, I'm not going to give it to you because I literally don't re I don't reason my way into states. I just assume I am it. I don't care if it's real or it's going to happen. I don't think about anything like that. I simply just enter into it because it's your reasoning that keeps you in bondage. It's your reasoning that makes you feel limited. It's your reasoning that doesn't allow you to experience heaven within you. That's what must be abandoned entirely. It's your reason that makes you think you have lack it's your reasoning that keeps you in desire. It's your reasoning to think that you aren't um, a being who can be fulfilled, who can live in fulfillment. You know, I said this recently in my post. Um, I wrote that that a man, or I should say, to stop desiring. Because if you desire, desiring is like eating maggots in imagination. And you can think of it this way. A king in this world, a king in this world who desires is a worm being fed to the birds. But a man who lives in fulfillment is a god. Now, really reflect on what I'm saying there. Don't live in desire. Don't be a king. Yeah, okay, you have some status, but you are hungry after power, and you can't seem to ever you can't seem to ever obtain it. Don't you don't have to be like that. Power is not in the world. Power is from within. It's not some. It's not a position in the world. That's nonsense. They don't have power. They're desiring power. <laughs> They're still living in desire. You don't want to live in desire. You want to realize that you don't have to live, not by suppressing your desires, but giving them all to you. You know, God says that in the, in the scripture, he says, if I was hungry, I wouldn't tell you. The world is mine, all that's, all that's, what, what, all that's within it. All right. So you can think of it that way as being God in the mind. That's how you must think of it, is that if you were hungry in imagination, would you honestly tell anybody? Would you ask someone to give you something in imagination? Be like, be honest, would you? No, because if you were hungry, you would just bring up whatever meal you would want. If you were, well, would you, would you really wait for someone to tell you you are something to be it? No. I would become it and then they would see me that way. 
There's nothing to wait for with an imagination. I don't need to like beg someone. I'm not a beggar. If I was hungry, I wouldn't tell anybody. I would just imagine myself being fed. Everything's mine. If I wanted to be freed from this, I don't have to ask anybody or wait for someone to give it to me in imagination. I just give it to myself. I'm the cause here. It's all mine. And really take that, you know, realize that those are your words. The world's mine, all that's within it. And if I was hungry, I wouldn't tell you. Those are your words. In imagination, that's the, imag that's the man in imagination's words. If he's hungry, he'll just eat. If he's desiring, I don't have to beg you for to give you my desire. I'll just give it to myself. And when you start to live this way, you start to become an actual individual. You start to actually feel unique. Um, you feel that this entire experience was for you, for your own awakening. And um, there's nothing more important that I can say than to abandon your reasoning. It's the thing that keeps you in bondage. And I mean that. If you want to take something from what I'm saying, as somebody who's used his reasoning to sabotage his whole life, I'm telling you, remove reasoning. It's just coming from fear and limitation. You cannot expand with your reasoning. Abandon it and start to expand within. Don't wonder if the mall's real or if it's actually happened or if you really are or if you left your old state or if it really will express. Remember that life, you are reality itself and reality is coming from you. And you are the cause of all things within you. Understand that and you won't feel these deep fears anymore. So, I can speak all day about this, and I mean that about abandoning your reasoning. It's the most important thing I can think of to talk about. You have to, like, a perfect example of abandoning the reasoning is revision. Suppose you got into an argument with someone, and you want to revise that at nighttime, but you can't seem to let go of the feelings of anger. What you must realize is that that experience came from imagination, credit to imagination, and that's where you change it. So you fall asleep that night, and you stop thinking that the world's happening at you, or it's coming at you, or it's happening to you. Notice that that came from imagination as well, and that's where you change it. But in order to change it and accept that, accept the imaginative day, revised day, you have to abandon your reason, because your reason will tell you, no, you you didn't have this day. This is just an imagina imaginary day. The the reason reason which is really Satan in the scriptures, that will always try to get you to um, see your desire or see the imagination as fiction. That's really what its goal is. Um, but when you see that you're the cause of reason, you can let it go. So what you do is you accept the revised day as if it, as if that's the day you had. I, it's not going to make sense. <laughs> I'm not telling you to. I'm telling you to not make it make sense. I'm telling you to abandon your reasoning and completely feel that you are what you want to be now. Start living it. You can't live in fulfillment with comp always trying to reason your way into fulfillment. You must just be fulfilled. Um, I've tried to make it reasonable to do this, to test this, but to actually occupy a state, you must abandon the reasoning. So I hope that, um, and it could be for anything. I mean, you want to assume that not a thing in this world can embarrass you. Abandon your reasoning and assume it. You want to assume that you're fulfilled and you are just this confident being? Abandon your reasoning and fulfill it. You want to assume that <clears throat> things are always working out for you? Abandon your reasoning and assume it. That you're intelligent? Assume it. You don't have to wait upon anyone to tell you. In fact, they will come because man surrounds himself with his own image. So you don't have to be afraid of anybody or worry that this person's not getting their deserved penalty. Or Don't worry about people. They're, everyone's getting exactly what they're imagining. So And so are you. You just focus on yourself. You focus on what you want to be and who you want to be inside yourself. You make yourself reign king in the mind. Or everything comes down to your orders. And you won't have this fear. You don't need to fear anything in imagination. So I know this video is a little bit longer than usual, but I felt like I needed to share this. Um, I hope this frees you. I can speak more about this in the future. So I want to speak more about reasoning and why I think you should abandon reasoning while you imagine. Because it is my opinion that reason is coming from the sense man. It's really your own voice. You know, the voice that puts you in bondage is the same voice that frees you. 
But at times we listen to the voice of reason, which puts us in bondage. But reason itself comes from fear. It comes from limitation. It's, it's not necessarily, it's a construct that was created by yourself from the external. Because reason will ask you, well, when will this happen? How will it happen? But these questions don't exist in imagination. In imagination, things already are. They are already happening. It already is so. And I know you're capable of imagining what you want. I know you're capable of seeing what you want. I know you're capable of hearing what you want. You can imagine anything you like, but that's not the problem. The question is, do you believe in it? Do you believe in what you're hearing and what you're seeing? Do you believe in what you're imagining? That's the question. And in order to yield or to surrender into a dream, one must abandon reasoning. You know, Neville would say this, that when he would feel restrictions and pressures within himself, he found that was the best time to assume that he is who he wants to be. It's his best time to imagine himself being what he wants to be. And he said he would die to himself and then yield into what is only a dream. He would go mad and yield. Now, the going mad part is removing reason. Because reason will tell me, this is just a dream. It's Your senses don't show you this. This is just all in imagination. It's just fake. It's fiction. And what Neville's trying to tell us is that it's the reverse that things come from imagination here. The things you're seeing came from imagination as well. And um, if you can, the way to practice abandoning your reasoning is to bring things to the present moment. You know, he says to immerse yourself in the wish fulfilled, but in order to truly immerse yourself, you must abandon the idea. I can explain, I guess, let me explain an example. Suppose you wanted to assume that you're, let's just say it doesn't matter. Let's just say brilliant. You want to assume that you're brilliant. And then you go to assume this and a few things happen. Either your past is brought up showing you how you're not brilliant or your fears of the future start coming up that what if you were brilliant and things went wrong or um, what if you actually won't become it or anything, that any question that comes in the way, like how would you even become brilliant? When would you become brilliant? All of these questions are stemming from fear. They're from reason. And you can't bring those into the present moment. You can't can't successfully enter into imagination by holding on to your external reality. You must let go of the external reality. Because imagination, everything's happening in the present moment. Everything already is happening. You already are it in the mind. The question is, are you going to allow yourself to believe in that? It's not a matter of how you're going to get there. You you are already there in imagination. Can you go mad and abandon your reasoning and uh, yield and surrender into it, even though it's just a dream? Because in reality, you actually already grant reality to imaginal acts all the time. You credit them reality. You're the creditor of reality. You can take a fearful thought and you can credit it reality. And the next thing you know, you start feeling fear from it. Because you're dreaming up a nightmare and you're believing in that nightmare as if it's the only reality and it scares you. And then either you fight, you try to fight your way out of it, not realizing the same voice that puts you into that nightmare is the same voice that frees you. There's not another savior. The savior's within. You know, um, I think a common experience with this is that, you know, from my experience that I would think the thoughts I do not want and then I would abandon my reasoning and let those thoughts make me afraid then I would think about thoughts I do want and I would let my reasoning stop me and this was the war that was within that's really within a lot of us is the war of reason is that we allow the limitations um, in the mind to convince us that we're limited in imagination when that doesn't make sense because 
you can conjure up anything in imagination. And the voice that is keeping you in bondage in imagination is the same one that can free you in imagination. Because the question is this, I know you can sit there and say, I am freed from this problem in my life. Are you going to believe that? You know, it doesn't really matter if you repeat it with your outer lips. As Neville would say, many people would imagine, I am rich, I am rich, I am rich. They would say this over and over again. But in the depths of their being, they would feel, when's the next dollar, when is the next dollar going to come? So they would worry about money, even though they're speaking with their lips that they're rich. It's not about what you say with your outer lips, but the ones you say within. It's the words, which lips are you going to um, allow dictate your life? The ones on the external, the ones internal, the ones that, and the ones internal, those lips can say anything. It can, those ears can hear anything. Those eyes can see anything. And if you hold on to your reasoning, um, you will find yourself becoming frustrated because on the one level, you want to uh, grant yourself this desire. But on another level, you feel that you must obey reason. And these two can't go together because reasoning tells you you're not that, while imagination tells you you are that. Who are you going to believe? It's just yourself in the end, but you know, you know, in some sense, you kind of believe in an illusion of separation, so you feel like you have the separation within you. And what eventually has to happen is that the external man has to die. He has to wither away. And all that's left is the internal man who lives in imagination. But reason, reason is something that makes you wonder. It's like a wondering type of thinking. It's um, maybe you assume that you are something, but then you start worrying what actions are you going to take after you imagine. All of these things that pertain to the external comes from this reasoning. And it's not allowing you to actually experience in imagination your desire. It's really not, it's not allowing, you're really not allowing yourself to just be in imagination. Because remember, things are already are. You don't necessarily have to create anything in imagination. It already is. So to what you need to learn to do is to immerse yourself in imagination as if it's the only reality. No matter what it is. Because that's the only thing stopping you from, from actually changing your I am. Because to assume in the feeling of I hope I will be, like you're saying, I am brilliant, but deep down you're feeling, ah, I hope I'm brilliant, I hope I can be. To assume in the feeling of I will is to give birth to fears. And this is not even natural. It doesn't feel natural to assume in the I will be's. It is only natural to assume in the I am, for there is nothing being expressed but I am. Now, as I said before, from us, life comes. So from the I am, from what I am, life is formed. So all I must do is change my I am. What is my I am? What am I aware, aware of being currently? That's my I am. Now you might, you might um, want to assume that you're an author, but you feel like you haven't written a book yet. So how can I assume this? Well, abandon your reasoning that you haven't written a book. Abandon, um, now you can just apply this to anything. I'm just using author because it comes to my mind. But you abandon the idea that you're not an author, that you haven't written a book. All of that reasoning needs to go. And what you do is you assume that I am an author and you feel that you are that now. Because you already are it in imagination. And then this is what shapes your I am. And from this, the world starts to reshuffle because it's coming, you know, the world's reflecting I am. It's responding to I am. So if you don't have to be afraid to assume you are something, it doesn't really matter what it is. All that matters is, are you going to allow your reasoning to dictate your limitation? Are you allow it to um, restrict you from expanding? That's the question. And you know, this idea that, I don't think it sounds as bad as Neville, Neville said that he goes mad and, uh, you know, he surrenders into what is only a dream. He sparks reality into it. He um, believes in the reality of what he's looking at. He, or I should say he believes reality into it. And, um, you know, he said something really important in, this, in the lecture, there is no fiction. And he says this, 
Point yourself towards the wish fulfilled and accept that invisible state as reality. Then go your way knowing the desire is yours now. You did it and you will not be surprised when it comes to pass. So he says to accept the invisible state as reality. Now, you can use state, but I can also accept the invisible ears and what they're hearing. Accept the invisible eyes and what they're seeing. Accept this invisible dream as reality. And bring it to the present moment. And you don't need to be afraid. Actually, all your fears will melt because there is no fear in the present of being it. There can't be a fear. How could there be any fear? You, in order for there to be fear, you'd have to conjure it up. And if and fear comes from reason, so you, if you abandon your reason, you won't be afraid to be in it. A common experience I had was I would imagine myself to be something, and then I would become afraid as to what actions I should take because I didn't trust myself and the actions that I could take. I wondered if I was smart enough or if I was this enough or that enough. But that's not, as Neville says, that's not the righteousness by which you die to your sins. I was still living in sin. I would assume that I am something, but then five minutes later I would reject it in some sense. I wouldn't actually believe in the words I'm saying within myself. And then it wasn't until I saw that those words are the same, the same ones that I believe in to condemn me is the same voice that I could, I could believe in to um, accept my desires, to free me. But I only use this, I misuse this power. I only use it in one way, which is to conjure up fears. And if you know that you are, if you are conjuring up fears, you must see that, you know, you don't be ashamed of what you created. You may have created like a nightmare. But what you need to do is wake up and see who the dreamer is. I mentioned before that I had, an, I had a nightmare the other day. And I woke up and found out that that nightmare was happening within me. I was the dreamer all along. It felt real. But once I saw that it was me who was doing it, me the dreamer, no matter what I've created, I can change it. It's always my dream. So, and I want to stress this point, is you need to assume, you won't, you will not be committed to assuming you are something if you don't love it and you only love it if it's really your own desire if you start to uh, imagine for other people in the sense that like you're saying well i want to be brilliant so that i can finally feel accepted by people if you're imagining for others in that sense uh you're still not getting it you won't be committed to that because that's not the end neville says to go to the end the end is not to imagine having money so you can be respected. No, it's, you feel, res if that's the goal, then feel respected. Go to the end. Always go to the end. Um, common one is people wanting to go to the lottery to get wealthy. That's, they're still working on the means. I'm not saying it's impossible. It's just better to go to the end, which is feeling after wealth, that yourself to be that. Now, you don't think about the lottery and try to, you know, work your way around it very common mistake that's why Neville says don't focus on things focus on being the one who is you don't focus on what you need to do to become brilliant you assume you are it now and then that will express naturally into your world because the world's reflecting or responding to I am but if it's if you're not assuming in the I am you will never express it because you're not believing in it as a present fact now you are reasoning your way out of it. You are using reason to create the feeling of, oh, I hope I can be this one day. It doesn't matter what the world's showing you. I don't care if someone told you yesterday that you could never do what you um, think you could do. Just ignore them. It's yourself anyways. It's just expressing your own doubt. And if you believed in yourself, guess what? They would, if you believed in it, you would express it and then they would have to conform to seeing you that way. So don't be concerned with what people are saying in the world or where you're physically at. These aren't the problems. Remember what Neville said that it was when he became aware of his restrictions and pressures, he would die and yield to what is only a dream. He would go mad and surrender to what is only a dream. And he would believe in that to be the reality. It's, he realized that desires, which are restrictions and limitations, are within him. They're not external. They're not outside of him. 
And when he was able to see that, he was able to start freeing himself the way he wanted to be freed for himself. So I don't wonder if like, is it selfish for me to assume that I am this? Or is it wrong? Or is it, um, will, th- will I be accepted? Or all these, this is all reasoning. I just remove all of that. I simply just, as Neville says, dare to assume that I, an assumption is what I am now, not something I'm going to be. But you can't get there with reasoning. Because reasoning tells you you're not that. Reasoning tells you, um, puts doubt into you that you could ever become it. But life's res- responding to I am. And if I know that's the cause, then I know what to change. Well, what is I am? Well, like I said, it's what I'm aware of being in the present moment. So I speak about this because I find that reasoning is, what reasoning does is it creates, um, it really conditions your desires. There's, it places all these conditions upon it that, well, you have to have this first or that qualification to assume this, to assume that. Uh, but in imagination, you don't even need money. You don't need qualifications. You don't need anything. Your needs are all, you can walk around in your imagination just as though all your needs are met. You're allowed to do that. And the question you must ask yourself is when you enter an imagination, who am I in here? Am I simply a a little being who's desiring everything? Begging for other people not to hurt me? Or am I assuming that I am what I want to be? Am I acting like a God in here? Am I acting like all my needs are met? You know, who am I really in this world? Is, are things really responding to me? And you'll see that the moment you assume in the I am, um, your imagination starts to shift, you know, reshuffle itself. And that is the reshuffling that will happen in your external world. Um, and I don't mean magic. (laughs) I don't mean that you're going to open your eyes and I'm not saying it's impossible, but um, I haven't had that experience. My experience has been very much where I assume that I am it. It completely removes all barriers in my mind. I feel a euphoria. I feel free. And then I find naturally my world starts to, my conversations with people change in the nature of what I've shifted to. People enter my life who weren't there before to aid me on the um, or not just aid me, really just to keep reflecting what I am. And I've noticed, also noticed that if I go back to old states, people from the past in those old states will come into my life again. And I'll bump into them at places. And um, so it really is all you. And you should have a lot of um, safety in that. Because there's no one else, there's no one you're doubting but yourself and there's no one else you're going to trust but yourself. So... And when you realize that, like, there's nothing to do other than to assume in the I am, because that's all that's expressing, um, I think you'll feel it, a large amount of relief because a common problem is like, well, what do I do after? Neville says, do nothing. The whole point is to admit you can't do anything. The outer man can't do it. That's why we're imagining. We allow the outer man to just, I guess, be limited. <laughs> The outer man wants to expand himself. Really, it's the inner you that wants to expand themselves in imagination. Um, But you can't bring your reasoning with you because it just creates walls and barriers. And I think that it's important to, if you have a problem with assuming in the I am because you're worried about what others will think of you or what will happen next or what you're going to do next or if you're really allowed to do it or any of those things, you have to start living in imagination because that's where you're safe. In imagination, nobody, it doesn't matter what anyone thinks in imagination or what they say because they're just responding to you. You don't have to fear anyone. It doesn't matter what anyone's going to do because they can't do anything without your permission. Um, and don't you don't assume you are something so that hopefully somebody can reflect that. No, you you assume you are it and you make them see you that way. You make everyone in your mind see you the way you want to be seen. It doesn't matter who they are. They must conform to your orders. Um, so you don't need to be afraid of anything. You need to learn to accept the love that comes 
from you in imagination. Not be afraid of it. Um, and some of the greatest news I've heard was that, on the beginning of this journey, was that I was the dreamer of my nightmares. I accepted that I created everything that was a nightmare in my life. And when I was able to accept that, I didn't reason my way into it. I didn't say, well, is it really? How could I be if I was a child? I don't, I don't, I just accept it. And from there, I was able to accept many other things for myself. Because if I'm the cause of my nightmare, I'm the cause of, you know, my wonderful dreams. And it doesn't matter what, it doesn't matter what the world says, it's just responding. The world must respond to my I am. It does not matter what on earth you assume. It must respond. And it won't shock you because you're so used to assuming in the I am. You know, the I am requires you to abandon your reasoning, yes, but you'll get used to that if you practice this. And the way you practice this, as we'll go back to the I am brilliant, you assume I am brilliant, not as something you're going to be, not as something you have to physically do anything for. You don't do anything. You free the inner, you make the inner man brilliant. You make the inner man feel brilliant. It's the inner man who needs to be exalted. That's the one who's desiring. That's the one who's afraid. That's the one who is um, in bondage. That's the one who wants to be X, Y, and Z. So you And all things already are. So what you need to do is find the dream that already is the way you want it to be. And you feel in the present moment that that is real now. And you abandon all reason. And what you'll find is that the greatest thing you can do in imagination is to abandon reason and you'll find that everything already is. And since everything already is, there's nothing you need to do but assume. And if you can see that you're the same voice that was in, kept you in bondage, the same one that frees you, the same I am that was the problem is now the solution, you know, the same one that creates the, you know, you're the dreamer of the nightmare, then you can be free in your own mind if you assume you're the cause of it all. And fall asleep feeling that you found the cause of life. Just assume it. Don't reason with it. And what you'll find is non, not reasoning your way into things is, or as Neville says, going mad, is a way to make a dream into a reality. It's being bold enough and daring to assume that you are, even though your reason denies it, even though all your senses deny it, you assume you are, regardless not as something you're going to be tomorrow, but as something you are now. That's how I meditate. That's what I do. And what I've found is that it works. It really does work. If you know the whole thing's responding to you, you don't need to be afraid. We must learn to free ourselves from the senses. And by the self, I mean the inner man. We must free the inner man from the senses. And I mentioned in my last video, um, I was speaking about how you must remove reason. And reason to me is like just questions and all these concerns it comes from fear. Anything that stops you from um, feeling the wish fulfilled within you, meaning that you feel the wish that you desire as a present fact now, not as something you will get, but something you are now. And um, I think... One thing I mentioned, but I didn't go too deep on it, which was you must remove um, the idea of action from the mind. It's a part of the reasoning, because reasoning will tell you this. They'll, they'll tell you, okay, you're imagining your desire, but what are you going to do after you imagine? What are you going to, where are you going to go? And what actions are you going to take? And, and um, I wrote this, that I, I guess I wrote this out, so I'm just going to read this to you. The removal of action from the mind is necessary to feel the wish fulfilled. If you still feel that you must do something to bring your desire to pass, then you are still bounded by your senses. States come from within and express themselves without. Do not give credit to a false cause of action. There is only one cause, one power, and that is imagination. The reason 
you still may be bound by the senses is because you feel that experiences you went through were the result of physical action taking place. This blinds you from seeing the world of states. In the world of states, you move through it with felt assumption. You move from one state to another. Who's moving? I am. So you are the being that enters into and exits out of states when you please. With this information, apply it by admitting impotence. Admit to oneself that they cannot do anything for the actions they take come from imagination. Admit that the outer man of the senses is not capable doing anything other than taking orders from imagination. Admit that all one can do is to assume that they are what they want to be as a present fact, and that is sufficient. Admit there is only one cause, and that is imagination. Rid yourself from the false cause of action. All actions have a cause, and the cause started from an idea that was accepted in imagination. Now with these admissions, you imagine without the nagging thought of, what am I going to do after I stop imagining my desire? What actions will I have to take to get this? This removal of resistance will allow you to embrace your desire as a present fact. All actions are predetermined by the state. So leave the predetermined world of actions and start living as the being who is the selector of states. To start living as this being, you must remove the attachment to behaviors. For this being is not a state, it is stateless. And if you attach yourself to behaviors, then you attach yourself to states, for they are one. You are not the behaviors, for you are not the state. You are attached to the behaviors because you are convinced on some level that there is causal power in behaviors. Always remember there is one cause, one power, and lose attachment to all other second causes, for they are false and will fail you. And um, speaking of that, I just, while I was reading this, I had a thought. I was um, watching... Um, I was on YouTube the other day and I saw a, a preacher telling people to um, give them money. They said, if you, you know, give me a thousand dollars, I will, um, or God, God's going to bless you. They said that if you sow this seed right now, you know how they do it on TV, um, God's going to bless you if you send this person money. And, um, he said, this is the way. He goes, this is the way to financial freedom is if you sow this seed now. But there's only one seed, and that's I am. There's only one way. Don't be convinced and think that in other causes. Because the moment you start thinking in second cause, you're thinking a third cause and a fourth cause. And the next thing you know, all you say is coincidence because you can't explain anything anymore because you have all these causes. It's the food. It's my body. It's... Um, my present environment, it's this person, it's that person. Um, we're all trying to find the cause and we blame. But we must grant the cause to imagination entirely. And I just thought it was interesting how he, he even said, sow the seed um, and this is the way. He said, this is the way to it. There's only one way. It's imagination. It's I am. I am the way. There's only one way. What does that mean? Well, one way to anything in the world. If I want something, I must become the person who has it. So I assume that I am that person. That's the way to it. Not as something I'm going to be. You know, for a long time when I would imagine, I would say the words, I am whatever I want to be. But... If I'm honest with myself, deep down I felt, I hope I can be. I didn't really assume in the I am. But once I started to assume in the I am, which is having to give up everything I can do, everything, all my reasoning, all my questioning, I had to give it all up and just be it in the mind. Um, you, sh you can feel safe to be things in the mind too because it's your mind. And once I saw that, I was able to actually feel myself to be what I want now. And once I removed the idea of action from the mind, it became increasingly easier to um, trust my imagination entirely. That it, I trust that it's the one cause. And um, I think the, the delusion in second causes, Neville says that's the chief delusion in man's life is second causes. 
And I agree with him. It's the biggest delusion of all. It's the delusion that causes fear. It causes everything you can think of. Jealousy, greed, everything that we don't like is caused by second causes. Or, yeah, it's the belief of second causes. It's a delusion. There's only one cause here, and that's imagination. And when you can believe that, when you can assume that to be the case, you will feel immense relief. You actually are, you actually don't want to believe in any more second causes. You want to rid yourself from those. And you can. So, I, um, I think that when, when people imagine, especially when I did, what you want, you do have the thoughts of what am I going to do? What am I going to do? And I've realized that whenever there's attachment to anything in the mind, it's because on some level you think there's a causal power there or like it's out of your control in the mind. You're on some level believing in it as, you're believing in it as if it has power. Um, and I think action is a big one. What I've learned is that my actions completely change the moment I change my state. I even speak differently. I even have different thoughts. So I know I'm, I am a being who's in states, but I always remember I'm the being. You have to remember you're the being. You're not the state itself. And if you can assume in the I am, which is I am this now, regardless of what the world says and regardless of what's happening in the world, and you can do that at will, then you have found a heaven within you. If you can assume that you are whatever you want to be at will, meaning um, you don't question it anymore. You don't doubt anymore. You hear imagination say you are, and you trust entirely imagination. And I think the best way, or one of the best ways I have found on how to trust imagination is by believing that it's the one cause. And if you can believe it's the one cause, then I think you can trust in it. And I have looked back at my life and I've seen where my mind has created things. Even as a teenager, I can look back and see myself creating things. And I had a very active imagination as a child. And I could see myself creating. You know, I, I didn't really think much of it at the time, but when I look back now, I can see that my imagination did cause things. And there are things that we don't look at in our lives so that we don't really see us being the cause of it in our worlds. But there's only one cause here. So knowing that there's only one cause and knowing that all it is and everything that comes from it, from the senses, everything that came from imagination, then I can give up the senses. I can let go of what, what someone said yesterday, let go of what I'm going to do tomorrow or what I'm going to do after I imagine. I let go of it all. And I just assume that I am it now. And I know that if I assume that I am it, I must express it. It will, it will naturally happen. I, I will feel different. I will um, walk different and think different. And I respond and react differently to things. Because if you're in a new state, you would. And you persist doing that until you feel like it's the way you want it to be in your world. You persist in bringing it to the I am. And remember, uh, I repeat this over and over because it's so important to me, is that when you imagine and you say, I am X, pay attention to how you feel and see if you are actually feeling, I hope I will be. And if you're feeling, I hope I will be, then you're not understanding who you are in imagination. If you're still hoping to be something, then you're not really living in imagination because in imagination, you already are it. You're still bound by your senses. And you're bound by your senses because you think there's some causal power there. So remove that, I, that notion that there's a second cause. So I hope that helps. So I first want to speak about how um, there are no punishments in imagination. There are only fulfillments of states. If, if you feel you are being punished, you are fulfilling some state within you. You might feel guilty, and that's why you're feeling, that's why you're being punished in your mind. People, people in your mind 
are only messengers revealing to you who you are. They're only telling you who you are in your mind. The people in your mind, those imaginary people who seem to be fake, but they, they, are, they reveal to you who you are. They treat you the way you want to be treated in the mind. They only obey orders. And um, so you don't need to fear anybody. And if you feel that you are having reoccurring thoughts, it's because it's stemming from a certain state that you've taken. Now, a state is a belief towards the self about yourself. Like I said, if you feel guilty, you will conjure up thoughts of punishments. If you feel ashamed, you will thought think about all your past mistakes. These thoughts are not random, and they have a nature to them. And the nature is correlated with the state, with the nature of the state. But the state is... Um, is not the cause either. It's actually the I am before that state is the cause. It's you who's the cause. States lead to thoughts and thoughts lead to actions and actions lead to scenarios. So you don't, and I think what happens is that we tend to try to control scenarios, which then once we realize we can't, we try to control people, you can't. And then you try to control your, um, your actions and you realize that there's such a war between you with your actions and your thoughts and then you can't do that. And then you try to go towards the thoughts because it's too hard with the actions. And then you find that you can't control your thoughts either. They're, they're just, they're too crazy. And then you try to, then you find out that the thoughts are stemming from a state. And the state, um, is still not the cause though. We're not, we haven't, we found a correlation between your thoughts and your, and your state, but it's not causation. We need to find causation. If you take a step back even further, you'll find it's the labelless, stateless imagination that's not a state. And the I am is um, what I call, I call the I am the man in imagination, the one who lives in imagination. That's who I think we truly are. That's what I believe. I, that's really what I know. But um, I want to explain how I've been asked the question, was like, how do, you, do I imagine and when I buy, when I say imagine, I don't mean visualize. I mean, I just, I mean, like, how do I create things in my mind? I guess you want to call it. Really, really, we're just discovering what's already there in your mind. You're not creating anything. But um, I'll just do a step by step of what I do, and I'll leave this in the um, in the description. But I remember that my only goal is to become the one I want to be in imagination only. So I think about what I want to be, anything. Then I assume I am in imagination. And in imagination, I can be all things. So I assume it in imagination. I become it inside of imagination. Okay? And when I say the words I am, I'm not speaking about this outer body, but the inner man. The inner man to me is I am. And I know that all I must change is I am to change my life. So you can think of it, what he is, the man inside I am. I must accept that I am that inner man, experiencing in present tense what I desire. So I want to give an example. Is that suppose I want to go to Las Vegas, but I am in New York. Okay, I'm in New York. I'm in my apartment, and I, um, not really, but let's just you know, for the sake of example, I'm there, and I want to go to, um, to Las Vegas, but um, I don't have a plane ticket, but I want to go there. So I would imagine myself in Las Vegas at the MGM Grand Lobby. That's where I would, I would just put myself there. This is an example. And so while I'm looking around at the lobby, I see people walking around and, I'm, and I see you know, the line, I see the, the floor and I see everything that would normally be there, a check-in or whatever it is. And I assume that the inner man that is in Las Vegas is the real me. That's I am. So I assume that I am in Las Vegas. I say that. I am in Las Vegas. I say it as if I'm speaking because I am. If I am that inner man, then I really am in Las Vegas. I assume that I am that inner man that's experiencing my desire, which is to be in Las Vegas. I, I, if I identify myself with the inner man, then yes, it is a present fact that I am in Las Vegas. To deny this is to be delusional. And I'm looking at the lobby and I see people around and I see them walking and of course I am there. Now you can take this example and you can multiply this um, amongst other desires that if you want to be happily married, you could see the ring and you could feel 
that you're proud to be married, proud to be with that partner. And if you are proud and you identify yourself with that inner man, then you are proud. You are in a marriage. You are happily married. It's what you are. You imagine yourself to be the inner man. You assume that you stop allowing the world to shape I am. And you let the inner man become I am. That's who you really are. You shift the feeling of I am from outward and you shift it to inward. That's what you're doing. You stop identifying yourself with the outer man, the temporal man, and you identify yourself with the divine man, the eternal man who can hear and see and do and be anything they want in imagination. And it's not something that, you know, you're going to be. You like you already are it. So when I imagine myself in Las Vegas, I'm not questioning, well, what if it doesn't work? How do I know I'm there? Um what if um well, to me, it's like, well, if I am the inner man, then I am there. There is no how. I already am there. If I, there's no when because I already am here. And there's no what if it doesn't work because it's already worked for the I am within me. I already am in Las Vegas. I'm not wondering if my manifestation will work because I, I don't identify myself with the outer man. I'm the inner man. And the inner man is experiencing himself in Las Vegas. So there's no, there are no questions in I am. They're all answered. There's no like, well, am I really fulfilled? It's not really, that's not the, that's not really a question. You're experiencing fulfillment. And when you can identify yourself with the I am, you can feel entirely safe and free in your mind because that's the creator. You're the creator in this entire world. People are only messengers. You don't have to feel like anything's going to be ruined unless you allow it to be ruined. If you identify yourself with the inner man and you can do it. Um, it's just an assumption away. You just move that I am to the inner self, which is the feeling of you know experiencing it. There's no questioning. Neville gave the example. He said, um, uh, suppose I'm in New York and I want to be in San Francisco. He said that, he goes, physically, I'm not there, but I would imagine myself in San Francisco. I was like, I'm there, not, no, no, I'm not there, but in imagination, I'm there. And he says, but imagination is my real self. And where he is, I, the outer self, will go. You can have anything you want in imagination. The question is, I know you can imagine anything, but can you believe it? That's the question. Can you believe it? You can, you, that's the only price to pay uh, amongst anything in imagination. You can conjure up any sentence, anything you want to hear. The question is, do you believe it? You need to free I am from the senses and the reason from these bondages. You need to free the I am. You save that I am from its own bondage and you save it by associating it, associating it with the inner man who is free in imagination. And I, that's how I imagine. That's how I think about this. And it works wonders if you really allow yourself to feel that you are the inner man experiencing it, no matter what it is, no matter what the world says, you stop allowing that to dictate your I am, you can feel entirely free. And that's the way, the way to what? To anything I want. It's the way to Las Vegas. It's the way to um, hearing this compliment. It's the way to experiencing that experience. It's the way. It's not, I don't have to go to anybody outside of me. I just need to appropriate it and assume that I am the one experiencing that in imagination. Assume that I am the man in imagination. Um, I can also speak more about this. Of course I can, but um, I'm going to leave that for now. I think that's enough to contemplate on. So I want to speak about something that might sound a bit different, but it's just the way I think about this. What I've found over time of testing and um, just exploring in my imagination I have found that it might not be the best thing to think in terms of manifesting. So when I imagine, I actually don't think about like I'm going to man, I'm doing this to manifest something. Um, I think that that takes away from the only thing that should matter, which is what Neville called the feeling of the wish fulfilled. And I think that when you try to manifest stuff, you're still so focused on the external world. And the whole point is to leave it alone, as Neville says, and change the conceptions of yourself. And conceptions are within us. So we just change who we are within imagination. And I found that when you remove the weight of trying to manifest and you make the goal 
of your imaginal act to be just to simply experience it because you are what you experience, then I think a huge weight can be lifted off of you. Um, much resistance will leave you because I actually don't think in that way. I don't think about manifesting things. I just think about experiencing. I think about, um, I don't love the word becoming, but it, in some sense, I'm becoming who I want to be in imagination. But the reason why I don't like the word becoming is because you already are that in imagination. Now, we must, uh, you know, be vulnerable enough to admit, as if I'm speaking from the outer man's perspective, this limited body, that I can't do it. The outer man can't do it. The outer man must surrender himself to the inner man. It's just an idea that you're creating in your mind that you're limited and, and you must admit that you're not capable. You must be vulnerable enough to admit that you can't devise the means and you don't know the when or the how. If you admit these things and surrender yourself, that you don't really know anything, the outer man doesn't. Um, if you surrender yourself to the inner man, then the inner man already is expressing what you want in imagination. But I, I this in this body, I don't know how to do it. I'm not sure how to devise the means. I admit that. I surrender myself and I just experience what the inner man's experiencing. And I make that my goal. So I don't try to manifest stuff. I think that trying to manifest is in its own way a blockage. Um, what I try to do is the moment I close my eyes, the external world leaves me. That's how I think of it. That none, none of it is true. It was created by the imagination. In some sense, we do live in a world of imagination. Or I say an imaginary world. Because the facts that were created today were thought of yesterday. And they could change tomorrow. But it's difficult to feel the wish fulfilled when you're still focusing on trying to manifest. And the reason for that is because the wish that is fulfilled is happening within you. And you can't fully be immersed within if you're still focused on the external. The best way I can explain is that I experience what the inner man's experiencing. I take upon his experience and I become him. And that's my goal. Not necessarily to manifest, but to be to be the inner man who's experiencing it. That's the goal for me. Because I found that all I would be doing if I did have my desire fulfilled would be I would just be experiencing it. I would just experience the fulfillment. So Neville calls it feeling the wish fulfilled. I just say experience the wish fulfilled. Experience your desire being fulfilled. Experience what the inner man's experiencing. And make that the goal. And you'll feel far less uh, less resistance. And you're you're creating the resistance anyways. You can also look at it that way. When you have resistance, it's because you are still identifying with the external. But I ident you have to identify with the one within who already is experiencing it. As, uh, as it was once said that the outer man will say it's impossible, but the inner man says, isn't it wonderful? Because he already is experiencing the fulfillment. And that's a really good way of looking at it. I mean, that's how I look at it. I find that viewing it that way, that I'm the stateless being is the um, much more relieving and natural way of assuming that you are what you want to be. Because if you know that you're not the assumption itself, but the assumer, then I think your confidence goes up and you stop identifying with states and you stop identifying with the, its behaviors. And you see that that's all stemming from a belief about yourself. So you leave the world alone and you go within and you change who you are inside yourself. And you can put a frame of reference in front of you and have someone reply to you telling you that you are now this person. Not They're not telling you to become it. You already are it. They're just reflecting you. So you don't, you, you can't take anything from people inside your imagination because there's nothing for them to give. It's only you in the end. So people respond to you in imagination. The moment you start to feel respectful, people in imagination will start to treat you respectfully. You start to expect that. An expectation is inside. You expect to think the best thoughts. Feel the feeling of expectancy, but in imagination, feel it. Expect to think highly of yourself. And um, I think it's important, as I said, that the outer man must be vulnerable. And that you must be vulnerable enough to admit that you can't do it. That you don't have the thing you want. And that's why you need to assume you are the inner man who has it. So you... You don't, you, you, your goal is to become the inner man, not necessarily to, um, 
go after material objects in the mind. So you don't focus on, as Neville says, the greatest pitfall is focusing on items and not the consciousness of being it. And the consciousness, you can just think of the inner man who has it. You must become that inner man who's already experiencing it. And I think that is the way I have found freedom, that the really, the truly, the way is I am. Well, what am I? You know, in, in imagination, who am I claiming to be? How am I being treated? I'm, I must be vulnerable enough to admit that maybe I don't see myself as highly as I want to see, or maybe I don't feel about, you know, highly of myself. I don't feel the way I want to feel about myself in imagination. But then be bold enough to assume a new state in imagination. As Neville says, dare to assume. And he says this, and I wanted, I wanted to share this in the last video, but I didn't, is that should you tomorrow or in the interval between now, this night, and you do it and the fulfillment of it, should one little doubt enter your mind, do this. So he says, if you have a doubt after you feel the wish fulfilled, do this. He says, just remember, but I experienced it. I experienced ownership. So I don't care if at this very moment something denies it. I experienced it. So he equates experience with wish fulfilled. And that's where I changed my mind. Um, on, I wrote a series about this, is that I changed my mind on manifest. And I actually don't think in those terms. It's all about experience for me. Is that I'm, I am what I am because I'm experiencing my reflection. So let me experience a new reflection within me. Not so that I can become it, but that I already am it in imagination. So I make the outer man less and less and I make the inner man more and more. So that when I start to say the word I... I'm speaking as the inner man who all things are possible to. I start to associate myself and identify with him within. Um, that's about all I had to say, but I hope that helps to, to remove the pressure from trying to manifest and shift it to experience or to being or to, as Neville says, feel the wish fulfilled. Make that the goal. That's what's important. And that requires a complete abandonment of your external world and complete fusion with your inner self. And then once you realize how wonderful that feels, you start to do it more and more, and then you get used to, I guess you could say, living in imagination. Yeah, so I hope that helps. Hope that it relieves the uh, the stress and the worry on, on the mind that the goal is to experience while you imagine, not to manifest, because the world's expressing imagination anyways. So I don't know if you have to, I don't think you have to worry about express, expression. It's more, are you, it's more about, are you who you want to be within? Are you actually the person you want to be? Are you actually feeling that you are who you want to be? Are you feeling that you're proud of yourself? Are you feeling ownership of the state that you want, as Neville says? Are, and you, you know you have ownership by your experience of being it in imagination. Yeah, so hope that helps. So I wanted to take a break from this series. And I wanted to speak about a few quotes that I find very important. And one of them is by Henry Thoreau. And he says that it's not what you're looking at that matters. It's what you see. And William Blake said it a bit differently. He said, I don't see with my eyes. I see through them. And throughout your day, I, I would just recommend you repeat that phrase to yourself. That it's not what I'm looking at physically that matters. It's what I see, and just kind of pay attention to what is being said there. And I think you'll find what I found is that what you're actually seeing is not the physical ob object, you're seeing your own conception of yourself. And a perfect example is if I were, and no two people experience the same experience, um, the same way, nobody, nobody reacts to it the same way. We can watch a movie and see entirely different movies. I may like it, you may dislike it. Um, we can bring, I can bring a hundred people before me and put a hundred dollar bill in front of them and they all perceive it differently. They all perceive this physical object differently. Some people see it as a little bit of money. Some people see it as a lot. Some people see it as, you know, could help with their rent or, you know, could help with food. Some people see it as nothing. Um, it just depends. Some people are against money. I don't know. You know, everyone has a different view. But what they're really seeing is not the physical dollar. They're they're seeing themselves. They're seeing their own conception, and their perception of reality is based on the conception they have. They hold of themselves. It's important that I say the of themselves because it's not of another. You only see yourself. 
That's why Neville says everyone's a messenger. But they're not in a messenger in the sense that when someone comes and talks to you, they are, um, they are, those words are literally your words from their mouth. It's more that the way you interact with them in relation to them is based upon your conception. If you feel inferior to one and not to another, it's because you think on some level that they're superior and that's how you perceive yourself with them. But don't change them. They're just a messenger. If you pay attention to your, to how you see things, it's all a messenger revealing to you your own conception. And a, a conception I'm saying is the same thing as a state. It's a state of mind. It's a way of thinking about reality. Um, or about yourself. I'm sorry, about yourself. And, you know, a question that's often asked is, how do I know I changed my conception? Or how do I know I changed my, my state? Well, if you changed, to know if you successfully changed your state or your conception, you would see reality differently, wouldn't you? If you changed your conception, you would see that $100 bill differently. Because it's not what you're looking at physically that matters, it's what you see. See through the eye and see what you want to see. So you change, you can change your state the moment you, you're successful is, um, our perfect way of saying is, as Neville said, that when you go to prayer, and you go deep into prayer and you uh, feel the wish fulfilled and you come out of prayer and you're still seeing the world the same way, then you have not successfully changed your state. Because if you did change your state, you would change your perception. If you go to feel yourself to be, uh, if you go to feel highly of yourself and then you don't see yourself as highly when you get out of meditation, then you haven't successfully changed yourself. Um, but you're, but what you're really looking at is yourself. When you interact with others, you're really just interacting with yourself. And by self, I just mean your own conceptions that you've taken. They're not necessarily true to you. They're just things you're holding on to. I think there's a quote I read is like, hold on or be dragged if you take upon a state you don't like. I think it's a proverb. You can hold on to this horrible, state or you can be dragged by it but let it go um or let go or be dragged i think that's what it was called and i find that to be you know quite relevant here is that if we're in an undesirable state it's we have to let it go because it's just a state of mind a state of mind is just a perception you have of life um children do this all the time they they can see they don't care what they're looking at <laughs> They could have plastic bread and they can just start playing with it like it's real bread and eat it like it's real bread as, and just because they're in their imaginations. But it's the same for us, even as adults, is that it's really not what we're looking at that matters. It's what we see. And I add on to that and I say, and what we see is ourselves. So if we wish to change how we see reality, leave it alone. Leave reality exactly the way it is. Leave that $100 bill just as it is, as a $100 bill, and change how you see it. Go to go to the mirror and look at your body and change how you see your body. It's not what you're looking at physically that matters. It's how you see it. Internally, if you will. The, with the internal eyes. You see through your eyes and you see what you want to see. So, and that's how you free yourself. You free yourself by changing how you see reality. How you see yourself, which is yourself. And that will cause you to either feel good about yourself or feel bad about yourself. How you, your interactions will either be good or bad based upon how you see yourself. Because you're only reacting to yourself. So if you want to be successful in changing your conception, try it just in imagination. If I was this person, how would I see the world? How would I perceive things? How would others perceive me? Let's say I am that right now then bring before me something I'm familiar with and see if I can see it differently, like a $100 bill or a person that I'm with. My inter my, my, if I change my relation with them or with it, then I've changed myself. And that's all I need to do. And I persist in that new perception or new, a new conception of myself. And I keep seeing the world that way. Regardless of appearances, I see through my eyes, not with them. If you see with your eyes, you're seeing with you're seeing the senses, the limiting senses, and your world will always remain the way it is. But if you wish to change the world, leave the hundred dollar bill there, leave everything alone, leave the people alone, 
and change yourself, how you see yourself. Bring frame of references to your mind and have people congratulate you on your new change. Believe in those words that you're hearing and feel that you've changed and you see the world differently. That you're not the same person that went into prayer who's coming out of it. You're a different person now. And the way you change your perception is you feel that you are it now. Not tomorrow, not a month from now, not a year from now. Or, you know, you don't feel that, you don't go to the past. You feel that you are it now. The moment you do that, and the moment you feel you are it now, your perception will change. You will feel different, you will react different, you will view the world entirely differently. And that's what you must do. You must persist in feeling it now until your perception changes upon that person or upon another bill or upon that, you know, you and I can look at the news and see entirely different things and feel entirely different things. So um, I don't try to control the world. I try to change how I see the world, which is just meaning I change how to see myself. Regardless of what's happening, I see myself safe. I see myself the way I want to see myself. As a present tense fact, not as something I'm going to be. It's very important. So throughout your day, just repeat these the words. It's not what I'm looking at. And really say that to yourself. It's not what I'm looking at that matters. It's what I see. Can I see this object in a more beautiful way? Can I, if I don't like what I'm seeing, can I see through my eyes and visualize something new? Or can I hear a new conversation? that implies something about me. It's not about the conversation. What does it imply about me? It's not about the scene that I'm looping. It's what it implies about me. It all comes down to me in my mind. And the moment you start to change your uh, conceptions of yourself in the now, you'll free yourself and associate yourself with the one who is freeing. You know, there are many times where we'll sabotage and put ourselves in bondage and we associate ourselves with that type of uh, way of thinking and being that I'm the one who puts myself in bondage, but you're also the one who frees yourself too. And you can test that the moment you feel yourself to be in a new state now. You are the one, and the moment you start to feel free and your perception changes, you are the one doing that to yourself. There's no one else. No one else can do that to you because it's internal. Nobody can come into your mind and start moving things around. Only you can. No one can come, if you will, and work on your own vessel. It's your own vessel. You have to work on the clay that you have. It's your own imagination and you reshape it the way you want it to be. And the way you reshape your imagination, you reshape how you see yourself. And just test it. Look at yourself in the mirror and start to see yourself differently. Don't worry about the physical body or the physical form or this shadow. Forget the shadow. Um, the shadow is only going to mimic you and it only mimics what you see. So change how you see yourself. You're looking at, we're looking at all at the same body, but we see it differently. We all can look at our bodies a certain way with disgust or we can with admiration. It's up to us how we see it. It doesn't matter what it physically looks like. None of it matters. It's just a shadow. So I hope that seeing that if you change your state, you would change your perception on reality and you change your state by feeling you are it now. That's um, kind of the point is what I'm trying to make is that physically leave it alone, but change how you see it meaning you change how you see yourself now. And repeat that phrase that I see not with my eyes, but through them. And it's not what I'm looking at that matters. It's what I see. And what I see is myself. So I want to speak about a story that Neville gave in a lecture I was reading that I think would help some people. And it was a story about how he wanted his son back. His son wasn't living with him. He was with his mother, but Neville wanted to be with his son. Now, the problem was that he tried everything he could to get his son back physically, but nothing worked. And then she spoiled Neville's name and the family and his family's name. She basically told the son that Neville doesn't want him, that basically Neville's a bad person and the family's bad and the son stayed away. But then Neville decided to imagine that his son was next to him and his hand was touching the back of his head and he felt his son's presence in imagination. And then the boy, I guess, had a birthday where he turned 12 and the, his 
wife called him and said, hey, your son's 12. He's now a man. I can't, I don't have room for two men. You're going to have to take him in. So Neville took him in. But the one thing I found really important about that, I mean, this is a classic story where he just, you know, imagined something and it worked. But he ignored, he said that, you know, she poisoned my name, but I just ignored all of that. I didn't care what she said. And that was really, that really impacted me in a lot of ways because I felt that's even more freedom to ignore the facts of the world. That even with a bad name, you still, even with someone creating a bad name about you, you still can assume it doesn't matter what the world tries to do. Because the name is I am. It's not I was. It's not they say I am. It's whatever you say you are. And it's what you claim to be about yourself in imagination. And, and then, he, you know, this lady asked him, she asked him, you know, I don't quite understand how this works. Um, I'm new to the teaching. And he said there, okay, so when you say the words, I am, know that that's God and all things are possible to God. Don't think of something outside of yourself. When you say the names, I am, you never do. So don't think of God outside of yourself the creator of the cause. And then he said that when you go to assume that you are, to get confirmation that you are, you look mentally into your world and you see people reflecting what you've assumed about yourself. He says, don't tell them physically anything. Don't tell your friends physically. Don't tell anyone physically anything. You just assume it in an imagination. And if you need confirmation about who you are, see it. You can think of the moment you see yourself expressing what you want in imagination. It's the imagination or God showing you that you already are. He's asking you to believe in him. Believe in that. And regardless of what the rumors are. And he said that God's name is I am. It's not I was. It's not I will be. It's not I might be, if you're thinking out of fear. I might, you know, do something wrong. I might end up in a bad state. It's not um, I want, I want this, I want this, I want this. You know, someone who's deeply in desire. How are you shaping your I? Are you shaping it with am or are you shaping it with I was? You're always, you know, shaping it by something. I think people with difficult pasts can, we can tend to shape ourselves with I, I was, like I was a victim, I was abused, I was, and but we still feel those as almost I am statements. And you aren't I was, you aren't I will be, you are I am, that's what it expresses. You want to bring everything to I am, which is to bring it to God. So knowing that, that you're not, you're not your past and you're not your future, you're not even the state you're in, then you aren't your feelings and you aren't your thoughts. You don't have to associate yourself with these things. You aren't your feelings. They're things that we use. We meaning the, when I say we, I don't mean the body. I mean, we as in the I inside man. The one who can shape himself to I was, to the one who shapes himself to I will be, but the one who also shapes himself to I am. The I is the person I'm talking to right now. The inner you. You have the power to shape and remold your inner world. You have the power to change yourself, regardless of the facts. Actually, the inner man doesn't care about the facts. It just um, assumes it anyways. So the moment you start to say the words, I was, that's not you. The moment you say, I will be, that's not you. You are, I am, or I might be, that's not you. If you can start associating yourself with I am and associate God with I am, um, and you stop associating yourself with your feelings and your thoughts or your states, then you should feel free because you won't feel unworthy of, they're just thoughts and feelings. You're allowed to have all of them you want. You're the one who dictates. You're the one who controls how much feeling you want, how much thought you want, or what thought you want, what feeling you want. If you can allow yourself that control, then you become very conscious inside yourself and you choose the feelings you you would like to have because they're just feelings they're nothing is off limits they're they're yours to use and um 
I just found this important to share that one must not think of them as their past or their future, but as now. And they get to shape that now. Regardless of if someone poisoned your name or regardless of anything in the world. Ignore the facts of life and assume that you are wanted or loved or respected. Now. I am is not something in the future. It's now. And the moment you accept that, that you are not now, that's when um, the euphoria comes. That's when you feel that you actually feel the wish fulfilled. It's the acceptance of that you are that now. Once you accept that, that's why Neville says he's not speaking about emotion. He's speaking about the feeling of the wish fulfilled is the acceptance of the fact that the wish has been granted. So when you fully accept that you are the thing you want to be and you confirm it mentally and you believe in that mentally, well, then you've become it. And in a short while, someone's going to call you and let you know. It happens time and time again. People will, And if people don't in your world, somebody will come into your world and tell you to reflect it to you. But if you want to see your, yourself, if you want to see a totally different world, you must see yourself entirely different. You must allow yourself to, to, to be able to be forgiven enough to see yourself in a whole new light. And you're allowed to do so because no thought or feeling is unavailable to you. Everything within you can be taken because it's yours. And I'm speaking to the inner man, not to this, the outer body. The inner man, everything is yours within. So choose things that you love because you can. You get to do anything you want. You get to feel what you want. So sorry I haven't posted in a while. I haven't, I haven't been... Um, <clears throat> My throat hasn't been feeling the best, and I didn't want to continuously clear my throat while I'm talking. But, yeah, I hope that helps. So I speak a lot about how one should stop reasoning with their desires. But I think there's another way of saying it that can make more sense. Um, we could use the word doubt. I could use the word doubt as well. Don't doubt your desires. But I think another one is that to not condition your desires. I think conditioning is something that is very common. And Neville said that too. He said one of his lectures that, you know, you want it, but you condition it. You condition it with all these things and that's why you can never have it. And what what is a condition? A condition to me is you either, you, you sway from the present moment. A condition is you taking your desire and then bringing the future to it. Or you take your desire and you sabotage it with the past. You don't remain present with it because present to remain present with your desire is to be one with it. And to be one with it means to, for it to be fulfilled. You can't desire if you can't, there's no desire in I am. So if you're saying I am whatever and you're still desiring, then you're not it yet because you're still desiring. Neville says that if you're desiring to stop it right now and assume the feeling of the wish fulfilled. So um, if one could see that there are no conditions in the mind, there's nothing you have to meet prior to imagining something or to feeling what you want. Well, if that's the case, then I shouldn't live in desire and imagination. There's no need to walk around in my mind desiring things because it's my mind and I can have what I want in it. I can hear what I want in it. I can feel what I want in it. I can have as much peace as I want. And the moment you start to free yourself, that you realize that in this world of imagination, you truly are the cause of your own suffering in it. If you can accept that, I think you're well on your way to freeing yourself. Because you're, once you see that your suffering is a conscious choice inside the imagination, then you're going to choose consciously what you want. But I think you can only get there unless you accept and acknowledge the fact that you are the cause of everything within you. Through that acceptance you can then begin to more in an effortless way accept good things that you want for yourself. And I mean what you want, not what you think you should want. There's a big difference between imagining because you think other people want this for you and imagining what you want. So you must, if you don't know what you want, you must, like I didn't, you must spend some time figuring out what it is you want. Could be something small, you might be surprised. Maybe you don't want what everyone else does which is fine, as long as um, just do everything in love in the mind, at least try to do it all in love. 
and to do things in love is to not be in fear. So to add conditions, I think that it's us moving. What I mean by that is us moving towards the future and the, and the desire. We go to assume that, Neville says, stop desire and assume that you have it. So I must stop desiring. That's the first and foremost. I must leave the world alone and stop desiring inside my mind. But in order for me to stop desiring, I must see that my wish is granted. So, but I cannot really have it granted if I start to bring the future towards it. If I start to, well, what if this happens? What if that, well, how would the means happen? Well, how would it uh, come into, uh, into the world? I don't know. <laughs> I'm going to be honest with you. I don't know how things come here. I don't know the way it works. It does work. I just don't know how, I don't know when it happens. I don't know. There's a definitely a, a difference between myself, the assumer, and the mechanism that is at play here. It seems like it will, it knows the means and I don't. It seems that it is in control in a way that I'm not, in some sense. And I mean me, the outer me. So I'm called to just assume, not to devise the means. I'm called, I'm called to assume, not to condition. And an example of that would be me either going and saying, well, what if this happens? What if that happens? Let me either let me change the desire or let me not have it at all. That's conditioning. I'm going to the future. Or I go to the past and use the past to sabotage the desire in that way. Or I say I can never be that because of my past. Or I look at my limiting present. I say my present's the reason why I can't be it. Well, if I do all of that, then... I'm conditioning. I'm not called to condition. I'm called to be present with my thought. Whatever thought it is. And if you can see that most of the anxiety stems from the present, or sorry, from the past and the future, the removal of these um, will allow you to be more present with the desire of it being fulfilled. And to really be present, one must remove the external world completely from the mind. So when you imagine, you imagine just as though there is no external world. To fully immerse yourself in the experience of imagination, to let it really captivate you, you must remove the idea of an external world. You must really make imagination the only thing that's real to you in that moment. You must see the desire already being fulfilled. You, The inner man already is the thing that it wants to be in imagination. So there, no, there's no such thing as desire in imagination. Desire comes from the external because there's just no need for it in imagination. What, what cannot be fulfilled in here? So you walk around as if all your needs are met. And you become the one whose needs are met in imagination. You can become that because you already are it in imagination. Everything already is so in this world. But a practice that must happen is you must detach yourself from the future and the past and the external and become fully immersed in the present moment in imagination. Or I should say the present experience of it. That's why Neville says in the five lessons to imagine... And if he has, he has a step-by-step -step process, and I think it's the third step, he says, to imagine in the here and now. Imagine fulfilling, imagine you experiencing your de desire in the here and now. Well, that's the present moment. So we must become present fully with our imaginations. And you can't become present if you are conditioning your desires. You can't really have them fulfilled. If you're swaying between the past and the future, you must be settled in the I am, where there is no fear. Where, the, where there's only fulfillment. And it doesn't matter what it is. Um, it's a feeling. It's a present tense feeling. You bring that present tense feeling to anything in the mind. And because the eye of man cannot be changed really with the future and the past. It can only be changed with the present. Because our future and our past are shaped by what we do now. And I repeat this a lot. Um, and I will continue to repeat it because sometimes it needs to be said in one way for it to click. And I think maybe the term conditioning is better than reasoning. Don't condition your desires. Imagine with no conditions. Feel with no conditions. What I mean by that is don't say, I can't feel X because my external isn't the way I want it to be. 
Neville says that if you continue to be to to judge after your appearances, you will be enslaved by them. We're not here to judge by our appearances, but by what we see in imagination. So it's the opposite. But if you continuously judge after your senses, well then, yeah, you will be enslaved by them forever. If you want to be freed from the senses, you must abandon the senses, abandon the external, leave it exactly the way it is and change the conceptions of yourself inside of imagination where you already are that. So um, this is more of a repetition of what I'm saying, just in a different way. But learn to understand imagination. And what I mean by that is learn to understand that there is no conditions inside this world. There's no requirements you must meet in order to assume a position in it. It's totally unconditional. It doesn't demand moral perfection for you to be able to assume what you want. It doesn't demand your world, your external world be perfect. There'd be no point of it. It allows you, regardless of where you're at, to assume the thing you want. It's giving, if you will. The imagination is very giving. So, I hope that change in thought of changing the word reasoning to conditioning helps. That a conditions the future, the past, or you, or a feeling that doesn't allow you to be in the present moment of it. And um, another word could just be said as doubt. Don't doubt the desire. Um, you can think of a man who doesn't doubt as equal to God. But we reason and we doubt and we condition. We don't allow the thought, the perfect thought to be itself. We don't allow ourselves to experience it just as it is a perfect thought. The thought is showing me that I'm expressing what I want. What more can I have in here? What more could I want in here? So, I hope that helps. So, something I, I found, or I find very important, very important in understanding is the idea, the the distinction between the state and you, the um, the inner self. And Neville made this this distinction. He said that you know there are infinite states, but you your you are not a state. Imagination is not a state, and imagination is man, and that is God. And he's basically making the distinction that there's a state which is a perception of yourself. Um that you aren't. Now your state dictates your reactions to your thoughts. If you find yourself feeling gut-wrenching pains from thoughts that you're having, it's because of the state you're in. The thought's not the problem. The same way you and I can go to any kind of place, and like I always mention that if we, or two people can have similar childhoods yet respond entirely differently to them. So the, the state dictates your response. But to the thoughts you're having, you and I can have the same thought, yet I respond differently to it because of my state of mind. So to not have thoughts affect you, then you must see that it comes from your state. So I say this because a question I often see and often get is, I feel, I feel like I, I feel stuck. How do I change my state? And what one must see is that they aren't that state anyways, that you're not even the state. You're never the state. You're, they're just things you're occupying. And I think that this detachment is so important of understanding that since you're not the state, that means you're not the reactions you're having, the emotional reactions you're having to those thoughts, and you're not those thoughts anyways. They're simply mirrors reflecting you. That you aren't your thoughts, and you're not your feelings, and you're not your state. The acceptance of this allows you to be able to be freed in imagination enough to where you can move in between them. You never feel super attached to anything in the mind because truly in a sense you can you just feel like you're occupying it, not necessarily something that you are, you know, indefinitely. <laughs> um I, I can see how that's terrifying. I've been there before. I see how it's terrifying to think that you're stuck in a bad state. But you can't. You, the inner self, can't be stuck in a state because you're never the state itself. States are just things you're you're entertaining yourself with. They're things you're occupying. So learning that um, type of detachment that you just, just here's what I do is I, I leave the thoughts alone. It's really not about, as I said, it's not what you're looking at that matters, it's what you see. And I can also think of it, it's not so much what you're thinking that matters, it's who you are. 
because thoughts can come and go, but who you are remains, who you think you are remains. And your response to you know, any, any kind of thoughts that are what we would deem negative or bad, they might not be that way to you. You might not react negatively towards them because they don't, it doesn't matter to you because it doesn't align with your state. For example, I mean, um, you can view yourself a very confident person, but then have a memory of when you were embarrassed. But if you react negatively towards that embarrassment or that memory, that's still, on some level, you still feel associated and connected to that state of embarrassment. You haven't fully left it because it wouldn't really matter to you. Because why would it matter if you're not, if you're now confident? Then what does it matter that you were in the past? It doesn't really matter. Um, so, and if you really uh, accepted that you were confident and you did have that memory, that memory wouldn't even bother you because you you are now the person you want to be. Because so what what you're really after you are really after an I am statement. You're you're after a declaration of the self in the present tense feeling. That's what we're after. Um, I am is the end goal. It's the present tense. And I think it's important to make this distinction because I've just seen so many people asking, well, how do I change my state? How do I change it? How do I change it? I'm not sure what to do. Well, learn to first detach yourself from the association of being it entirely. I mean, you're not, you're not any state really practice and feel what that feels like to not be the thing that you think you are, that you're not your feelings, that you're not your thoughts. These are just things you're having. From this detachment, I think it's easier to move. It's because you're so attached to thoughts, so attached to feelings. You think you have a bad feeling, you say, oh, I am this. It's Well, no, you're, you're having a feeling. Um, and that feeling isn't random. It's coming from a state of mind. You know, I had a um, a friend put it way better than I did. Uh, I've been, you know, it's funny when you when you you know talk about this for so long, and then someone comes and says it in one sentence. <laughs> uh, but he said it really well. He said that basically the idea is that uh, I've spoke about this in the past about how one should walk around in their imagination as if all their needs are met because they can be in that state of mind. And the way he explained it was a little bit better. He said that it's almost as if the truly the illusion is the fact that you don't have your desire because you do have it in imagination. And if imagination is the only reality, then, and the, then the, when, the imag- or when the external isn't showing you that you have your desire or you're believing that you don't have your desire, then you're, you're living in a, an illusion. And it is an illusion because the inner self does have the thing it wants. And you associate yourself with that being. And that being is not a state. That being has thoughts and feelings and those are its reflections, if you will. And it finds itself in scenarios and positions in the mind. And its reaction is based upon the, whatever state it's in. But it's never the state itself. So when people come to me with panic, and they, they panic, they're thinking that they're stuck. I always try to let them remember that just leave the world alone leave the thoughts alone, leave the feelings alone, and just change the conception of it, change how you perceive yourself. And I mean that, truly leave all these thoughts alone. Um, it's a practice I do is I just have the thoughts and I focus fully on how I'm perceiving myself. And what you will notice is if you really start to feel yourself to be the thing you want, naturally new thoughts arrive. You don't necessarily have to sit there and try to perfect everything. Um, again, because then you're sort of saying, well, it's not me. It's I need to have the perfect thought in order for me to be that. It's more about feeling yourself to be it now. And then those perfect thoughts come that reflect that state. And you will not react towards the old thoughts. I'm sure everyone's done this before. There are, there are many thoughts that you stopped reacting to because you've moved states. But if you do keep having certain thoughts that frighten you, it's because that you haven't left that state of mind. As I mentioned before, if you have thoughts that that you feel embarrassed by, well, then you still haven't moved from the state of embarrassment. And that's why you're reacting towards it. So it's about who you are, not necessarily the thought. You can have, you can have that same thought and be a confident person, look back at that thought and just feel like, oh yeah, at one point I was that. 
I was in that state of mind. That doesn't mean that's who I am because I just changed. So you, you're never your thoughts and you're never your feelings and you're never the state. You're always that being that can move and use these tools, if you will, to change. But really, you're never the thing you're changing into either. But that's for another time. That's not, that's not the point. The point I'm trying to get at is that learn to detach yourself from... Uh, bef- I try to tell people it's probably better to detach yourself in, inwardly than it is to try to focus on detaching yourself from the external world. First, learn to detach yourself from your thoughts and feelings and states. If you, Every time you have a reaction in the mind, or you rea- realize that that reaction is simply from a state that you're not. Learn to really become detached from it. And then you will naturally start to detach yourself from the external world. And that will allow you to live in imagination and live in fulfillment. And when you will walk in this fulfillment. You walk that, that the imagination fulfills you. That when you hear in the mind that you're confident, that's enough for you. That you don't need the external's opinion to conform right away. You, you dictate who you are in this world. And that's how it is in any dream. Anytime you wake up inside of a dream, you're the one who dictates it all. You orchestrate it through your self-concept. So when Neville says leave the world alone and change the conceptions of yourself, conceptions are within yourself. And, and leaving the world alone is also a skill in itself, but also learn to leave the thoughts and feelings alone. Leave the state alone. When you move states and you start to feel yourself to be different, don't wonder if you actually left the old one. Don't wonder if you are now this. You don't wonder anything. You just experience being it. Eventually the thoughts will form. Eventually the feelings will form because they're simply mirrors reflecting you. So I hope that helps that learn to you know practice detachment from these things. And you won't have such a panic when you find yourself in a state you dislike. You can just learn to say, oh, well, that's not even who I am. It's just something I'm occupying. Um... I hope that causes at least that causes the anxieties to go down from feeling stuck. And from there, you can think more clearly to move in imagination. You learn to explore the mind and you'll see that you really aren't anything in it. You're just occupying things within it. So I hope that helps. You know, I think that when we are raised in whichever way, we're given a story that we tell ourselves and we act upon this story. We make a lot of decisions upon this story and whether it's a nightmare or it's a wonderful dream, time will tell, but we live it. And I think the confusion comes is that we feel that we have some type of a fate or some destiny. I know I have felt this, that things will always go wrong for me. It's something I have repeated in my mind for a long time. And it was true in my world. And it wasn't, it's not until you actually see that you aren't shaped by a destiny. You're not being shaped by one. Uh, There really is no fate, as Neville says in Power of Awareness. You are made up of choices, not destiny. It only feels like destiny because you have not repented. And repentance is a radical change in the mind. It's it's who we dwell in consistently is what we manifest. And what I mean by dwell, I mean that's a present tense dwelling. Not a trying, but a dwelling. And an example I gave in the past was, suppose me and you are watching some sporting event. And our team that we're rooting for scores. And you and I jump up and we clap hands and we, we scream something at the TV. And then it's who we come back to after that moment. Do we return to being somebody who is unrespected? Uh, do you think low of yourself? It's who you return to consistently as a present tense feeling is what manifests. And... These, this idea of destiny that we're given from early on, we're given all these labels as we're born and we live upon these labels. We make decisions upon these labels and we're really no different than a robot at that point. But if one can see they're made up of choices, that 
And if one can see that the story they're telling themselves is actually not one that has to do with anybody else but themselves, that the story is actually about the your I am, that's the story. Um, your story is I am, and it I am's a choice. How you shape I am is a choice. It must be seen as a choice or else you'll see it as a, as a destiny. And... <clears throat> One of man's greatest talents, in my opinion, is one that people call crazy in this world. But I find it to be, I don't get how you can call it crazy because it's so obvious. It's obvious that at nighttime you close your eyes and you deny your senses and you're imagining yourself to be elsewhere. The denial of the senses is man's greatest ability. And man's ability to deny the senses and forgive himself or change himself is his greatest love towards himself. Because if he is, as Neville says, imagination itself, then when you believe in imagination, then you are believing in yourself. That's what it means to believe in yourself, is to believe in your imagination, because that's who you are. This body is nothing but a, uh, a temporal illustration of really what's going on within you. There is a man within you, that's why there's one without that will eventually pass away. But the one within you won't. That's who Neville calls God. That's the consciousness behind all these masks that we wear. And, and the way we tell our stories in our minds, we shape people in our minds. We have conversations with others in our minds. And these conversations, whether good or bad, are orchestrated by us. But how we shape them in our minds is actually how we shape ourselves because they can only speak to us in relation to who we think we are in our minds. So what you must do is learn to deny the senses to, to such a degree where you feel relief that you no longer even feel part of it. And then you attach yourself to something in imagination, but not in a sense of a desperate attachment, but more of an allowing. You allow something to be given to you. Um, you know, there's a there's a saying that says, never take, only give. Um, if you understood that in the imagination, it makes sense. In the world, it seems like, why would I keep giving if I'm not getting anything back? But if one can see in the, in the imagination that it's just you, then you don't need to be desperate and try to take things. You, you give them to yourself. You keep giving and giving toward yourself. And from that, you will give uh, yourself toward your life. And at times when we return back to these dwelling places, as Neville says, where do you dwell the most? Um that constitutes your, your, your life. Uh, it can be quite difficult to notice if we've been feeling a certain way for a very, very long time. But even those habitual states is simply a choice that's made every day. And if we could see that our desire is actually not a new car, it's not another consumer product, it's actually an I am statement that we actually desire to change the one thing there is, which is I am, which is ourselves. Um, having a nicer whatever isn't going to necessarily change yourself to how you want to, how you want to be. And if you can see your desire, your true desire is to change I am, then what don't you have? Because you can deny the senses and change I am when you please in imagination. And the way Neville thought of it was reversed, that the inside is actually reality and this outer world is more of an effect. Um, if one could truly see that their desires are within them, then that's where they fulfill it. And their desire is a new I am, meaning a new uh, state of mind, a new state of consciousness, a new per perception upon life. If you, you keep, you keep assuming it until you perceive it. And once you perceive it, you are it because you can't be it unless you can't perceive it unless you are it. You can't see it in the mind unless you are it. You should take that and take that understanding in imagination next time you go to meditate. Understand what I said there that you can't see it unless you are it. And you know, these stories that we tell ourselves could lead us down roads where we start to feel like it's not okay to uh, feel what we want to it's not okay to deny our senses. It's not okay to assume what we want to be. And when when you see that your desire is actually to change yourself, uh, you'll feel overjoyed because 
you'll see it's not, you're not really seeking anything external. Um, what you really are seeking is something within yourself, which is a change of the story of yourself. And you can change yourself to how you want in imagination. That's what's the wonderful thing about all of this. I find this amazing that, uh, that we can just simply sit in a room and change how we perceive ourselves. And that changes how we perceive reality. Um, I just find that so fascinating. And I guess I, I've, I've tried doing that since I was a child. I think we all have on some level. We all use our minds to try to change things. Um, but it's not until we actually allow the acceptance of it within ourselves that we actually see the change. Because you, you shouldn't, um, if you must see that it's just yourself. So when you go to change yourself, if you aren't um, allowing it or accepting it, as Neville says, I don't mean emotion, I mean an acceptance of the wish fulfilled. If you don't accept that that's what you are now, then you can't really become it because there's nothing but you. You are you are simply still trying to be it, which is okay, but just learn to allow it to be the case. Truly let go of the world and really accept that you are that now. Don't rationalize it. Don't say, but am how am I really? I, don't worry about that. Allow the, to leave the world alone and just... If you change an imagination, trust in that change. If you see new things in your mind and you feel new things, then you've changed. Now, you didn't, you're not changing tomorrow, you're changing right now. Um, and start to, to dwell there, start to dwell on that I am, the new I am, the new present tense feeling of being what you wish. Um, I, you, will feel, you will feel much relief knowing that the external can be let go of. Um, and the way I learned to detach was just a lot through meditation. It's still difficult. But what I've learned is that if you truly see, if you truly allow yourself to feel that the imagination is reality, then you will see that there really are no others. You'll see it comes under your conception of yourself. You'll see that everything is a reflection of you. And you'll see that you are the one who's in control of this all. And you change your imagination when you change how you see yourself. You'll learn all of that if you just accept that imagination is reality itself and this world's an effect. I can't rationally get you there with a bunch of logic, but I can just, I just assumed it. And from that perspective of flipping it, this is what I've learned. And I do see this world as more of an effect a temporal effect. And I view the imagination as eternal. And I view this body as simply an illustration of the man within. Just like a painting is from the mind of a man and goes onto a canvas and eventually that will wax and wane and leave. The same is true for my body. Um, and I'm, I see life this way because I've assumed that I'm the inner man. And you can too. And I don't, I don't think that this is necessarily by any means crazy because everybody on some level denies their senses and imagines. I'm just interested in it and wanted to discover more. And Neville was as well. And I'm sure you are as well. So learn to discover your mind. Go, enter your imagination not to take and get things, but to give yourself things, but to allow things, to start to understand that you must learn to expand yourself. Don't feel desperate for states. Have a desire for expansion within yourself. Maybe this, you know, you've lived a life of shame or something that has been chronically bad in your mind. Allow yourself to expand beyond it. Stop contracting and go through expansion. And when you see that it's an allowance of expansion where maybe this, I, my whole life I've been this one way, but I want to expand upon and be something else that the imagination won't reject you. You're expanding your own imagination. You're expanding yourself, your I am. And you'll see that um, that's truly what you wish to do is to expand. And there's nothing wrong with that. I wish everybody would expand more. And I think seeing, I think understanding that the story you're telling yourself is really just an I am statement. And that's really what you desire to change. And you can change it in a present tense feeling if you, repent in the mind, which is a radical change in mind. And 
if you can learn to deny the senses and see imagination as reality. I know this sounds like a lot, but it's not that much. If It just takes a, an assumption and you'll find a peace in the mind that you didn't think you had. At least that's what I found. Um, and it's a piece that I've created. And whenever it's gone, it's because I've um, got rid of it. But I can always bring it back. So the things we do in our, with, within ourselves truly are choices. The things, the thoughts we think, the feelings we have are truly choices. And many of the times these choices are already done um, through the states we're in without even realizing it. But don't change the people in front of you. Don't change the buildings. Uh, don't knock anything down. Leave it exactly as it is. Detach from it. Leave all the rumors. If you can learn to do everything like that and leave it all alone, um, Neville says that you that you'll see that that's your greatest talent is to deny everything and assume something new in its place. And you do that for yourself. Um, you let go of the past and you let go of the future and you change who you are now and by that you've changed both so if you wish to change your past if you wish to change your future change who you are now in imagination and truly see that desire is within and a desire within is an illusion so i want to speak about the inner man and why i think neville and his work has been the most accurate that I've read in a lot of things, but this idea that the inner man exists and that you, the outer man, is a representation of what is actually within. The, the same idea, I'm going to keep going back to it, is an art piece. The artist takes what's in his mind and puts it on the canvas and people observe and interpret it however which way they would desire, but regardless, it came from his mind. And it becomes temporal the moment it enters here. Just like this body. And I found that it's not so much a thinking problem or a feeling problem. You actually don't have many problems. The problem I found has been one of acceptance. I find that acceptance seems to be the biggest issue for all of us. And there's one thing that I think must be accepted for us to feel whole. And that requires the identification with the inner man. You see, the inner man lives in a world called, we'll call it imagination. But in this world, there's all these things happening. But in this world, the inner man walks in it and people and scenarios and thoughts reflect him. He is the um, reality itself in this world. So it's orchestrated all by him. And everybody in, the, in this inner world is called I am, just like this world. You know... We think we're separate, yet when you see two people wave to each other, everybody actually, their name is I am. So it's I am waving to I am. And so when you love others, you're just loving yourself. It's Because we're completely one. And that's the point I'm trying to get across, is that the inner man and the outer man are one. It's not that you have to loop your scene a million times or... You know, fall asleep in the perfect feeling and make sure you don't feel negative emotions and or whatever emotions that you deem are negative. Um, it's not impressing the subconscious and thinking you're trying to trick it in order for it to work. It's about you. It's always been about you. You know you're tricking yourself. And when I say you, I mean the inner you. It's not a knowledge issue and it's not a feeling issue. It's an acceptance issue. One must accept that the fact is, is that they are the inner man and that this body is a shadow. When you look to the ground at when the sun's rays are on you and you look to the ground, you see your, your shadow. Imagine your shadow telling you that it's separate from you. 
It sounds ridiculous, but it's true. The shadow can come up with all the reasons in the world and why it's separate, but it's not in the end. Likewise, is the same here. So the, the issue is not that you must know you're the inner man or must come to sufficient knowledge after all these years of study. It's really, it's accepting the fact that you are the inner man, that you're one with the inner man. And the inner man lives in a, a world called imagination which reflects him. He's surrounded by himself. He's surrounded by his own image. But he, the inner man, is not bound by conditions. He's not bound by the senses. He's not bound by time. He is free of all fear. He is, if you will, the God in imagination. Now, the point I'm trying to get across, and what Neville in some sense got across to me through his lectures, was that we're one with it. That we aren't separate by any means. That the the imaginative hands and the imaginative you know, feet that you see in your mind, your, yourself, that is you. You are one with that. You aren't separate. And understanding this, it's really not understanding, it's actually just accepting it. It's just true. I can't reason your way into it. It's just true. You are the inner man. And the inner man isn't bound by time. The inner man looks at the senses and the walls in front of it and it doesn't care. The moment you want to feel to be, you want to be something in the mind, it's fulfilled. The inner man's always fulfilled. So what we must do is imitate the inner man. We must see that we already are the inner man. And by seeing that we are the inner man, believing itself to be this outer man of limitation, we can then start to feel more limitless. It's simply a reversal of things. Is instead of calling your inner self fiction and imaginary and to dismiss it that way, you in some level just take it more serious. You just accept that it's true. That this inner man is not bound by the rules of the world. He does not care what the situation is. The inner man has no conditions for, that he must meet in order to assume anything. All things in this world are his. But that's you, the awareness of being. We're all wearing masks. And this body truly, as Neville says, is a garment. And this might not be the message that you might want to hear in the sense that I'm not speaking about materialistic objects, but I find this very important to me that this reversal of identification with the inner man is freeing. It truly is. Because the inner man is not bound by the when and the how. The inner man doesn't reason. It doesn't use language in that sense. Language is limiting in so many ways. It, The moment it feels it wants to be something, and it, automatically I, I find myself in new scenarios reflecting that. But then I doubt it. It's because I, I doubt it because I don't see that I'm one with the inner man. If I just simply see that I'm one with it, then I am it. And the inner man is the cause of everything in the world of imagination, which is you. And the idea that there's something outside of you is the biggest lie of all. That we're the cause of all our thoughts and feelings, and that's our life. And the, um, the nature by which we shape ourselves um, dictates the nature of those thoughts and our reactions to them. But I'm merely asking to ex try to accept the fact that it's true, that you're one with it. Don't try to reason. Instead, go to something that's not limiting, like like speech. Speech is so limiting. Go to feeling. Feeling is limitless. Start to feel what you want to feel and realize how limitless the feeling is and let yourself expand beyond something you're a bit uncomfortable with, with the feeling you desire. 
And you'll see the limit, uh, the, uh, the inner man is limitless and requires no conditions. The inner man does not require the senses to accept anything. The inner man's free. And the more you identify with yourself, your inner self, who doesn't need to fear because everything's reflecting them, doesn't need to fear because they are the one in control of it all. They're the one who, you know, I'm the one who wounds myself and I'm the one who heals myself. I do both fully. And that frees man by seeing he is the inner man who is creating this entire drama. And if you're listening to this, I think that you've been somebody who's questioned a lot in your life. I know I have. And if this resonates with you, then I guess simply uh, as it did with me with Neville, um, take it seriously and see what it's like to feel yourself to be one with the inner man. That's all acceptance is. It's simply don't argue with it. When the inner man tells you, the inner man's a redeemer, the inner man's a savior, it saves you from the senses. <laughs> it's a savior. Um, so the imagination's not there to shame you, it's, it's not there to spark fear into you. We're the ones who do that. But the inner man, when you start to associate yourself with it, you'll see that there's nothing to fear because it's all you. So, I uh, hope that helps. So, I, I do not wish this message sounds cryptic at all. I'm just trying to express this in the most honest and open way. There's certain things that Neville says that he constantly refers to this phrase that God revealed it in me. God revealed this in me. And when I used to listen to that, I thought to myself, like, why would God reveal himself to just some guy who was raised in Barbados? Like what makes him more special than anyone born anybody anywhere else, right? And I started to think in those terms with all these labels attached to him. And I never thought God would reveal himself to that. But then through his teachings and through my, you know, just meditate on the things he speaks about, and I'm not a part of any religion or any kind of, um, or any, or any organization or I, don't, I really don't follow any sacred text, but I do listen to Neville a lot and I meditate on things he says. And I've had my own experiences of feeling like things are being revealed. But when I, what I saw was that it wasn't me or it wasn't consciousness revealing itself to Edward. <laughs> It was myself revealing myself to myself. That's what I realized, that it has nothing to do with Edward, that Edward is Edward's a costume, it's a dream. And it doesn't even feel right to think I'm Edward in some sense because, because we are the I am that comes before, the awareness of being. We're the, the awareness. And the, I'm going to try my best to describe this as Neville tried his best. Um, and I've never, I want to stress, I've never had like a lot of the visions and stuff he's had. I'm just, this is just for me and my own experience with it. Is that the most important thing that matters from his work is who you think you are while you imagine. You see, if I imagine as Edward, Edward can be a label attached to I am, I am Edward. Edward, just as any label that we have, you can have labels of male and female, and those are defined by the time and society. And every time you think of male, you might have a certain concepts that come to your mind. It's like a box and it's filled with all these concepts that were given to you about a male, a female, or um, a certain race. And you think a certain race, and all of a sudden you think about all these other concepts that come with it. And it, that's a veal in some sense. You can think of these attachments as veals to the I am. And it tricks itself into believing it's that. And then it experiences it. Uh, but it's not really an it, it's you. And when I say I am Edward, Edward is, you know, was 
that is not truly my real name anyways, by the way. Um, it's just a name that was created off of Reddit. But Edward comes with all these um, ideas and a past that was, uh, wasn't, to be quite frank, it was abusive. And I had a lot of negative self-concepts and I struggled a lot in my life and I did it alone and, and I felt um, all these, yeah, I felt like I just wasn't worth anything. And I can take that image called Edward and imagine as if I'm Edward. And the issue with that, that arises that I found within myself is that when I imagine from that standpoint, it's very challenging for me to say yes to myself because of the, the amount of, I guess you can say brainwashing that was given to me of thinking so low of myself that I started to believe I don't deserve something good happening to me. So then if I go to imagine as Edward imagining something good happening to him, well, you can bet I'm going to have resistance and I'm not going to feel good because I'm still thinking I'm Edward and Edward comes with these issues. But if I see him the being behind Edward, that Edward is just a dream. And the way I see that is I start to imagine as God. And Neville cons consistently would say, um, know that it's God doing it, that it's you doing it. Because if I asked you, imagine a red boat right now and a red boat came to your mind or imagine hearing something and you heard it, I'd say, well, who's doing that? You would say, I am. So then it is God imagining because God's name is I am. That's the way Neville would describe this. But it's not just, you know, some type of theory or like a step-by-step. A -step. It's an actual like knowing. And you know Edward's a dream. And you imagine, you start to know this when you start to imagine as if you're God imagining. And when you start to do that, you'll find I am is like a piece of clay then you just kind of shape it and mold it or you, or you just attach things to it. And you don't feel like things are impossible if you imagine as if you're God. You don't feel that way. It's much easier to just say yes to yourself because it's just yourself imagining for yourself. And then you imagine for others because there really isn't another because everyone's I am. And there's only one being here. And, and when you imagine these, as, as I want to talk about at the beginning, was that I, since I've taken upon all these negative self-concepts, I created a nightmare of a life um, through Edward, if in some sense. And this, like a nightmare, if you fall asleep tonight, if you have a nightmare, it's going to have to do with the I am because that's the only being there is. It's the only really thing there is. And a nightmare is simply a holding on to a negative self-concept because as Neville says, consciousness is reality or God is consciousness, I am is consciousness, I am is reality. If that's true, if I am is your reality and you attach upon it, I'm not enough, well then, and your reality becomes of you, you know, simply people revealing to you that you're not enough, you bet that's a nightmare. And we create our own nightmares through the way we perceive and shape I am ourselves. And I don't, and when I say ourselves, I don't mean Edward. I mean like ourselves, the inner being, the, the, the I am. We are the I am, but there really isn't any we when you see it this way. Um, and others who really come are just revealing to us what I am's we've taken and what we are conscious of being. That's what I am means. It's what I'm present tensely conscious of being. But to change and, uh, and to say yes, to accept all that's within you, to accept it without having to argue a reason for it. And you accept this with impotence that the uh, Edward can't do it. That only the inner man can do it. And you accept the, the wonderful thoughts and feelings you desire. If you, you can do this effortlessly, if you know you're God imagining. But if, again, if I go to Edward imagining, it's much more challenging. And it feels natural to imagine as if you're God. It feels pleasing. 
there's almost no resistance. I don't know why I would create that. The moment I see myself as imagining as God, I take responsibility. And this is the point that Neville was trying to get across. Now, he's had many experiences that I personally have not had. Um, but I've had certain ones that have sh made me question reality and to such a degree that I, I knew there was something deeper to this. And, and I, and I, and I, again, I'm not trying to talk cryptically or I'm just trying to share this as honest as I can share it. Um, I'm just speaking from my own experience. And I hope it comes off like I understood because this is very freeing that I'm going to repeat this is that it's who you are while you imagine that's important. Who is imagining? Is it somebody who is, you know, in our, in this, in this world of states, somebody who's, you know, stupid, not enough or all these things, or is it, you know, if you go deeper, is it God imagining? And these, this resistance will go away when you see that. Um, resistance for me only comes when I start to think in terms of, of this outer man, because the outer man has so many restrictions and so many um, limitations. And I don't change the body. I don't change the outer man. I don't change the outer life. I change the perception I hold of myself of who is imagining. It's God imagining. So I imagine as if I'm God and I change within and I don't bother with the external because there's only one being here. And uh, I hope this message uh, resonates and I hope it's not confusing at all. I truly hope it's not confusing. And yeah, and Neville said it, like, you know, imagine this if you're God, but don't, you know, you don't have to be arrogant about it. Just, just do it. Just imagine this if you're God. You don't have to add anything else onto it. You're not more enlightened or better than the next person that there isn't really no next person. There, I am too, just playing that part. <laughs> so, yeah, I hope this, um, this message reaches you. Truly. So in the last video I spoke about, or asked the question, who is imagining? And the importance of trying to understand the who there. Because it is by the who that, in some sense, will either create an easier time to accept, or it will create resistance within ourselves. And I'm not saying you can't imagine from the limited, you know, man or the uh, ego, if you will. Um, I typically don't use that word, but if you want to call it that, I'm not saying you can't. I'm just saying that if you imagine from the perspective of being the one being, you know, the, the inner man, the creator, uh, who men call God, as Neville would say. And um, personally, I don't love the word God either, but uh, it's just a one that's very so commonly used. It can be understood a little bit better. But the importance I was trying to get across was that if you imagine from the perspective of being the inner man, the creator, the God, you have a much easier time accepting all things within yourself. Now, the next question we must ask is, who is desiring? Who's desiring? And we must see again that it's the inner man desiring, that the desire is not outside of us, but within us. And that's where we must fulfill it. I know this to be the case because I have had that these experiences where I've tried to chase things in life and I never felt the way I wanted to. I never felt fulfilled in the way I desired. But it was only when I tried to give it to myself inside imagination that I actually become a f more fulfilled being. I started to, in some sense, live in abundance in imagination. When I saw that desire and fulfillment is within so we change, mean, meaning me, we, meaning, you know, the inner man, the inner selves, we change our inner reality. We remold it and change it to how we would like it to be. We have our desires fulfilled in it. So we leave the world alone entirely. And we just learn to start saying yes to everything within ourselves. That the moment I imagine something, 
I accept it. You know, there's this, um, I accept it as a present tense moment or just, I just accept it as a yes. You know, practice a meditation where you simply, you simply say one word to yourself and you say yes. And you imagine everything you desire. And just say, say yes as if it's an actual yes to it. Um, and don't worry about anything else. Don't argue with yourself. Don't question things. If you actually are accepting it, just accept it. It's all these questions that get in the way sometimes. It's, you really already are capable of doing it. But, you know, this, this acceptance, again, is, it's not, as Neville said, it's not an emotion. Acceptance is, it's, it's truly a surrendering to it. It's truly like saying, this is mine now. I accept it. And that elicits emotional responses. So when you, when you feel that you've accepted that you are this or you have this, your mind will naturally, this is all going to happen naturally, it will naturally start to think from that position. And then you'll be given an emotion. You'll start giving, be given thoughts from this, this, this new accepted position in, in your inner reality. And you just go with it. You don't have to stress about it. Learn to just start accepting things except that the wish has been fulfilled as Neville would always say now the word in you know I know in religious circles it's different but typically a lot of mystics have used um, they defined the being called God if you want to call it that as or this creator as love and it's all accepting the Bible says that God always that's in him it's always yes and there's never no so it's this all accepting thing. So it accepts things for no matter what they are. Consciousness does. No matter what it is, it accepts it. Now, can we mimic that? Can we start to accept, you know, the things within ourselves for no matter what they are? No matter what it is, can we learn to unconditionally accept it with no judgment? The things that we desire. And what you'll find is that you'll, from acceptance, you will fulfill yourself in a way that is different than trying to achieve things in the world. We must leave the world alone. It's really not the issue. The issue truly, the war is truly within ourselves that we must end. We're desiring. And as I've said in the la uh, my previous videos, that desire is an illusion because the inner man can't be desiring. It doesn't make sense for the inner man to desire. The moment the inner man desires something, he can fulfill it within himself, inside his inner reality. He can hear something, feel something, whatever he's desiring, he can give to himself and accept it. He accepts it as something that's his. And, and when you see that desire is an illusion, you'll see that feeling desire makes no sense. You, you don't need to walk around in your inner world feeling desire. When you start to feel desire, almost think that, oh, it's an illusion. I have what I desire. Because you do. The inner man always has what he, says, what he desires. It's just a matter of exalting him and just coming to that fact and remembering it. Not necessarily something you have to create. It's already true. The inner man can remold himself and his inner reality to the way he desires. So let us start to remold ourselves within because that is the place we can. Now, the, now, we can imagine things, but can we accept them? Can we just accept them for no matter what they are? I know you want something lovely for yourself. Well, then learn to accept it within yourself unconditionally. Mimic God, if you will, who gives you the thought unconditionally. The imagination doesn't question your qualifications in, the, in as Neville would call the world of Caesar. It doesn't ask you whether or not you're qualified <laughs> that would be strange. That actually would be strange if it did. But it gives you the thoughts you desire without question. It accepts you for no matter what you've done, no matter what you are currently. It accepts you. Enough so to grant you the thoughts you desire. Now, are we going to accept these gifts unconditionally and mimic it? You know, and this is the question. Um, you know, who's desiring is, once we see that it's the inner man desiring, then the desire doesn't make sense anymore. We can start walking around being fulfilled because it's the inner man who's creating his reality. So start there. Start to accept 
that desires an illusion. Do a thing that I've called radical acceptance. You just radically accept it the same way consciousness radically accepts you. It gave you this, what you must see is that consciousness gave you life. This whole thing called life. We're in it, all of us. So it gave you life itself, unconditionally. So all, and all things within life come secondary. So mimic him, the one who gave you this thing called life, and accept things all within life unconditionally. Give to yourself unconditionally. Continue giving and giving and giving. Never, don't take from the world. You don't need to take anything. So if you can see that life itself has already been given to you, then all things within life come secondary. Hope that helps. So there's a chapter in Power of Awareness called self impotence In my last video, I spoke about acceptance and how we must accept things within ourselves. But I noticed in my own life that I, I had a hard time accepting things within me. And I started to wonder why I had such a difficult time. And I came to the conclusion that it was reason. Reason was my issue. I would reason my way out of accepting things, always. I come up with, and that's really all this is, is that that's really your enemy inside your own mind. Is your, It's yourself, but it's reason. It's the voice of reason. It convinces you to go back to where you just were from, right? Go back to the old state. And I found that the voice of reason will ask things like, how? How is it going to happen? When is it going to happen? Um, who's going to help you? And all these questions that you can't answer, right? And really the answer is, I don't know. That's what I've noticed for me is that I've imagined things and they've come into being. And there's just no way I could have devised the means. I could never have figured that out to do it that way. <laughs> never. <laughs> and, and not in a million years could I have figured out that's the way it should be done for this to, for my manifestation to come into being. Um, and then once I started to see how beautifully harmonious the means were when, and that doesn't mean it's, you're not going to have a rough patch or anything. That just means that the, the bridge is already finished and you're just going to walk it now. And what I've noticed is that these bridges are very complex. And there are things that I don't think I could have ever sat down and contemplated enough upon it and then figured it out. So I had to accept that. I had to accept that I don't have an answer against my own reason. I self-surrendered, as Neville says in this chapter. It's called personal impotence. And... I think self-surrender, he says self-surrender is essential. And by that, that is meant the confession of personal impotence. And then he quotes the Bible here and he says, I can of mine own self do nothing. And that's the outer man speaking. That's the outer man admitting he doesn't know. And I don't know. And I admit that. So I not just admit it, I fully accept that. So now... What I've discovered was that that type of acceptance of personal impotence, that I can't do anything to make it so it's just, it will just come into being, it will grow by its own kind. That acceptance I've noticed is what, or that, that personal impotence that makes acceptance easier to do within myself. That all the inner man can do is accept things within. And the outer man just, and honestly, or the voice of reason just has to shut up. We just have to shut the voice up of reason. And it's the amount of power you have when you do it is incredible. When you learn to quiet the mind or quiet reason and you can fall into a blissful you know, state. And I do want to stress that you don't necessarily have to always think something or always imagine something. You can really learn to let go in imagination. You don't have to necessarily you know, always be thinking. You can learn to walk in ways where you're just quieting the mind and you're just observing. And I recommend everyone observe instead of judge reality. Um, this, this idea that these judgments must ask yourself, where did they come from? 
Many of the judgments we make upon life were, were never things we would have thought of ourselves. They're just things that were given to us at one point in our lives. And we took it as truth, and then we judged reality on that. But if we can learn to let go of judgments, be more of an observer, what you'll find is a pattern in your life. You'll observe patterns, you'll observe scenarios that are similar, you will observe your manifestations unfolding. If you sort of imagine the things you desire and then become an observer. It's, I mean, it, definitely in our time, it takes, we're, we're totally conditioned to think happiness is a, is a Bugatti. <laughs> uh, I think that's the most ridiculous thing in the world to, to, to make your, uh, your own being, your own feelings dependent upon reason or dependent even worse upon a physical object like that. Then, to say I can't feel happiness, I can't feel the things I would desire to feel because I don't physically have it. That's the whole point Neville's trying to get across is that you don't. You, you deny the senses. You deny the limitation in front of you because we must let go of organ perception because if we hold on to organ perception, then we have held on to limitation because we know that a Bugatti is not going to just make you happy for the rest of your life. That'd be, that'd be crazy, right? Um. It's just a really a rearranged car. It's the same. It's just a bunch of metal rearranged. We view it that way. But to apply this meaning upon it and not see that we're the meaning givers, um, we're doing ourselves a disservice because then we don't allow ourselves to feel the things we want because our physical reality hasn't lined up with it yet. And that's the whole point that Neville's trying to say is that can't you see that the outer man is limited? Can't you see that he can't he looks in front of himself and he just sees a wall. He can't see beyond anything. And William Blake also said it more like he views his eyes as windows. So he was essentially the inner man looking through the eyes. He would say, I look, would look through my eyes as if I was to look through a window. So when I hear that, I hear William Blake really associate himself with the inner being. And he became that instead of thinking that he's looking with his eyes. Because when you look with your eyes, you see limitation. You look through them, you see expansion. And it's by realizing or this acceptance of personal impotence that the outer man can't do it because look how limited he is. Then I learned to just realize that it just comes down to acceptance within ourselves. Um, we accept the things we desire within ourselves. And the more you start to learn to accept instead of react in imagination, you, you start acting in imagination. You start acting w with life, with a purpose, or having a purpose in life to um, go towards those things you desire in your mind and accept them for, for no matter what they are. And it requires a giving up, a self-surrender, that you don't know the answers to your reason and just let it go and just fully embrace the desire within you and you'll find that it's, it, it really will just come down to that and it's an acceptance of you can accept it however you want but I, I try to accept everything as something I have now that's what Neville is uh, trying to get across that it comes down to accepting in the present and it's much your life will become or I should say your inner life, that's what we're trying to change is your entire inner reality. But you can easily change it with acceptance. Who you are inside this world, who you want, or what you want to have inside this world. It's truly your world. Um, and I want to just read the last, the last sentence. Sorry if I'm all over the place here. Just felt like that today. So the last sentence in this chapter, he says, willingly identify yourself with that which you most desire, knowing that it will find expression through you. Yield to the feeling of the wish fulfilled and be consumed as its victim, then rise as the prophet of the law of assumption. Now, when he says that it will find its expression in you, the way I view imagination is that it's the externalizer, that if I, it's the thing that externalizes itself here. So I must go to it if I want to externalize something. And when he says to yield into the feeling of the wish fulfilled, yield is the same word as accept. You yield into it. You Neville would say he would fall into states. He would feel like he was falling backwards into it. 
you can just trust in it or accept. I just use accept personally. I find that word to make more sense. And we're accepting that the wish is fulfilled. But I hope I hope this video makes makes sense. I noticed I was kind of all over the place, but eh, it's fine. It happens sometimes. Hope that helps. So sort of in order, I've spoken about acceptance and how we must learn to accept or radically accept everything, no matter what it is within ourselves, uh, within imagination, because we're the creator of it all. And then I spoke about, you know, who is imagining and how we must imagine from as if it's God imagining. For that will make acceptance much easier. No matter what it is, we'll accept it. And then I spoke about who is desiring and how desire, it's really coming from the inner man and the inner man's desire is an illusion because he's creating that feeling of desire within himself when he can just as easily create the feeling of fulfillment. And then I spoke about how the outer man must self Surrender. He must surrender all reason. You know, at the end of Neville's lectures, he always speaks about how we must go into the silence. But to see how powerful this is, is you have to almost take his view from the Bible and how, you know, in Proverbs chapter 3, he'll tell you about how you must not lean on your own understanding, right? You don't know the ways in the ways of the Lord. And the way Neville would see that and the way I see it is that it's the outer man and inner man speaking to themselves in some sense. It's the outer man thinking that he can despise the means, but he must actually surrender. In fact, it tells you that, um, you know, you don't have understanding. You're kind of foolish. So the outer man is almost, he says, don't view yourself as wise. See, I view that as the outer man having to surrender and admit that he's not wise enough to figure it out. He's not... Sure enough. So he has to live by faith when it comes to the inner man. And seeing this relationship between the inner man and the outer man, this is what this is stories about. These stories are about, um, and even our lives are about this. It makes sense that it, how important it becomes to realize and take back our own power inside our own minds. Because I don't see how you can live a life you truly want if you're not choosing the thoughts you want, for it starts there. And, and to hit all these points home, what I want to also stress in this video is, or in this talk, is that all desire, you know, something I've struggled with in this whole journey is that I would see some desires as effortless and others as not. I'd see some desires as greater than others. But it wasn't until I saw that it's all desire springing from the same source. You know, the good and the bad come from one source. It's imagination. You can, you know, I'm, you know, the idea is that imagination is like an instrument. It's like a piano that you learn to play. And there are high notes and low notes. And these are experiences in life. So if we can learn to realize that all desires springing from the same instrument, the same source, then, and what Neville, the, you know, the power of Neville is that he tells us that we're the operant power inside this source, that we're the ones who get to pick and choose the things we desire in imagination, then living in desire starts to not make sense. You know, Neville said that if you're desiring, stop it right now and feel the fulfillment of having your desire. So we change our feelings from, you know, it's not about the words. Just the words are descriptions to describe the feelings I'm trying to say, which is the feeling of desire is in, in a sentence. It would be like, I want. And the feeling of fulfillment is I have. So we must learn to practice feeling I haves or not, you know, not as an affirma affir affirmation, but as an acceptance of I have, I am. Because if you try to take desire and place it anywhere other than the present, you can't fulfill it. If you feel a future tense inside your desire or a past tense like you lost it, then you're not fulfilling that desire because you can't fulfill the desire in the past or the future. So you must drop these two. And it's wonderful when you drop both of them 
you realize that the past doesn't define you. And the future, you don't have to have those worries of the future. So the mind becomes calmer. And the outer man becomes more silent. And the point I'm trying to get across with Neville, with Neville saying, let's go into the silence, is that the outer man must learn to become silent. He's not wise enough. He doesn't know. For man, this outer man needs a reason, yet the man in imagination doesn't need a reason as to why he wants to choose to feel something or choose to think something or choose to create something. There's no reason necessary. There's no condition necessary. That's still a reason. Or sorry, that's um, still a condition. Even reasoning is a condition. It needs no conditions. For the moment the inner man wants to see themselves expressing something new in imagination, it doesn't in an instant. It doesn't ask for anything. But what I have found over time is that the inner man, all they can really do is either accept or reject. It's like you just say yes or no. You know, there's a, there's a story of, you know, when Jesus throws his net out into the water and gathers a bunch of fish, and then he tells you to discard the good and the bad. You can you view this story in a bunch of different ways, but you can also take the view that these fish are perspectives on life, and you can take the good ones that you want and discard the bad ones, right? Or they're thoughts. You know, the same thing. They're just thoughts that we can choose, pick and choose. The whole point is that we get to decide. And we do, regardless where we decide things, regardless. I'm just saying that maybe we should come at it from a standpoint of not taking the external as fact and changing it to saying, I'm going to accept within me this is fact and see if it develops in my world. And if it does, then I found a cause. And what Neville would say is that you're the cause. You found yourself. You've been looking for yourself in some sense. So we have to learn to play this instrument. Uh, There's an instrument called imagination. And we practice it with acceptance. But it makes acceptance much easier when we can see that all desires spring from the same source. So all fulfillment and all desire springs from there. And we get to choose the state we want to be in whether it's a desiring state or a fulfilled state. It comes down to us. One's not really better than the other. It's just because it's coming from the same source. It's just different. It's just a different path. So it's a different path just inside of imagination. So as Neville would say, stop desiring. So we learn to live in fulfillment inside imagination. We don't allow ourselves to feel desire. Not as a bad thing, it's just not to resist desire, but to fulfill it. So I don't think there's anything wrong personally with having a desire. I think it's to remain there is to remain as the outer, the external limited man and to not realize that you're the inner self because you have the power to desire and the power to, or, you know, fulfill, or some would say you have the power of sin and the power of forgiveness. That's the terms he would use. So I use more acceptance and rejection, or we have the ability to save ourselves from our own desires that we don't need an external source. There's no conditions I need placed upon me. No organ perception. Nothing needs to be placed upon my desire. All I must do is accept. Either I can push it off and reject it, or I can accept it. And that's really what I found the inner man can do. It's really a powerful thing to accept your desires with no conditions. And we mimic God in that way. We mimic imagination in that way. We become more accepting in that way. So every day we must learn to be persistent and practice this instrument called imagination. And we practice it with acceptance. And persistence sounds um, like, a, like a work, but it's actually, as Neville says, you, you want to stop desiring. You want to practice not desiring. You want to practice feeling fulfilled. You persist in that. Persist in accepting it as a present fact. That's what persistence is. It's actually a wonderful thing. It's, it's actually wonderful. It's the art of changing yourself in imagination with no external source necessary. So, you know, I hope that we all can learn to, once we start accepting our desires, we'll find ourselves to be the source of desire itself. And by that, when we realize that we're the creators within ourselves, then we can now finally choose, you know, deliberately, consciously states that we desire. And you don't need a helper. You have imagination. 
So I, uh, I hope that helps. So I hope that the message I give here um, reaches you and you start to see the things that I'm seeing uh, from Neville's work. And I know Neville has spoke a lot about the Bible and there's this big acceptance of duality in the Bible. And the idea is that, you know, there's a scripture that says, I kill, I make alive, I wound and I heal. And that's what the, you know, God says in the scriptures. And it's this acceptance of the duality of things that they both stem from the same root and the root is imagination that if you have one the other is also rooted in imagination and when i saw that all things are made of the same substance that my peace and my anxiety stem from the same source which is imagination i stopped feeling unworthy of any thought the feeling of not being worthy enough for my good thoughts just left me when I saw that they're made of the same thing, which is imagination. And I know Neville, in the beginning of his um, teachings, he would give the ladder experiment, which he would ima- he would tell you to imagine um, your right arm and your left leg, and you know climb up and down this ladder in your imagination, and do that every night. You know, it says do it every night for five minutes and then during your day walk around saying I will not climb a ladder and there were people who would climb that ladder now I actually decided to do a different item I wanted to do a rubber duck because rubber ducks are just not something I'd ever come across so I was like I want something I won't come across and this was years ago and I I pulled out my right you know imaginary hand and I put a rubber duck in it and I felt the rubber I kind of pressed into it. I saw its orange beak and its white body and you know, the little eye. And about two weeks later, I, I mean, I just did it for maybe five minutes one day. And about two weeks later, I, I did receive that rubber duck. And that's when I, that wasn't the first, well, I guess that was, maybe that was the first manifestation that I tried. Well, it worked is the point I'm trying to say. And then I tried it with, um, many things after that. I just kept trying it with many, many things, just different types of items. But I stopped being interested in doing that. I just wasn't very interested in receiving items that much. I started to see that I actually wanted an ease and a peace inside my body, inside my mind. And I couldn't seem to find that peace if through items. Um, I realized I, I desired a deep, understanding of imagination. I wanted to understand imagination instead of just trying to get items. I wanted to know what it, what, who I am inside of it. And what I found is that we're the creator of both the, both states are made of the same substance that the, you know, the panic attack and the feelings of connection and love are both stemming from the same root. And when you see that they're the same substance that that the ladder that the rubber duck are made of the same substance imagination then you won't feel unworthy of anything because as i said before you're the inner man everything is yours in imagination everything's yours you shouldn't walk around in your mind feeling that th- certain thoughts aren't yours who else's would they be who else who else's thoughts would they be and you can conjure up new scenes and scenarios. And I, yeah, I've also done it with conversations with people where I've told them, I've imagined them telling me things. Well, when I discovered that even the conversations we have are made of the same substance imagination, then you're able to change it and choose what you desire. You become a chooser and you don't have to fight your anxious thoughts. You just see that they're stemming from the same source. So, now, whenever I have unconfident thoughts or, or feelings of hopelessness or powerlessness, I realize that that powerlessness is stemming from the same source as where my powerful feelings come from. And that helps me realize that they're not, one's not stronger than the other. Um, I'm not allowed to have one and not the other. I'm allowed to have both because they're just stemming from the same substance. All these physical items are stemming from the same substance, imagination. So you don't feel that a rubber duck and a ladder are an 
different grounds because they're stemming from the same source. And when you see that that I create my peace and I create my anxiety and you accept that duality comes from you, then you unify it. And then you can, you don't necessarily have to have um, constant anxiety every time you want peace. It, it's that you get to go towards peace and realize that peace is not any greater than the anxiety you experienced. It's just, it's made of the same substance. It's just a different route in imagination. And I, I desired this deeply because I have found over time that imagining objects just doesn't satisfy the soul as much as realizing that everything in my mind is created by me. That acceptance, that the panic attack that's arising is made of the same, that same thought is made of thought or, or imagination, whatever you want to say. And that overwhelming sense of peace is the same thing creating it. And I can go towards anything within it. And I don't need to desire anything within it. Then it's really just a true freedom that arises. And I don't see why any, no one else can have that. Everyone else can have it. Like the same imagination that was in Neville's and me and you and everyone. It's, we're all made of the same substance. We're just in different, you know, states within it. And all states, again, are made of the same substance. It tells you that in the Bible. Not just I create, I kill, I make alive. I create the, the peace and the calamity and I'm, I create the wealth and the poverty. You know, he does it all. And once you stop separating that, like, you, if you feel that your negative thoughts or your anxious thoughts are stemming from some outside source or from external thing from you, then you will feel powerless. You have to, to feel powerless in the mind is that you have to make yourself small, that you don't actually lose your power. You just perceive yourself as small, right? The Bible tells you that they appeared as giants and we appeared as grasshoppers, right? So if you, if you make yourself small like a grasshopper, things will feel large to you. Thoughts will feel scarier if you make yourself smaller than them, but you're the thinker. You don't have to react to any negative thought. You don't have to judge it. You don't have to do any of that. You just see it's made of the same substance as any other peaceful thought, that it's not stronger or anything. And then you accept the other ones that you want. And then you start to move effortlessly in imagination. You stop straining. It stops becoming a headache. That you can, you are allowed to be indifferent. That you're allowed to not react to the anxious thoughts you don't want. They're not made of any different substance than the peaceful thoughts. And that is actually what I say to myself. When I do have thoughts I dislike, I just repeat the word <laughs> same substance and I realize it's, I can just more, go towards something else. Um, I just remember that the ladder and the rubber duck are the same substance. And I, I truly think that the, this acceptance of this duality, the fight, the, the fighting within ourselves will stop or at least will come to a deeper peace than you would have if you didn't realize it was from the same substance. Because when you don't realize that, you're going to think that your anxious thoughts are coming from the physical objects in front of you or that, or the external world is what I mean. Or you'll think, you'll think of some other God, some other source for it. But there is only one source, one God, one Lord, one, as Neville says, everything, you know, one Father, well, all of that. But it's true. He does both. You know, he creates and he destroys. And the, the whole point is that it's just trying to show you that you have to accept that, um, there isn't two gods here that you don't have to fight within. That nothing's putting that on you, that negative thought. And I hope that, I know I'm repeating myself, but it is important. And I felt like I had to share this because this is something that's really helped me realize that I, whenever I have an unconfident thought or I feel worried or concerned, I realize I'm imagining. And these are all made of the same substance as my lovely thoughts. And I'm allowed to move and change. And yeah, so I hope this message reaches, reaches you. Um, truly, I really hope this helps. So I've been studying Neville's work for a long time. And there's this 
meditation he speaks about, which is the I am meditation. Just basically you repeat the words I am and you feel them. And you'll find yourself removing labels from yourself. And I didn't quite understand that for a long time. I tried it and I felt like it didn't do anything for me. And I just sort of blew it off and ignored it for a long time. But I noticed in myself that there was a strong attachment within me to life itself, to this life. I became extremely attached to trying to take from it. And that's what I mean by attached. I was always trying to take something from life. Um, I was never being honest with it, or I was never just giving myself to it. I was, quite to be honest with you, I didn't have much to give inside myself because I wasn't giving myself anything. Inside my own mind, I was negative scenario after negative scenario. So I didn't have much to give the world. And I can only give myself, so I'm only giving these things that are within me to other people. Or to other, you know, to everyone. And that was because of my attachment. In my opinion, what I discovered was that was my attachment to meaning. Applying meaning to things. And usually in this case, I was applying negative meaning. Now, that doesn't... That doesn't mean, what I discovered is it doesn't mean that just because I apply a negative meaning to things that I have to apply a, or apply a positive meaning. I don't have to apply any meaning to anything. And now the way I view the world is much different. Um, Neville viewed the world almost like it was dead in front of us. It was um, not responsive in the sense of um, trying to take from it. You're, you're trying to take from a world that is temporal. Give to yourself so you can give to it. And it's always going to fail if you try to take from this world because obviously things perish here. And to attach yourself to perishable things, you would never attach yourself to like a can of beans that's been opened. It's going to perish right, over time. You're not going to attach yourself to it and attach all this, you know, your whole identity to it because it's perishable. And, you know, Neville speaks about dwelling on I am and removing these labels. And I've actually found, for me, the reverse is actually true. It's actually realizing and repeating to myself that I am not, you know, my body. I am not, and by the I am, I mean the inner man, I, that I'm not my past. And I, and this is sort of what I do uh, as a delabeling meditation where you just kind of remove all of these things that you, you've attached yourself to. And from these attachments of these identities, we apply meaning to life. You know, no two people see the world the same way. But it's because of the way we see the world, um, but the way we see ourselves, the way, what we've attached to. And sometimes when you attach yourself for so long to states, it doesn't matter what state it is, you almost feel like it's your identity. You almost feel like it is who you are, which obviously is not true according to Neville's work. And can I test that? Can I see if I really am, if I really am bound to my past, then I should always repeat it. Well, if I can make a change inside myself, will that result in a change in my world? And if it does, then I'm not, I'm not technically my past. And if my past at one point was my future, then I'm also not my future now. So you can learn to, um, for example, let's just go through it. typically something that I, this is something I do is I will sit down in meditation and I will feel myself say these words that I am not my body. And I, I don't reason with it. I don't question it or debate it in my mind. I just accept that I'm not my body. And then I start to feel a little bit more free, right? I'm not bound to the limitations of this body. I start to feel a little bit freer. And I keep going with that freedom. I try to lift it up. And that's something I realized here too is that Removing barriers um, through this detachment that Neville speaks about. Um, Neville doesn't quite get too deep into detachment, I've noticed. And this is something I do to detach because I was so heavily attached to the world. I needed to do that. I needed to understand that I'm not my past. I'm not my future. I'm not my states. I'm not my behaviors that come with the states. These are all temporal things that I'm holding on to. They're just, they're not really uh, permanent. And if I were to go through this right now, I would... I would tell myself this. I would feel that I'm not my body. And then I would start to feel a little bit freer because my body's a limitation. And then I would feel that I'm not 
the states I hold, such as um, any kind of identification, um, an American or or, or um, a European, whatever it is that you are, you, you're you're not you're not that. And then you go back a little bit further and you say, I'm not, I'm not what whatever my parents have told me I am. I'm not that either. And, and I'm not what society says I am or I should be. And you start to remove these labels and you start to say, I'm not um, bound by the repetition of the past. And I'm not my current states either. And you'll start to see that these are all things that are limiting you from actually experiencing freedom within yourself. And it's so important to know this because the meaning you apply upon life, the way you see life is determined how you see yourself in relation to it. So if you find yourself applying negative meaning constantly to life, it's because you're applying that to yourself. But you don't have to apply any meaning, and that's the whole point of this. You don't reason with it. You just say, I'm not, you know, my, my race. I'm not my skin color. I'm not anything here. I'm not the behaviors I've done. I'm not the words I've said. I'm not my thoughts. I'm not my feelings. These are things I have. I don't have to apply any meaning to any thought. Very common thing I did. I always would apply some meaning to the thought and it would be some negative meaning about myself. I'd have a thought that maybe I deemed immoral within myself and then I would feel like an immoral person because I had an immoral thought. I applied all this meaning and almost as if I was trying to discover who I am instead of creating it. And when you take off that meaning, you'll see it's just a thought. It's just a state. States are just unoccupied things that I occupy. You start to get to the eye of yourself. And you, through this delabeling, you'll see that how much freeing it is to realize that you're not your feelings. And most people identify with their feelings. They feel a certain way, so they think that's what I am. Or they think a certain way, they think that's what I am. Or they apply themselves to the body. They identify that with the body. So if the body's in pain, that must mean that they are ill. Or they apply themselves to all these things. Or we attach ourselves, I should say. That we attach ourselves to the re reactions of others and our reactions to them. And, and when you start to detach, um, you'll find yourself having an opening inside your body. Because you're finally not stuck in the position you were before. Now, this isn't movement yet. We haven't necessarily moved anywhere within our minds if we want. But you'll find that any type of state you attach yourself to after this is just a limitation again. Regardless of how nice it is, like, it's just another limitation, which would be like, I'm a kind person or I'm, you know, this, this and that. That's another limitation. But it's a, it's a nice one, if you will. It's freeing still. And... When you finally realize that you aren't these things and you're allowed to detach from them and you're allowed to not apply meaning to everything, then you don't have to, I should say, you don't have to judge yourself. You don't have to judge the thing you're looking at. You don't have to do that. Then you found yourself back in a position of choice. And that's where you want to be within yourself is a position of choice. What do I choose to see? What do I choose to hear inside myself? What do I choose? You get back to the eye of yourself, you get back to choice. But when you've attached yourself to all these uh, limiting states, you're going to, I mean, from my experience, you're going to be lost. You're going to be, you're not going to know what thought to think. You're not going to know where to go in your mind. You're going to reason and question and add all this meaning. And then you're going to um, react to the meaning you're creating in your mind instead of what's actually happening in reality. And you think to yourself that, if you just figure out the meaning, if you solve this, then everything's going to be solved in your life. But what I have found is that it's not that at all. It's that I'm even applying it in the first place. I don't... Ha I'm, most of the time we react to things we're imagining. We're not even reacting to life. Um, we're, we truly live in an imaginary world. We just react to what's going on in our own imaginations. And if we can learn to detach yourselves inside imagination and realize the inner man is none of those things because the inner man is not the past he's not the future he's it really is whatever he says so whatever you say so you're one with that um then like i said you find yourself back in the in in choice 
A lot of times we don't trust ourselves because we took upon negative states. But once you realize you're, or we don't trust ourselves for the behaviors we've done. Um, but again, those behaviors are not our birth. That's the fruit from the states you're in. And if you aren't the state, then you aren't the behavior. And if you're not the state in a state in, in its essence is thought, then you aren't or thought and feeling, and you're not the thoughts and the feelings, then you really can learn to move now in imagination. And the, that's really the only movement Neville says exists. And that's what I found to be true. No matter how much you try to force and push the world, it doesn't feel natural. It only feels natural to let go of the world and allow yourself to be natural within it. And you, it, it, it truly only feels natural to give yourself things in your mind and expect it to show up in your life. That's the most natural feeling I have found. It doesn't feel natural when I try to change people or I try to remold things and f by force. Um, it doesn't feel right. It only feels correct when I actually sit down, detach, and attach myself to things I desire. And to me, that's true freedom, that I'm not those things. And as Neville says, you need no man's opinion to assume a concept. So you can assume regardless of what the external says. Um, you're doing that right now. <laughs> and at one point you assumed these negative things about yourself, or I did about myself, and I experienced it to its fullest degree. And, and the freedom of being able to detach yourself from things that you might have held on for many years, I know I have, it's incredibly redeeming. You truly are starting to redeem yourself. And when you start to move in the mind after that detachment, you can, you'll find it so much more natural to attach yourself to something you do want. It'll feel more freeing because you're, most of the time we don't attach ourselves to the states we desire because we're listening to the present limitation that we're in right now. So we say things like, we ask about the hows and the whens, or we ask about, um, I guess we just ask all these we, we try to reason our way into it based upon our current conception of ourself, which can't do it. You have to drop it. You have to let it go. You have to detach from it. That it wasn't you to begin with. It never was. It was just something you occupied. And this has been so freeing for me, is being able to walk and not judge things. Because I grew up in a way where I was constantly in hypervigilance. I was hypervigilant all the time always looking out for the next thing that might happen. And I tried to gain control in my life, and I failed many times. To, I failed every time to gain control. And it never felt natural to do that. And for a long, long time, I thought I needed someone to believe in me first for me to believe in myself, or I needed someone to trust in me first for me to trust in someone else, or for me to trust in myself. I thought I needed these things, but I didn't realize I was still seeking from a world that is only, only a mirror. And it could only give me what I was giving myself. So if I was seeking something in life, I must ask myself, can, do I have that within myself? If, if what I'm, is the validation or whatever it is I'm seeking outside of me, is it really within me? And if it is, could I give it to myself? And I don't need to put the condition upon them giving it to me. That's a condition. So we add all the, we don't even realize, we add all these little conditions where I didn't realize all these conditions. And, when you detach yourself, you basically are removing condition. You're removing all of it. You're not anything, and you're not your reason, you're none of those things. You're not your anxious feelings, you're not any of those things. So, um, I truly hope that, I might make more videos on this because I find this to be extremely important from Neville's work, and I don't think he touched on it enough, in my opinion. I've tried to read as much as I could about detachment from him, and it seemed like he, he just had an easier time, or, he didn't find it that difficult. Um, he sort of just dwelt on I am. But like I said, I sort of fall into more of I am nots. And I'm not sure if that's right or wrong. I don't know if I really care. It's just something that I have done just for myself that I'm not these things and I start to feel freer. Um, but again, you still have to move to the positions you want in your mind after. That's more of just being in a detached state, which is wonderful. Um, but it's just, it will just teach, it just taught me that Peace can be had within myself. But yeah, I might speak more about attachment because I find it to be incredibly important from his work. Um, 
I think he talks about it in a lecture. I just can't remember. But anyways, I, I do hope that helps. I do hope that Hono helps me. And I still practice that to this day and just work on freeing or feeling that freeing feeling. And don't allow yourself to reason it away. It's something you created. I hope that helps. So I spoke about detachment and I don't think I gave a reason as to why you want to learn how to detach from the external and all that means. And there's many ways to describe it, but a, a, another way of des describing it is by saying, I'll, I'll give two ways, learning to not emotionally respond or say emotionally react to your environment. Um, and I mean reaction. There's a difference between acting upon it and reaction. Uh, reacting to your environment can be impulsive. And we don't want to be uh, we don't want to be compulsive or impulsive in our in our doing. We want to ease our way or fall into states instead of um, instead of putting any kind of force upon the world. We want the world to naturally express things. And another reason why you'd want to learn how to detach is because the God that we're seeking is not outside of us. He doesn't dwell in a temple or in any building made by human hands. It's, he's not outside of us. The ones outside of us are made by wood and clay, but we're not talking about a God that way. We're talking about a being that's creative. That's what, we're, that's what we mean. And this being seems to be inside us. We are some, there's something inside of ourselves that allows us to see events uh, before they happen. We can give reality to these events. We can enter into these events. This thing within me, I can fall asleep tonight and dream up a new world and become awake in it. You know, you can become awake inside dreams and tell other people in those dreams that they're in your dream. And they may look at you like you're crazy, but you can't deny it. You know you're sleeping back at home, but you're dreaming. So this thing in me creates another world. It makes things flesh. And that's what we mean by praying to the only thing that exists, the one who creates my good and my bad inside me, the one who creates the peace and the, uh, the war within me. It's all by one creator. And the reason why that is important to understand is because if you did start detaching from your external as, as if it's, as if it's a God that you need to plead with, and you said you go internally, you'll see that there's nothing to be unworthy of because as I said in my, and the root of all that it's all made of the same substance is that if you see that the one creator is creating the good and the bad inside me, then I don't need to be compulsive or reactive to my thoughts. I can control them in a way. I can dictate where they go right? because I don't have to have the bad. I'm the creator of the bad. I can, you know, the moment you start to feel you know, the wish fulfilled, the bliss will come overcome you and realize that you created that bliss and you keep letting it overcome you. You become its victim. You start to feel overcome by feelings of genuinely having what you desired. So you no longer desire, you feel that you have it. And that is something that I find important to understand too, is the, uh, is that scriptures tells us that's whatever. So whatsoever you desire, believe you have received and you will. And this is a testable claim and, you know, we must learn how to feel that we have. There's one condition imposed upon us, upon man, and that is to believe and, and it's to believe in something in specific. It's to believe I have it, to believe I am it. Um, that is the one condition imposed upon us is to believe. And I think for so often I've, when I would imagine I'd get so caught up in the how and in the when, even when I wouldn't realize it, I would still be thinking of space and time while I would imagine. Yet my imagination showing me the end result, the inner man sees the end result of, it sees manifestation only. The inner man doesn't see the how, it just shows you the, the end result. And the question is, do you believe you have that? The inner man's the one who needs to believe he has it. And 
you know, I'm not called to devise the means. And I have to admit to myself that I don't know how things will be. I've had manifestations happen where I could have never guessed that I was going to bump into so-and-so and that would lead me here and lead me there, you know. So I don't try to devise the means. And I don't know when. I don't um, necessarily worry about that. I'm not told to worry about the one. I'm told to accept I have it, and having it is the present tense. So I don't know how and I don't know when. And for me to argue with myself about it is to argue about things I do not know. So I have to drop them. I have to drop concepts of time and space while I imagine. I have to let go of what I know and believe that I have that. And when you do actually believe you have it, when you fulfill that condition, a bliss will overcome you. If you truly let go of the voice trying to ask you how and when, if you let go of it all and accept it, when that bliss comes, you can either run from it or you can embrace it. And the more you do that, the more you'll see the, the when and the how will just naturally drop from your mind. You'll be more concerned your intention will change and you'll want to imagine simply to fulfill yourself. And as much, how much we use this, you know, this claim that whatever you desire, believe you have and you will, to the degree we test this is up to us. So how much I want to give myself, how much I want to have inside myself is up to me. It's realizing that it's in consciousness is where I'm lacking it. When I realize that, then it, then you can fulfill it. It's by seeing that I don't lack anything externally. I ignore the senses. It's the inner man who's lacking, who has believed in loss and has believed in lack and therefore experiences it in imagination. That's the one I need to save. That's the one I, that's me. It's my awareness of being or my awareness of having. It's a being who has instead of a being who's, de who's desiring. So I stop, I leave the state of desire and move to the state of fulfillment, regardless of the senses. I ignore the senses. I, you know, ignore the facts of the world and I just assume that I have it. I don't do anything other than that, which I've always done. I've always spent a lot of time thinking about how and when, and even when I would think that I'm not thinking about it, I would be thinking about it. It'd be in the back of my mind. I never truly let go of it and accepted the fact and admitted that I don't know. I don't know when, don't know how it will be done, but I know what I do is I have faith that I'm praying to a God to which all things are possible to. And I believe that I'm praying to the only God who's created any kind of trauma in my, inside myself and any kind of peace inside myself. I've spent time in meditation realizing that I do create both of these things inside myself, that I'm the one who's um, being mean towards myself and I'm the one who's being nice. And once I saw that that's, there's only one creator for this duality, that there's, there really is only one creator for all these things. And that has, you know, made me feel a lot calmer was about realizing that those thoughts that I deem bad stem from the same substance as imagination. Then I don't feel unworthy of simply rearranging imagination to something lovely. That's all I must do and believe that I have that. And, and a question I often get was, is how long should I imagine for? And the answer I give is imagine until you feel that you have it. However long that takes. Sometimes it can be, sometimes I can go through, you know, thinking about, you know, start contemplating certain ideas and some, some thoughts might scare me, but I realize I'm creating it and I let it go. And then I find myself somewhere else in my mind. I give myself what I want. The next thing I know, I'm feeling bliss. And that might be in five seconds. It might be in an hour. But I, I give myself as much time. I don't really think about the time. I think about feeling that I have it. That's my intent. So we don't have to feel unworthy of anything within ourselves because it's all coming from one place. You know, the uh, something we tend to do that we don't realize is, you know, we create things that are really within ourselves that we're told that we're the temple of the living God. And then we create physical temples and we say God dwells in there. But it's really a representation 
every temple that's built, you know, by bricks, they're just representations of really what's within ourselves, that there is a God inside a temple, but it, this is us. This is the God inside this temple. And we can, as Neville says, that we're here to, we're here to learn imagination. We're here to practice it. And the way that I've learned how to practice it is actually, it's very simple. It's believing you have it. But that takes a lot of removal of a lot of ideas that have been given to us about ourselves and about life. So this removal of reason that, that it seems to be blocking me, the removal of the facts being thrown at me, if I allow myself the freedom to believe that I have it, things definitely change without a doubt. If you persist that you have it, um, then your reality should shift. I don't see any reason why not, because you're genuinely shifting inside. You shifted in consciousness, and you'll find yourself with that shift, not emotionally reacting to the external or not emotionally reacting to certain thoughts that you normally would have had a negative reaction to. They won't bother you anymore because you're not in that state of mind anymore. You're not in that, you're not a victim of your thoughts. You know, you're a creator now. You've, you can, you can go to sleep tonight and find yourself in a dream and be a victim of the dream. Other times you can find yourself being conscious in it. And every time that I find myself conscious inside a dream, I, I can imagine things and they happen instantly. Now, of course, I would love to mimic that here. <laughs> but I think it's showing me that we really do create with our minds. We create with what we're given, and it's hard to accept that to be the case. Because it takes, it's, as Neville says, it's a lot easier to blame people. It's a lot easier to blame the world for what I don't have inside myself. And something that I've had to learn is that before I blame, I must, let me first fulfill myself, let me give it to myself and see if that helps. And of course, every time it does. So just take it from me that um, make it simple and believe that you have it and see how things work in your world. As Neville always said, um, just observe how it works. Believe you have it though. And then make this an experiment and see what happens. And don't be shy with yourself. So um, back to detachment, what I was trying to say was that we must learn to um, let go of this external world um, dictating what you should imagine and allow yourself the freedom to have what you want regardless of, um, of the external, what the external says. Because the external has, will say, a lot of labels. It'll throw a lot of labels on you, throw a lot of ideas, and you might not agree with them. But you remember, you are the I am that precedes all self-concepts. Knowing that, you don't have to feel unworthy of any self-concept because they're all made of the same substance. And you're the being that assumes the concept. Uh, meditate on that and contemplate on that. But yeah, I hope this helps. I tend not to do these videos by um, reading anything because I, I think it's not as authentic as I can be. So I usually just go off uh, the top of my head and I sometimes I miss things or I um, add things in, which I like. But I want to explain something that I think is so important to Neville's work that <laughs> if I'm being honest, I notice it's widely uh, rejected by a lot of people. And I don't, I don't mean to bring anyone down. I don't have to do that, nor do I want to. It's just something I've observed. And it's that people really remove the idea of, of the importance of scripture from Neville's work when, if I'm being honest, he kind of only talked about that. And I want to explain why I found it important and why over the years I started to read the Bible more from the lens of Neville, not a religious context. And here's something I just wanted to so I want to just explain how I see the Bible, how Neville saw it, how I, or my interpretation of how Neville saw it, and explain why it's important to understand for your journey here. Now, Neville viewed, he didn't view Jesus Christ as a person like you and I. He viewed it as an internal state that you enter into, okay? Now, here's an example of what I mean. If we go to the Old Testament and we read the book of Isaiah, King Cyrus is a character in this story. 
and it was revealed to him. God says this to him. He says, the, I am the Lord your God. Um, the Lord is one. Um, there is no other God but me. And then he says, I form the light and I form the darkness. I create the peace and the disaster. I wound and I heal, right? I do both. At that time, people believed that there were separate gods for these things. But this, but he's told that he does everything. I'm the one who does it all. It all comes from one source. Now, when you come to that realization that the God of Scripture, his name's I am, or it's, it's imagination, uh, creates both, you have now entered the state of King Cyrus, because that's who it was revealed to. So the state of King Cyrus is a, just a state of mind that it, when, when you find out that it's only one God, one being here, who does both, once you remove the idea of other gods, then you are in the state of King Cyrus. That's really all that Neville is saying. And he calls these eternal states, the same way where there are states in this world, like wealth and health and whatever it is, and when you assume you have those things, they start to enter into your world because life is reflected in consciousness. So you must assume you have it in consciousness. Now, basically what Neville is saying is the moment you start to assume that you're God, as Neville says, walk around feeling that you're that important, assume it and feel it, don't be embarrassed. God's story is revealed, His, his if you will, it's revealed in you. Because that's where God dwells. So his story starts to open within you. It, it awakens within you. Uh, it's, not, it's not a savior on the outside. He, he, basically what he talked about is that Jesus Christ is not something. If you hear the word Jesus Christ and you think of something outside of yourself, you have the wrong God. If I say God and you think of uh, you know the typical old man in the sky, or you think of some spirit dwelling in uh, a Christian temple or whatever it is, you have the wrong God. And the reason why this is so important is because if we can see that it's only one being here doing it all, well, then this one being is the creator of my obstacles, of my struggles, of my burdens. He's also the one who relieves me of them. There's only one who does both. And since I'm always imagining ahead of my evidence, then I am the one creating my obstacles. I'm reaping what I sow, and there is no other. And then he says this. He says, the idea is that, you know, the Shakespeare's, the Blake's, these, you know, wonderful men in the world, and they, you know, he's right. They are, they're very wonderful men. But, you know, a lot of us would think that they must have some, they must have been born with something. They must have, they must have something that you and I don't have or we must lack something and they have abundance of it um, whatever it may be but what neville's point is, is that there's nothing greater than your imagination so no they aren't greater than you um, they're not greater than jesus christ if you will jesus christ says i am the way i am the truth and i am the life i am the resurrection and the life i'm the door i'm the door to all things in life um, i'm the way to all things in life and the idea there is I can't go, if I want forgiveness of sins, if I want something, I can't go to a, a church to be forgiven. I can't go have confession with a priest and be forgiven. No holy man can do it. I can't sacrifice a lamb and think I'm forgiven. I'll come back tomorrow. That's why Neville says, give a man the world and he'll spend it tomorrow and come back. Tell him who he is and give him the application of that knowledge and he won't have to return. And that's what Neville's trying to do is to tell us who we are. Not, he's not necessarily trying to get us to just have an acquisition of things. He's trying to tell us who we are. And he says, you are that character, Jesus Christ. You aren't a, uh, he's not a person. That's, it's who you are. It's the inner man, if you will. It's the one who has the power to forgive your sins. So I could forgive my own sins. And my sins are things that I'm missing the mark in, in consciousness. So I might be missing the mark somewhere in my mind. And since there's no other creator, I can't go anywhere. <laughs> I'm sort of stuck with him, if you will, which is kind of funny. But it's, a, it's important to know that, that I can't go anywhere else to believe I have it. I'm told by this character, Jesus Christ, too, that whatever you desire, believe you have it and you will. 
And if this is the thing that created all things, though you know, it's also called the word of God in which all things were created by, then what am I doing not believing I have it? If that's the only condition that I was given by it was to believe that I have. Why am I letting the temporal facts of the day dictate my state or whatever it may be of the day that will change tomorrow? Why am I letting that dictate or my senses dictate or my reasons dictate what should I should imagine? I'm told to whatever I desire, so there's no limit for all things were created by him to believe I have received it and I will. That's the promise. Well, that's a promise given. Well, if that's the case, then the question really is, what am I doing not doing that? Why am I doing anything else if this is the creator of all things? And what I have found in my life is that I can't go to another God. Now that I've studied Neville and, and practiced, you know, or I should say I've repented, meaning I've changed my mind in many ways, and I've imagined things and it, they've happened. So I can't go to another. Um, I used to when I was younger, but now I've realized that there is no other God but consciousness, and it's one spirit. It's not divided. There's not a bunch of gods. We're all one, and we've just fragmented. Humanity is just one, but we're just fra we're just individualized. You can think of the same thing as a spirit. The spirit really is one, just individualized, and. When we start to assume that we're not this, just the flesh, that we are a spirit, or, you know, this says God is love, God is spirit, God is light. When we start to assume these things about ourselves, then they, the story starts to unfold within us that we are those things. We're given the, um, the revelations to show us that we are that, that we are the love, that we are the, the light of the world, that we are the truth, that there is no other truth. So if I want to find truth, if I want to find the door to things in life, if I want to find the life itself, if I want to find the way or find the good shepherd, I have to go to I am. There is no other. There's no other God, but it tells us that God's name is I am. So when you are in the state of Moses, when you discover God's name is I am, you have now entered the state of Moses. That's basically how Neville sees the Bible. And I find the way he sees it so important because... It, it tells us that God calls things that are unseen as though they are seen. And then the unseen becomes seen. So the Bible tells us that things are created by unseen things. And this is such a wonderful revelation when you see it in this way. Not in a religious, it just I completely remove all things I've learned. And to be honest, most things you think are things you were taught to think. Let's just be honest. Rarely do people actually think things that they chose. Usually it's following, and you can have any thought you want. Think about that. And think about the, the thoughts that you're in a cycle in, or the, you're in a loop in. You were probably taught to be in a loop in that. You were probably taught to, if, for example, I've had a, a big problem with self-sabotage. I would imagine something, but then I'd sabotage it in my mind. Well, then I was taught that. Here's a perfect example. Um, when I was younger, we used to go to the mall, and this is when I was a child, and we used to window shop. For those who are rich and don't know what that is, you go into a store and you look at you look through the windows and you just shop with your mind. You're not really buying it. Well, either we would do that with the expensive stores, or we would go into the other stores and just browse. We would just look at the items, but we wouldn't buy anything. And that is how I started acting in my mind. I started to, for, you know, that made an impression on me from growing up. And then that, I started to act that way in my mind. So I would window shop with good thoughts. I would observe them, but I would never really occupy them. I would think, well, that would be nice to think of myself, wouldn't it? But I would never actually have it. I would never take it. I would just daydream about it. And that's what we're not supposed to do. We're, we're called... To be, you know, we're told to believe I have it, whatever it is. Well, if that's the case, um, what am I doing not doing that? If that's given to me by the only creator who tells me to do that. And, you know, there's so many wonderful things from the Bible when you read it in terms of imagination. 
that imagination did not come to condemn the world, but to save it. So this thing in us is not trying to punish us. There's no punishments coming our direction. If we're always imagining ahead of our evidence, we don't have to imagine punishments. And if there's only one creator, there's no, there's nothing outside of me punishing me. Um, there's nothing in the sky who's looking at my moral, you know, my, <laughs> whether or not I'm moral in my time, whatever moral means, you know, just simply do unto others they have to do unto you. I mean, the idea is simple. If all I have to do is believe I have it and to believe you have it, if that's all I can do, if that's the only condition placed upon me, then why do I need to feel any lack? Why do I need to feel like I need to scam somebody or I need to harm someone or I need to uh, step on their, you know, on them to get ahead? I don't need to do that. I'm doing that to myself. So, you know, and that's, I know that's difficult. It can be hard to follow, but when you just practice believing you have it and believing they have it, and you'll see it's just one, that there is a, that the, the spirit is not separate. And, Realizing that there's no greater other than your imagination, you don't have to feel less than the brilliant people in the world. Um, that's, again, your reason getting in the way, trying to diminish you and make you feel limited. That makes you feel that um, you lack some ability. I mean, I wasn't, I wasn't born intelligent. I wasn't born that way. I, I truly just assumed these things. Um, I wasn't necessarily a good speaker growing up either, but I just assumed these things. And I would fall asleep truly believing I have those qualities. And I've struggled accepting other qualities. Like I said, there's other qualities in me that where I window shop. That's a great example. But imagination doesn't want you to window shop. Um, the Lord, if you will, in Isaiah tells you to come, eat, buy without a price. No condition. You can buy this without a price. So it's not, as Neville says, I'm not using Caesar's coin to purchase these things. I use my wonderful imagination to accept them, that I have it. And when we are in, you know, we are in, as Neville says, the world of Caesars, this idea that it's the external world ruled by man. But you don't have to think of it as this society and that society, you know, and um, this person believes that and that person. Just view it as one person. Just view it as Caesar, that the moment I want something in life, I'm begging Caesar. Do I want to be a beggar to Caesar? Or do I want to just assume that I have it? You know, don't, don't, you know, bow your knee to Caesar and beg for things. That's what you're doing when you feel like, or you, you are, or you're accepting that Caesar says no. You don't have to view it. You can just view it as one person telling you no. And that's just the outer world. That's Caesar. Um, so. Yeah, this, uh, I, th I just found this understanding of the Bible so much more clear. Now I can talk more about this in the future, but I just wanted to at least stress, I understand why some people would want to avoid this part because it, it seems valueless when it comes to, um, imagining things you want. But when you see the importance of it, that even, you know, the Tao will tell you that, um, how simple that everything is really one, yet how profound that is. And that's how I feel about this, is that when you realize that I create the light and the darkness, when you accept that, I create my obstacles. For I'm always imagining ahead of my evidence. I create everything within me. Um, the, the freedom that can come with that, that you can't really get by just the acquisition of items through your imagination, you'll see that it's, it's deeper than just trying to obtain things. It's discovering who we are. And that's really what this journey is about. And what it keeps coming back to is that there's no two gods. There's only one. There's only one spirit. One consciousness, if you will, if you don't like the word spirit. Um, but there's only one. And I, I found this to be just incredibly profound in my journey. But I understand why this wouldn't appeal to many people. But if you just remove your religious context, if you remove these ideas, if you remove your reason about it or your issues with it and just see it in terms of a story that unfolds within us, that we are the ones who forgive our sin, that it's we don't have to go to some external thing. We don't have to I don't have to go to some building to 
pray to this being on a Sunday to see if it'll give me what I want. I don't have to go anywhere. Every place is holy. So, yeah, I hope that helps. I, I'm, I know this video is quite different, but I, I would love to speak more about this because I, I find it so incredibly important in this journey that the outer world really is, if, if I am is the life, then this outer world is dead. And it's not until me, where I come, the spirit consciousness, and I, I, I animate it. So I don't have to feel uh, any lack, um, that everything is just an expansion of me. So um, I, I want to speak more about reason in the future, but I just wanted to share this about um, Neville in the Bible, because I know he talked about it in pretty much his whole life, and I found his interpretation to be fascinating. And I think that it's, worth, it's just worth diving into to understand. So I hope that helps. I recently wrote a journal entry that was very impactful for me. And it came from the idea that Neville said that me and you descended here into this limited being within ourselves. We descended within ourselves to a level where things seem to disappear. They seem to go out of our focus. But he states that but if we enter ourselves into the world that's eternal within ourselves, we can once more um, assume it to be so and it can become so. It objectifies itself in our world. So things that seem to disappear don't disappear. You and I, we may fall into a position where we feel like we have lost our health or I have lost my faith or I have lost my love. I have lost my uh, standing in my community. I've lost my respect. I have lost my wealth. I have lost this, that, and the other. But things that once were, or things that are in the mind, always will be. So I didn't necessarily lose anything. But what I did lose, in some sense, or the reason why I experienced loss, is because of my belief in loss. The idea that I did lose something, the, I, the belief in loss itself, is the reason why I experienced loss in my world. But I can enter myself and find it again. So I wrote this uh, journal entry that really was quite mystical in its writing, but I think it's very practical as well. And I want to share it and explain more about it. And I write, If God created all things, then God is the creator of my sadness, my loneliness, my hatred, my rage, my sexuality, my family, my love, my joy, and my peace. And God's name is I Am. So I ask, who is my sadness? I am. Who is my anger? I am. Who is my loneliness? I am. So all things were created from Him, but His name is my name. But I have attached myself so much to my outer identity named Edward that I do not remember or recognize my name. My name is I am. I am the person aware. But I attach myself to these labels. But I speak now from the inner man's perspective. I look and see my parents not as a symbol of me, the inner man, but take them as causation. But they are a symbol of causation. The two come together and become one. That is causation. But I, the inner man, am one. I am spirit. Time is nothing to me. Everything has no life unless I spring it up within me. I can curse the root of the thought, for it withers when I take myself out of it, for I am the vine. I am the awareness that brings light to all things within myself. But no, I am not just a man, but I will die as one. I become one with man, so man can become spirit. All pleasures and pains of man are temporal, but I am forever. And this is how I create. I, the inner man, believe in myself. I call what is not so by the moral eye, as though it is so. I, the one within, call it so. For without my command it cannot become so, for I am the life, the vine. I fulfill myself so I can become living water that I may never thirst again. I enter myself and call it seen, and it becomes seen. But let me not create a god. I am God. Are you sure you made no idols? Are you desperate for God? Then you are in Egypt, Athens. Feel after him and you'll find him. 
There is no other God but He within. Examine yourself and see if you are seeking, for all that you could possibly seek is within you. Examine where you are desiring and fulfill, for desire in consciousness is the belief in loss. For nothing can be lost, for spirit is eternal. Enter yourself and believe you have. There is no other you can turn to. The kings of your time will rule over you. The gods will starve you. The holy men will make you feel sinful. This is the inner man speaking. Come to me. I am good. I will uplift you. I will hold you and comfort you. I will protect you and feed you. I will never leave you. I am love. I am good. I will freely give to you. So come to me. You will not starve but be full. I am all giving. I am all forgiving. I am all merciful. I am love. I am the good shepherd. I am in all and I will rescue all. None are forgotten, for we are one. To lose one is to lose myself, for spirit is undivided. Understand spiritual things first, and all these pleasures of man will be given. For you were born in this body of death. This is a bed, a tomb. But the entire external is one body. The body you are in is a representation of this entire reality. But you will look for causation, and you will look at your parents and think you found causation. And that is true for the outer man, but not you the man of the spirit, you, the inner man, the invisible awareness, are causation. So let go of these labels made of man and see you are a spirit and God is spirit. Labels of man cause division, but spirit is unity. So do not bow to the order given by man, by Caesar, for man is a representation, not causation. Caesar says no, but God says yes always. All things being imagination, it will find a way, for God is the way. The way to what? All things. So do not mimic or worship man, nor his heroes, for man can only create gods with plaster and wood. For the idols of man will eventually betray. God will introduce himself as light, awareness within man, then power, then love. And in my terms, awareness, causation, and love, and the greatest of these are love. Now I wrote this because I was inspired by Neville. And something he, he asked was, do I believe my imagination is Lord? Do I believe that's my God, my creator, imagination? Because the way we treat imagination, the way we think of it, is how we treat it. So if I think, have you ever heard someone say, well, that's just his imagination? Like, almost like it's silly. It's just silly. It's just a child's imagination. It means nothing. So that's what we treat it as. But if I viewed it as my Lord, my God, or my creator, I would treat it as such. I wouldn't be so willing to dismiss it. But if I keep viewing it as something silly, then I won't really experience much from it. I won't really use it. But if I see it as it is my creator, then I can't turn to another creator. I can't go to some king and ask him to give me what I want. I can't ask a holy man. I can't go to some priest to forgive me. I'll come back tomorrow and need to be forgiven. So knowing that imagination is the only thing you're looking for, that's been within you all along, the creator, we're all looking for God. Everybody is. But God is not, you know, doesn't dwell in a temple made by human hands. He's not made of wood and plaster. He's, he is us. And this is so relieving because the Creator's good. Imagination's good. And the way imagination sees you is who you're going to be in the world. So when you enter yourself and you actually see yourself the way you want to see yourself in, inside yourself, that's how imagination sees you. Because it tells us God doesn't judge after appearances like you and I do. He judges after the, the mind of man. So how I am inside myself is how he sees me. And that's who I'm going to be in the world. Because he doesn't judge after my appearance. He doesn't care how I look. He wonders what I'm whispering inside myself. He listens to that. He sees how I see myself. He doesn't push me. He allows me to make all the mistakes. He allows me to become whatever I want to be. He allows me to take any kind of position I want in the world inside imagination. But you and I can enter ourselves whenever we would like. 
we need to learn to leave the facts alone. Leave Caesar alone. Leave man alone. Leave the facts alone. Leave the denials alone. Leave it all there. If you can leave it all there and assume you are so, whatever it is you want to be, and you hold on to that and persist in that, regardless of the facts, it becomes so. Now, when you learn to, the reason why it's so important to leave it alone is because that's where power comes from. See, if you and I had to continuously manipulate the world to get our way and lie to these people and step on those people, and then we're not really acting in power, are we? We'll always feel like we have some enemy, something we have to fight against to get to our desired goal. But that's not what Neville teaches. Neville says if you want to be convinced of this truth, you're going to have to assume and not lift a finger to make it so. All you're going to have to do is continuously assume you are that thing. And he says the moment you can conceive of it, you are it. And you are in imagination. The moment I can conceive of myself being something other than what I am inside myself, I am that inside myself. Do I have faith in that? That that's me? It has to be me. Who else is it going to be? So I deny my reason. I let go of the facts. I don't try to control the facts. I leave them the way they are. It's so free and when you leave it all the way it is. And I don't have to go to some holy man. I don't have to pray to some king or worship it. The gods that we create in this world, they starve us. Pray to the God here. Pray to the God made by man. And next thing you know, you will just be starving. It won't answer you. But this God does. My own I amness answers me. So what I assume in the mind, what I am, I have to be that. Because he doesn't judge after appearances. He judges after my own self, my own mind within me. So the moment I see myself the way I want to be, he accepts me. You can walk around your life feeling heard, feeling seen, because you are heard and seen by the only being that matters, if imagination's your Lord. But if you think it's just some silly little thing, it's just your imagination, well then that is what it's going to be to you. you know, we decide what it is to us. What I've seen is that imagination allows us the freedom to change how we see ourselves, regardless of the facts. Now that's the important part. Most of us use these teachings to change the facts and not ourselves. But when you can discover, when you discover that it is through changing the self that the facts change, then you actually do have supremacy over the facts. So you don't need to bother with them. You'll know that the moment when things are not the way I want them to be in my world, I don't freak out. I don't panic. I leave the facts, the dead facts alone. I let them, I let Caesar have them and I change myself. Am I in bondage? Well, then I'll assume that I'm free inside. And that's consciousness sees me the way I see myself. So if I see myself as free, it sees me as free and then I become free in the world. But I have to persist in it. You know, there's a story that Neville always gives of a man who, uh, the parable where the man, it was nighttime and he kept knocking on him for, for some bread in the middle of the night. And the man in the house so basically opens up and tells him to go away because it's late. But the man just keeps knocking and he tells him again to go away. But he just keeps knocking on the door. Eventually the man comes down and gives him his bread. He goes, what do you want? And he goes, well, I want a piece of bread. I'm hungry. So then he goes, okay, fine. If I give you the bread, you'll go away. Now this parable is actually really good because it speaks on persistence. That if we keep persisting in knowing that I am it and leave the facts alone, let him tell me no, let him tell me, let the guy in the house tell me all these things. But he eventually he has to come down and grant me the bread. He has to. That's basically what the story is telling us. That persistence ends with granting. So, But I don't persist in trying to become. I persist in being it in the mind. It's a big difference. And when you actually feel that you're it, not with an emotion, but an acceptance that you're it, and you persist in that acceptance, people around you, things will change. People's ideas will change around you. People will enter your life. People will leave it. But it will get you to the desired outcome that you want. So leave the facts alone. You can't go to another. 
once you once you've accepted that imagination's God, your God, your creator, that your own I amness is the creator, then you can't go to another. You can't find yourself in a going to some building and praying, expecting an answer, because you know that the one who answers is the one within ourselves. So there's nothing more freeing that I can think of as of now that knowing I can feel safe inside myself, I can and then I become safe. I can feel I can feel that I have the things I thought I lost. You know, for a long time in my life I thought I lost my faith. I thought I lost my courage inside myself. I became so afraid. I thought I lost my safety. I thought I lost all these things, my respect. I lost it all growing up. I lost everything growing up. I really did. And I lived in this, I was an, I was an emotional beggar in my world. I would, you ever see someone begging for change? Well, that was me with emotions. I would use people, I would, I'd beg for people to give me emotions, validate me, validate me. I would seek Caesar for his validation. I wanted someone to believe in me first. I would be a beggar of belief, asking people to give me faith. Believe in me first so I can believe in myself. But there is no other I can turn to. I can't go to another person. So I become more attentive to the words I speak within myself. Because the words I speak within myself have the power to free me. Those little whispers throughout the day matter. And if I can change them in a way where they are uplifting, I'll find that they do free me. So I start to validate myself. I start to feel I am the things I want to be. I don't allow Caesar to dictate me. I don't allow the person next to me to tell me no. I leave the facts alone, regardless of what they are. And I know that can be challenging. But I don't change those. I change myself. The world tells me that I'm worthless, that I lost my status, or I don't feel like an equal to people. I feel beneath them. I leave it all alone. People treat me that way. I leave it alone. And I go within myself and realize that I believed in the loss of my status. I believed in the loss of my equality. I believed in the loss of whatever it is. And I believe I have it. That's what it is. You and I have descended and we feel like we lost things but we can't lose anything that's within ourselves. So practice that every day. Going within yourself. Find what you think you lost. Find it. It's there. You know, the knock and the door will be open. Seek and you shall find. Seek what is it that you lost inside yourself. You'll find it. And the way, um, and when you find it and you grant it, consciousness will do the same. It's good. It tells you that the mind doesn't, or the consciousness doesn't, um, you know, sometimes when you ask your parent for something, they give you something else, but not the mind. The mind will give you exactly, you ask for a, a fish, it doesn't give you a snake. So I grant myself what it is I want, knowing that I'm not going to get something different. So I hope that this was more, I know that it can be quite different when it comes to Neville's spiritual talks, but I find them very freeing. I find it very um, opening, eye-opening at least, that it being said in a different way, that the reason why I'm experiencing the things I dislike is because I believe I lost. I lost the things I wanted. I lost the things I love. And so take an ideal. Take something you would love to be and fall in love with it. You can't fail. Love cannot fail. So... You fall in love with the things you want to be, just like you fell in love with being here. You and I fell in love with being this. In some sense, we are the love of our lives. So, I hope that helps, that you can't turn to another. Go within. You will be. It will fail you if you go externally to Caesar. Turn to God. Understand the spiritual things that he's good, all-giving, all-merciful, all-forgiving, and nothing cannot be forgiven. The moment you believe that you can't be forgiven, you're saying, God can't, God is not that merciful to forgive me. Or you feel like you can't be given something. 
and you don't feel worthy, but well, then imagination doesn't see me that worthy. It's like imagination became you. You and I are in complete, completely worthy because we are one with God. We, we don't have life without Him. So you and I are completely qualified. We're completely qualified to imagine what it is we want. We're completely qualified to deny the facts and assume you and I have complete um, ownership of the things within ourselves. So we don't have to feel like a beggar anymore. We can be a giver. We can be abundant in the things we want to be within ourselves. So hope that helps. I wrote this whole message up and now I'm just going to speak from my own, my own thinking. I really hate reading, um, what I wrote. I'm going to, I'm going to put it in the description though, what I wrote up, but I'm just going to speak from just bouncing off of the ideas of what I wrote. So when it comes to the law of attraction, the law of assumption, I understand the, the, the idea of it, why we would label this idea of as within, so without in the terms of law of attraction, law of assumption. But I don't think those labels actually get to the root of the issue. And in the, in the title, I wrote the law of being and the law of having. Because the law of being, to me, makes way more sense. And Neville actually wrote that in the first chapter of Your Faith is Your Fortune. He wrote, um, I am the law of being, and besides me there is no law. I am that I am. And I think the law of being gets to the root because it's about the self in man. It's about the invisible I amness, the what I'm aware of being, the awareness of being whatever it is I'm being of inside myself. So when you, when you and I decide to exercise this law, sometimes we can wonder whether or not we're assuming correctly or whether or not we're attracting things correctly. But I think the wondering, this whole wondering, this whole questioning dissolves when we see it's about being. Because you can't really question being. You will know it in the mind. You will know you are it. And if you can see that it's a law of being, um, I think that relieves us of a stress whether or not we're w wondering if whether or not we're doing it right. And if we can see that there is like no other creator but imagination, then I think we can take imagination seriously. Because I don't, I don't think that if you don't fully believe imagination's your creator, if you think there's something outside of yourself, you just simply won't take it seriously when you test it. You won't. You have to ask yourself, can you honestly proclaim that there is no other creator than imagination? If you answer yes to that, then I think you can start putting imagination to the extreme tests. Until then, I think you're going to toy with it. I think you're going to play with it, which is fine. But learn to really accept first that it's the only creator. And in, in the way I would, the way I would claim that is it creates your unsafety and your safety, your insecurity and your security, your lack of confidence and your confidence. It does both. It does both things. If you can accept it does both, you will naturally go towards what you want for yourself, which is confidence, respect and worth and all those wonderful things. So when we are inside imagination, the thing that we have, the power we have is belief. It is only through our belief in the concepts that we hold of ourselves that they become alive within ourselves. It's not that they disappear. It's not like I, the lack of confidence is gone because all things exist within me. I simply just don't have my awareness or I don't put my, my flashlight or my light towards that area inside myself. I, I simply put it towards what I would like to be. It's not that I don't hold the concepts to be an absolute monster because I can if I want to. But I can also be loving if I want to. I can be both. I can be whatever it is I want inside myself. All things are contained within me. Knowing this, then I can head towards what, I, what it is I desire. Because what I desire is within me if all things are within me. And everything within me, all my thoughts that I'm familiar with, because everybody here is familiar with certain thoughts. You and I have thoughts that we've had several times. We are familiar with them. We live psychologically in homes, in rooms we're familiar with. But many of us don't realize that we have the freedom to change those rooms. We have the freedom to change where we live. And we do that through being. We do that through changing how we see ourselves inside imagination. You don't fight thoughts. You don't fight ideas. You leave them alone. Because if you start fighting thoughts, you're fighting yourself. You created, you created a war within yourself. You're the cause of that war 
inside yourself. So what you do is you can find whatever it is you're looking for, safety, confidence. You don't necessarily have to fight or war your way to it. You can accept something new in its place. And that's where indifference comes in. You know, Neville always spoke about becoming indifferent to ideas that don't serve you. But I don't think he explained it well enough as to how to become indifferent to things. Because the way I've learned to become indifferent, the typical way is to not react to what is bad. But it's not really about that. Because I don't necessarily believe that it's about negating things. Because what I've learned over time, when I first studied the law of attraction or the law of assumption, I didn't feel free. I felt more in bondage. And the reason why I felt more in bondage was because a lot of these teachings are teaching you to negate things. They're telling you to, you know, don't feel this and don't think that and don't this and don't that. And they don't necessarily point you towards something. They're telling you what not to do, but not necessarily telling you what to do or to go or what to assume or what you should find within yourself. And it it isn't until we see that it's about going towards states and accepting new states in its place that we can find the freedom we're looking for. Because what we're looking for is a freedom of choice. Because within ourselves, we have these states that you and I feel in bondage to. We feel stuck in. We have problems inside ourselves that we feel like we can't solve. But it isn't until we see that the problem only exists through our belief in it. Not that it doesn't, you know, not that not the belief in its, in its existence, the belief that we're stuck. That's the problem. We're not stuck. There's nothing you can be stuck in and imagine it. There's no self-concept you're stuck in because that, that would claim that I am stuck. You can claim you're freed. Whatever it is you want, you don't necessarily have to know the way. The way is through I am, through the way of being free. You start being freed from the issue that you otherwise were thought you were stuck into moments ago. You've repented and changed. And, um, and I think it's important to know that um, everything within you does have a cause. Everything inside yourself. And you are that cause. So it, it doesn't hold any power over you. And um, in this world that we're in is a world of the imagination and the senses married. They're in a marriage with each other. And, but the change first happens in imagination. The change must first happen within to see the change in the senses. And um, I think that once we, f- once we can see that imagination does both things, that it makes me feel unsafe and it makes me feel safe, that I can use it for both, then I think you can find a freedom within yourself that you'll realize that it creates the wars inside me, the fighting, and it creates the peace. It does both. I can use it for both. I think that when you accept the both, the duality of those things comes from one source. That's when true freedom can start. I'm not saying that you need to be like perfect um, right away. But what you can do is when you see it comes from both the both, uh, the, your anxiety that you're feeling, it's stemming from the same place that your peace comes from. Then I think you will naturally start choosing peace. You can still choose anxiety if you want to, but once you start to see the cause of it, it's very hard to continue choosing it because usually you'll feel anxious because you think something outside of you is happening. You think something is imposing itself upon you and there's nothing you can do about it, that you have no control inside yourself. That's why you're more most likely scared. But your feelings of uncontrolled, uh, being uncontrolled and feeling like you lost it also stems from the feelings that you have it. Like I said in my last video, We've believed in the loss of our control in our world, a loss of our safety, a loss of our respect. And I am, uh, I'm someone who's experienced, um, true loss in those things. I know what it's like to feel like you've lost respect and you've lost your confidence and you lost your worth because worth is the belief that sustains the loss in other things because you can believe you lost your confidence and you can believe you're unworthy to have confidence, which sustains the belief in that lack of confidence. So um, from experience, I know what it's like to have everything against you, to have the conversations you you have with people against you, to have um, the senses against you, to have your neighbors against you. I know what it's like to have people against you in the, in conversations while you're trying to assume something new. I know the feelings of even those who are supposed to love you, against you. I know what it's like to have opposition in the world. But regardless of the opposition in the world of Caesar, 
eventually it must obey imagination. It has to. Because it's not the senses that are in control. It's imagination that it's mimicking the senses, or the senses are mimicking imagination. And once we can see that imagination is the creator, I don't have to put my belief, that power I have inside myself, into the uh, the words of others. Um, I don't have to believe in what they say. I can believe in what I say about myself, inside myself. So I start to trust and believe in imagination. And I... Um, I'm fully aware of the difficulty in that sometimes. But what you, if you're having difficulty with accepting imagination, um, learn to practice that at nighttime. Before you fall asleep, truly, truly accept. Maybe you're falling asleep tonight and you feel anxiety or you feel unsafe or you feel whatever it is, paranoid. Understand truly on a deep level before you go to assume anything. You go to, you know, do you, whatever it is you're going to do. Before you do anything, accept the, that the creator of that paranoia, of that anxiety, stems from imagination, which is the same source of the freedom, of that nobody's watching you, of that, um, of that safety, of whatever it is, of the confidence, the security that you seek. There's only one creator here. There is no other. That can help you tremendously in accepting the new ideas inside yourself, that they're all ideas stem from one place. And all it takes is your belief inside yourself um, because these ideas are inside you. And that's where desire dwells and that's where fulfillment dwells. So both dwell there. And you can live however you want inside yourself. You can live in desire or in fulfillment. You can fall asleep tonight truly feeling that all your needs are met. And by needs, I'm not saying um, water and shelter. I mean those little desires. The desires that nobody knows about. Those tiny little things that nobody is that only imagination would know. And then you can start to have an intimate relationship with your imagination that it knows the small things you want. And when I have felt that I have those small things, they truly <laughs> arise in my world. And to me, that's what I live for. I live for those small things. I love the big imagination. I love the big things that happen and they're, they're quite, you know, surprising, but I love the small imagine, the small things I've imagined it and I get them. I feel like I truly feel intimate with myself. So. Um, I want to stress that you don't fight thoughts. You don't fight anything because you started the fight within yourself. You learn to accept something new in its place. And there's a, there's a scripture that really goes well with this that I've, um, I have a little notebook I write down every day, uh, things. And, um, it's in Isaiah and it says, do not remember the past events. Pay no attention of things of old. I am creating something new. There it is. Do you see it? And that's, that's the Lord speaking. He says, I am creating something new. There it is. Do you see it? And he says, I put roads in the desert. I, it's, it's the idea that imagination will find the way. It can put a road in a desert if it wants to, to get to the destination, to get you to the destination it needs to get you to. And it says, I create something new. Do you see it? So you and I can mimic that being and create something new in its place inside ourselves instead of accepting what we've already accepted. We've already experienced the full experience of the states we're in. So why don't we accept something new in its place? And we accept it by believing we have it or are it, whatever it is you want to do. Um, I find it easier to accept that I have the confidence I was once seeking, that I thought I lost. I think it's easier to accept that I have it now. Um, I don't necessarily do scenes all the time. You don't have to. I have found it's easier to accept that you're wealthier tonight than you were yesterday. Why not? Accept that you're more confident, you're more respected, you're more listened to. I mean, I grew up not being listened to, and now a bunch of people listen to me. It, it doesn't really, I mean, it's, it's wonderful, don't get me wrong, but it's just a state. We're in a world of states, and everything comes down to its one source, which is imagination. So don't be ashamed to accept something wonderful within yourself, because it's all coming from one place. That shitty idea you have about yourself is stemming from the, the greatness inside yourself. It's all there. It's up to you to where you want to go within yourself. It's up to you. You're truly your own problem inside imagination because you're the only one who's there. The name is I am. And I am is a, itself. It's directed towards the self. It's what are you being inside yourself? And, um, yeah, and whether you like it or not, you are accepting things. And so you have to ask yourself, do I like what I'm accepting within? If not, 
then change. You are allowed to. You are allowed to do whatever you want inside yourself. You're allowed to change. You're allowed to repentance, that gift. So you either have it or you don't, but you can have it. That's, that's the wonderful news of Neville's that you can have it within yourself. Don't worry about the senses so much. Don't worry about the senses. First, try to change imagination. First, focus on the change inside. If you can really, really hone in on that, you will find the senses changing faster than you would think. There was a long time where I wasn't seeing progress because I was so anxious on the change and I was so observant of the change outside of me that I really, I didn't realize that I I truly did not change inside myself. It wasn't until I started to believe I had things inside myself, whatever it was, that I saw the change instantly outside of myself. I mean, within a couple of days, I saw it. So take it from me as somebody who who I've said, I've experienced a dark world. I know exactly what it's like to look at people inside myself and see people who attack me, to to, to see strangers, see people who have weapons against me, to see I'm warring within myself, feel like no one has sympathy for me, no one cares for me, no one loves me, no one respects me, no one wants me. I know exactly what that feels like to a a pretty extreme degree. I would never lie about such a thing. But knowing that I created that world inside myself, that it has a cause and that causes me and that, and that it's mimicking the concepts I hold of myself, that the, the nature of my mind is in alignment with the nature of my self concepts, then I don't need to uh, necessarily fight my world anymore. I can just change how I see myself and that change in that nature will result in a change. Uh, it'll be in harmony, um, in the change of that new nature of new thoughts from that position. So I have new ideas. I'll have, I do, you don't have to, necessarily uh, become smart, you can just start to assume you're more intelligent. It's the same way with money. It's the same way with with any. You don't necessarily have to know. You can start to believe you have. That's more important. And that's what actually scripture supports. It's that believe you have it and you will. Not believe you or whatever it is you're thinking, to question it or you know doubt it. You don't have to do anything. You just believe you have it. So we don't we don't we learn to not argue with ourselves we learn to not doubt ourselves, but we learn to accept something new in its place. And, and, and you'll see it. There it is. And you ask yourself, do you see it? Do you see the change? You can't deny it. If you imagine something new with yourself, within yourself, you'll see it. You will see it. You can't deny it. You can't deny you already are what you want to be within yourself. You just can't. So I hope that helps. You don't have to fear imagination. You don't have to be afraid of using it. You don't have to feel guilty of changing yourself. And you don't have to feel in unworthy to accept something new within yourself. You truly don't. And uh, I was going to make a video on the belief, uh, believing in the implication of the scene and not the scene itself. But I'm going to change that right now. Because what I want to do instead is I want to talk about certain thoughts that Neville has given that are very in, my, very, in my opinion, they're very redemptive. And I hope they redeem you. I hope that you feel redeemed after this. In some sense, you feel redeemed. And, <clears throat> you know, when it comes to Neville's work, if you take what he says seriously and you don't analyze it so much, you just first accept it and test it before you start to judge it you'll find that it's extremely redemptive work. And I'm going to read some of Neville right now, and I hope that, you know, I'm going to explain my own view on it. But just listen to these words carefully. And this is Neville speaking now. He said, So if you're here for the first time tonight, just let me address you personally, as though you've never heard it before. It doesn't matter what you've ever done. You may have been cruel. You may have been a thief. You might, this very night, be running away from some deed. I will say you're forgiven. Believe now in God. God is your own wonderful human imagination. And with Him, all things are possible. So regardless of what your background may have been, regardless of what you're doing now, Have an object, 
have a desire, a consuming desire. Believe in the infinite wisdom and power of a presence that is in you and believe that presence to be your imagination. Don't argue the point. You carry the request to this one within you as though you say, is it all right for me to have this? He will invariably say, yes, it is done. Invariably. He doesn't argue. He doesn't point to your background. He doesn't point to any restrictions of the past. He played those parts. So whatever you want, go to Him. Commune with Him. Bring it to Him as though it were done. Is it done? And get confirmation from this deeper self. Yes, it is done. And then drop it. Your conscious reasoning mind reaches the depth necessary to set in motion all the causes necessary to bring it to pass in this world. So let's talk about that. When Neville says to drop it, he means to not argue the point anymore. Stop questioning whether or not you, did I really move states? Did I really, uh, was I successful in my imagining, in, in imagining? Was I successful in my feeling? You don't worry about any of those things. You simply redeem yourself. Remember, God's name is I am. And that means that his name is a present tense feeling of being. So don't care really what happened yesterday. Imagination is, is the creator of this world. Because if you point to something outside of you and you wonder what created it and you don't credit it to imagination, well, then you have two gods. You have three gods, four gods. The next thing you know, you're going to have 16 gods and then you're not going to know who to pray to. But if you see Neville's work as he's pointing to you to something within you as the cause, well, then that's all I have to change. And if the cause is I am, then I can't point to my background as a reason to stop me. Because God's name is I am. It's a present tense. So, for example, suppose I wanted to be loved. You know, let's quote D.H. Lawrence. And he said, and Neville always quoted this. He always said, um, the loveless never find love. Only the loving find love and they never have to seek for it. But that can be said for anything, not just love. But what the point of that quote is trying to tell you is that the people who are loveless manifest their own lovelessness. And as those who are loved manifest their own love in the world. And that can be said for any state. But we'll use love in this case. You ask yourself inside as though you're speaking to two people. It's really just one, truly, in the end. But you ask, am I allowed to be loved? Can I have it? Yes, it's the only answer that can give is yes. Only you can truly deny yourself inside. All sabotage is self-sabotage inside. And the wonderful thing is that you don't have to. And I, and remember, it's self-sabotage. It's self-concept. The self always remains. What you do with yourself is up to you. How you speak with your, it's your self-talk. Self is always remaining. What you do inside is up to you. You don't have to have permission from me or permission from Neville or any other person in this world. You really don't. You are allowed to imagine anything you desire. Up to you. How you wish to use your imagination is up to you. And you don't have to be afraid to use it. You don't have to feel scared to assume something. I know the feeling of being afraid to assume something that's kind of big for yourself. Maybe you, maybe you are somebody who has assumed something very low of yourself and you've done this for so long that you feel, you feel that thinking something greater than of yourself seems like an impossibility. I can give you some experience. My own experience is that when I would assume something good for myself, and I would ease into that, and I would yield, as Neville would say. I wouldn't question or argue. I just would accept it. I noticed within me, my heart rate would increase like drastically. My gut would feel tense. I'd be really concerned and worried, like almost like I'm not allowed to have this. But what I learned was that everything that's within me is mine. Everything within me. Whose else is it? I can't, I can't think of anybody else's. It is. I'm allowed 
to assume anything I please. The most beautiful thing, though, is that it's a present tense assumption. It's not about going to the future. It's about assuming that you are something now. That's the redemption part of it. You don't have to figure it out. I can't figure it out, to be honest with you. I've had manifestations happen to me where I, I literally could have never thought that that person would be involved and that person would talk to that person. I just would have never thought about it. So I don't ever think about it anymore because I, I can't figure it out. So all I do is try to accept that I am something without arguing with myself. It's kind of funny, but it's true. We argue with ourselves about something we want. <laughs> so let's go to another quote real quick. And Neville says this, and this is to, to just keep continuing on the idea of not analyzing. He says this, so don't try to analyze it. Leave it just where it is. It will happen in a way you would never suspect. I could tell you unnumbered stories to support this simple, simple tale. But if you labor to the point and you think you must know this party, must know that party, that and the other, well, then you don't trust God. On this level, you can do nothing but ask, believing you have received and you will receive. As told us in the book of Mark, whatever you ask in prayer, believe you have received it and you will. Whatever includes everything. You just ask. I give you a little warning. Always ask in love. Always. Whenever you ask for another, make sure it is something you wouldn't mind receiving for yourself. If I'm quite willing to accept it for myself, I can ask it for another. If it is something I wouldn't want, it's distasteful. Don't ask it for another. Now, what Neville's saying here is that the idea, and I've been there, I mean, I think we all have been there, is that you think you must know somebody and must know this and must know, they will come. People come right into your frame, right into what you've imagined. And it's truly up to you to decide who you wish to imply you are with your thoughts inside yourself. It's about the implication of the thought. You, you create, okay, when Neville says to create a scene, and I've been there as well where I've tried to make the scene perfect. It's not about making the scene perfect. It's about what the scene implies about you. It's all about you. It's all about you. So it's what it implies about you. So I don't care what exactly you did five years ago, 10 years ago. It doesn't really matter in imagination. Truly, it doesn't matter. I'm just going to tell you that. Just trust me on that. It doesn't really matter. What matters is what you are um, implying with your new thoughts. What are you implying about yourself? Because if you can believe in that implication of the scene, what you're doing is you're not meddling with the how. You're just, if you imagine being loved and receiving love, that must imply you are loved. So you accept that implication. You don't try to fight it. You just accept, well, then I'm, I must be loved if I feel that I'm loved. I must be loved if I'm receiving it in my mind. The inner man is what I'm speaking about. Inside yourself, what you receive naturally is a direct reflection of what you think you are inside. This isn't necessarily deep. It's, it's kind of obvious if you just pay attention. If you just pay attention to the nature of your thoughts, you'll see they're directly in correlation with the way you think of yourself. So if you can think of yourself in a way that you would like, you will have thoughts that you like. You don't necessarily have to do anything. Just accept, believe you have received the self-concept you want about yourself. Believe you have it. Try it. All you have to do is just try it for a little bit. I know it can be scary to assume something new about yourself. I know that you might not feel worthy enough to accept it, but it's inside of you. You're worthy of everything inside of yourself. It's in you for a reason. I don't know what isn't in the imagination. You can imagine anything. You can, as Neville says, lock me in a dungeon. I can imagine. So it doesn't, don't have to worry about men. And you don't have to worry about man at all. You just assume it anyways. Forget what they say. It doesn't really matter. It doesn't matter to God. 
God doesn't look to what people say or to your past or to um, anything that you you otherwise are looking. He doesn't judge after appearances. <laughs> That's the wonderful thing that the Bible tries to get across. So let's continue. This is another uh, paragraph I want to read. He says, So I will call with his name. Well, do I say, Oh dear I am, make me rich. No. I say I am rich. Do I say, Oh, I am, make me known? No, I say I am known. Where were I known, how would the world see me? Well, then I walk as though they did, just as though they did, if that's my desire. It's my desire to be, and you name it. Well, then call with the name by assuming that you are it. That is walking in the name, just as though it were true. Walking as though it were true, you are imitating God who calls all things that are not seen as though they were seen, and then the unseen becomes seen. So I I ask everyone to simply apply it. Just apply it. Don't judge it and criticize it and condemn it before you test it. That's stupid. No scientist would demand proof before he is willing to make an experiment. All right, so make the experiment. And if there is evidence for it after you've made the experiment, what does it really matter what the world thinks? So, you won't ever really regret assuming you are or have something now. It's something I've learned over time. You will never regret assuming you are a state greater than what you are now. You will never regret it. I've never regretted it. I actually regret when I stay in the same state that I don't want to be. <laughs> I regret when I'm afraid. And there's nothing to fear inside of you. And something that I found so wonderful that Abdullah said is that when you start to use the law, he says you will become normal. He told Neville that he was crazy for not using it. Like, you're crazy for not, for all these rules you've put on upon yourself. You used to look crazy. And I understand what he's saying now. You gave yourself all these worries and quibbles and rules that you have to follow yourself. You haven't freed yourself at all on any level. And, he says, when you start testing this this law and you'll see it works, well, then you will start to assume that you have the things you want, regardless of the senses. So, I guess the point I'm trying to make is you don't have to feel restricted inside yourself, regardless of what the senses may tell you. You may You might hear the opposite of what you want tonight. But regardless, the imagination doesn't judge after the appearance. So you assume it anyways. That's what I would tell you. Just try it. And you persist. Persist in that assumption about yourself. And that's what it means to walk by faith, not by sight. It's easy to walk by faith. We can all, I mean, sorry, it's easy to walk by sight. We all can just judge by our eyes. That's simple. But to walk by faith is another thing. It's to, can I assume that I am something and walk as though I am it? You don't have to do anything physically. You just have to become it in the mind. Just try it and see what results you get. If you don't get results, well, then discard everything I've ever said. But I believe you will get results. I've gotten results. I have, tons of people have gotten results. It's just simply a change in your consciousness that results a change in your life. And I think that's kind of reasonable. But if you try it, you'll see that I won't say, as Neville said, you won't you won't necessarily be ashamed, but you will see how low you've actually thought of yourself, what you have been accepting, and that's okay. It's okay that you might have not accepted. I mean, I don't know who does, so I don't think you necessarily. Everyone's as it says in Bible, everyone's fallen short from their glory, so I don't think it really matters. Uh, there's no need to get on yourself for not assuming the greatest things about yourself. You might have been scared, and that's okay. Everyone's scared. This, this is, this whole life is scary. But what we have is that we can utilize this imagination inside of ourselves. You don't have to fear using it. So as if you're like me who is afraid to do something greater, uh, don't be so concerned. Uh, what I was concerned with was, well, how would it happen? I don't want to, you know, step on anyone's toes. I don't want to hurt anybody. I don't want this, that, or the other, or I don't want to be hurt, or I don't, I, you know, I'd become, I'd come up with all these reasons as to why. And I would never truly accept it within myself. But once I was, as Neville said, I stopped analyzing it and accepted it as though it were so. 
I believed in the impl- what my scene implied or what my thought implied th- or what my feeling implied. Well, then that must be it. And I don't question it anymore. And then my life reflects that. It's incredible. But I was so focused on trying to create the perfect scene instead of actually accepting what the scene implied in the first place, which is about myself. It's about the change within yourself. So all movement is actually within. We move inside ourselves into who we want to be. Forget the world for a second. When you imagine, imagine as if there's no external world. Just, a, just It's just you and your imagination. Just a very intimate um, communion with yourself. So I hope this helps you feel, feel more redeemed. That you don't feel that the imagination doesn't look to anything outside of you. It always says yes. It always says yes. As Neville says, it, invariably, it will say it because because he played those parts. There's only one being here named I am, and it plays all the parts. So if you wish to change, it will allow it always. So I want to read this one more time, um, and then I'll end this. Because Neville says this, regardless of what your background might have been, regardless of what you're doing now, have a, have a burning desire. And he says, believe in your imagination and don't argue the point. It doesn't matter what you've ever done. You might have been cruel. You might have been a thief. You might this very night be running from some deed. I will say you are forgiven. So, I think that will help. I hope that the understanding in this video allows you to be more generous and giving towards yourself. And I'm going to explain a couple of things that Neville has spoken about. And when it comes to, you know, everyone is you pushed out, he often speaks about this. And that has to go hand in hand with the idea that God plays all the parts. Now, God in this case is the awareness in man, the I am or the consciousness or the I, you know, the sense of self. Because one would say, I am John, and I am Jane, and I am Edward. But before that, we say, I am. So I am truly is the thing that works in harmony with itself. And when you assume something, you would claim, I am whatever, then things you know reshuffle themselves, and it plays its part. God plays the part to receive the new I am that you have uh, taken. And it's a, it's, a, it's a statement inside the mind. It's a way of being inside the mind. That's what you're claiming. It's not um, an emotion you're seeking or a thought. It's a sense of self that you're seeking, a sense of being. And when you hear that God plays all the parts, you don't have to become afraid. There's only one being here. So for a long time... I felt unsafe in my world. I felt truly unsafe inside myself. And I would assume safety, but I didn't quite see how it would come into play. But once I saw that it's one being that plays all the parts, once you assume safety, you assume respect, you assume, you start to imply these things inside yourself. So the idea in this case, a very simple illustration I can give you is that right now I'm speaking on this microphone. But I'm implying while I speak that I'm being listened to. I don't feel insecure that I wonder if someone is listening to me. I wonder if they're taking me seriously. I just imply it while I talk. So you imply these things inside yourself. And I want this, what I'm about to say, to be one of the most um, thoughtful and how should I say, important things I'm going to say. And it's this. The things that you want from other people are actually the things you want to give yourself. Because there's only one being here called I am. So for a long time, and I think everyone's done this at certain points, We'd seek the world to give us a certain, uh, maybe to make us, 
we want the world to see us as brilliant or we want someone in our life to love us and see us as a, a kind and caring person or we want somebody to see us as excellent or whatever it is, as capable. Um, we want others to first see our confidence before we assume it within ourselves. And really think about the things you want from other people, what you want them to give you. Because Neville says this, he says to change the conceptions of yourself before you change others, um, because they're only messengers revealing to you what you're assuming within. Now, if you take that statement seriously, what it's telling you is that if you're seeking for other people to see you as whatever it is, that is actually how you desire to see yourself. But you've put a condition upon it, which is this other person has to see you that, that first. It's almost like you need someone to believe in you before you can believe in yourself. And that right there, if you can understand what's being said here, you will be freed in such a way where you're going to realize that you've abandoned so many, so many times of yourself to other, to this thing called another person that they must first, whatever, before I can. And that's a condition. You are allowed to see yourself as brilliant if you want. You don't need someone to first see you as attractive for you to assume attractiveness. These are things that are all within you. And then you learn to accept yourself and yourself contains everything. So I take acceptance of the self in a different route and you can accept yourself in the moment, um, except that maybe you see yourself in a lowly fashion and you can um, create a new you know, outfit in the mind and you can try on. But you also need to learn to accept yourself as the whole being that you are, that you contain everything inside, that you contain the lack thereof in confidence and you contain the abundance in it as well, that you contain both. So you learn to accept both inside you, accept everything inside you, that if, if Neville's right, all things are contained within you, test that, test it out. See if you have the opposite of the thing that you otherwise are not desiring. Maybe you feel unloved. But the idea of being loved also exists within you. And you learn to accept that part as well. You've already accepted the one side. Might as well accept the other. So you practice every day learning to accept. It's just a practice of acceptance. You don't necessarily have to um, fight your thoughts, as I always say. Learn to accept new ones in its place. You learn to accept new things inside yourself. And that's all you're doing. And you don't put conditions upon it. Because the reason why you put conditions upon yourself is because you were taught to. Someone taught you that in order to love yourself, it must be conditional. Someone taught you that love is this conditional thing that towards yourself, if you don't uh, accomplish X, Y, and Z first, then you can't love yourself. If you don't have others loving you first, you can't love yourself. If you have to have everyone like you first before you can like yourself. All of these conditions. But if you can see that the things you want from another is the thing you actually want to give yourself, then you won't rely on others. You will feel self-sufficient. And then you can give that version of yourself to the world. And then you become more of a giving person because you feel abundant inside. It's only those who feel what they need to take feel lack. That's the only reason. It's not that they actually are lacking. Nobody's lacking. It's just in different states of mind that maybe they have believed in the lack or the loss of their whatever it is that they desired. But you can see that you are allowed to give yourself the very thing you want another to give you. Then I really think you will find a deep, deep sense of peace and freedom from that. And then the, the, those, you know, since there's only one being here, that change in attitude of the self results in a change in the outer world because there's only, because God plays all the parts. God does it all. And by God, I mean the, the I am inside. So you learn to deny the senses. You learn to stop for a second. Maybe the outer world is chaotic. You learn to not be disturbed for a moment at a time. And you enter inside yourself. You really feel like almost you're opening a door inside you. Enter it. Feel safe that you've entered into your, your internal home. 
and feel yourself to be a sense of uh, feel yourself to be a person inside a sense of being that is behind the mask that we all wear behind the garment that we all this fleshly garment that we all wear feel that you've entered inside and almost put a smile on your face and assume something new about yourself regardless of the senses it doesn't have to be this difficult thing where you have to loop your scene a million times you're allowed to just assume something new now whether you persist in that new change is up to you whether you keep it because it's yours or you you let go of it and drop it it's up to you but learn to realize that or pay attention to what you want from other people it's the things you want to give yourself you want other people to praise you and compliment you in a very specific way which is fine but that's actually what you want to do for yourself. That's how you want to see yourself. So it's a very good indicator that how would I feel if others did see me this way? You might get a feeling, how would I feel if others saw me as brilliant? How would I feel if I was seen in that light? And then you'll start to feel it. But remove them for a second and start to see yourself that way without conditions. Give yourself that feeling without conditions. Don't reason with it. Uh, don't fear it. Don't wonder if it's going to last or if it's going to go away. You just feel it. Just experience it or play with it or entertain yourself with it or just sit with it. You don't have to do anything. You know, Neville always says to not lift a finger. So you learn to not lift that finger. You learn to just rest in that new way of seeing yourself without conditions. I cannot stress that enough. One of the biggest conditions that we place upon ourselves that we first must have someone to love us first or we must have someone to whatever it is first before we can give ourselves what we want. And as you know, D.H. Lawrence says that the loveless never find love. They only make manifest their own lovelessness. Only the loving find love and they never have to seek for it. If that's the case, then... I can't go to another to give me what I want because they're only messengers because God's playing all the parts. So I go inside myself and I change, if you want to say God, or I change myself um, to whatever it is I am desiring from other people. That's how you figure out what you want. Look to see what you want other people to see you as. And don't be ashamed of it. Do not be ashamed. Everyone wants something in this world. So don't be ashamed. Don't feel that it's embarrassing that you want to be seen as X, Y, and Z. Uh, first see yourself that way. You know, Neville says, don't, you don't break the mirror to try to change the person in the mirror. That doesn't make sense. You don't, um, in that sense, he's trying to say that prayer is the answer to, to avoid the conflict in life. And he also says something so specific that I think is necessary to understand is he says not to wait for life to become chaotic before you pray. And prayer in this sense is to imagine that you have or that you are whatever it is you want. He says to not wait until life becomes too much, that to imagine before, that to assume before and wake up in the morning and assume something for you, believe you have something, whatever it is, feel that you have it imply it in the mind that you have it and believe in that implication and again the example i give is walk, walk as though you know where you're going talk as though everyone's listening start to imply these things um, act as though you're respected feel that inside maybe you don't have to do anything physically just in imagination do it that's who you need to change is the inner man because that's who you are that's who you change you go inward and you change how you are in there Chances are you're having nightmares. Chances are you're thinking those thoughts are independent of you, that they have the power of their own. Chances are you might feel that they're imposing themselves upon you. Chances are you're feeling that there's no control. Now, if you feel like you have no control inside your mind, it's because you, the inner man, the inner man inside, feels that they lost that. If you feel poor inside, it's because you feel like you lost your wealth inside. If you feel like you um, are, you know, or being overpowered by thoughts is because you feel powerless. You are assuming these things about yourself inside. And you don't need another. You don't need this. You don't need a sense to reflect back to you. First, you can change inside. You can will it to be so inside. 
So you, you remember or you uh, realize you forgot you were powerful. You remember that you are or you uh, thought you lost your power, but you actually never lost it to begin with. You just thought you did. So you learn to start to become more abundant inside. You start to imply things inside. You don't imagine t for it to be so. You imagine it being so. That's the difference. You imagine it being so. That's, what, that's why Neville says you want to imply it is so. Find something that implies it or a feeling that implies it. It's not to imagine so it can become so. You imagine it being so. And if you don't know what you want, which I've struggled with for so long, figure out the things you want from other people. What do you want them to see you as? What do you want from them? Stop asking them to give it to you and give it to yourself. You don't need them. And then all of a sudden, your world will reflect that new state. And then you'll see how this works. You will see how this works. You'll start to give yourself what you want and you'll feel so much confidence in your daytime. You'll walk, naturally your shoulders will go back, your head will come up. You don't have to do anything physically. It just will happen. And then those will feel that energy you have that you're pushing out and they'll respond to it. Because there's only one being here. I know the difference. I grew up in a way where I was totally disrespected. And I grew up as an adult to become disrespected. I felt, I've, I've witnessed this, where I, there's been times where I've assumed respect, I've assumed confidence, and then in my world it just happens. And then, give it two months, I fall back and I feel low again, I feel disrespected, I feel like I'm not going to be seen as uh, important, and then nobody does. So I know it works for both. But it's not really both. It's just working imagination. It's just working the only thing that's here. We kind of make it a, a dual thing to make sense to us, but in reality, it's just one thing being worked. It's, you know, we're just exercising this law and learn to exercise it daily. That's what Neville's saying. Don't wait until something in your life becomes too hectic. Exercise this all the time. You don't, it doesn't take long. You just have to, just assume you have something. Walk in your daytime. Uh, assume they have something. It's just because it's just yourself. It's just one being here. So assume that your friend has what they want. Assume that your uh, love has what they want. But um, I hope that this has shown you a new way that of learning to not desire, not by suppressing it, but by fulfilling it. So there's this quote that um, Neville says. He says. Man is always looking at his world and asking, what needs to be done? What will happen? When he should ask himself instead, who am I? What is the current concept of myself? And you could take that a step further. We will label others and we'll say they are this. And we will label everything under the sun. But really the question that matters is, who am I? Who do I think I am? Who do I feel to be? Or what do I feel to be? These are more important questions than pointing the finger or thinking about, is it impossible or not? Thinking about what will happen. None of these questions really matter. Because your past that you experienced was at one point an imaginal future. And that imaginal future was dictated by your conception of yourself. So if you wish to have a better past and to have a future to look forward to, you must change your current conception. There's no other way. And if there is no other God you can turn to, you can't go to a church anymore. You can't go to a neighbor. There's only one being who can do it. And that being's inside. Then I go inward, and I change who I am there. But the I that I'm saying is the inner man, the man of the spirit. That's what I mean. And, you know, for a long time, I have judged myself into oblivion. I have been very judgmental on myself and thinking that other people were doing that to me. But really what is done to me inside myself, I'm doing to myself. So if I think others are judging me, it's because I'm judging me. That's how this works. And what the realization I came to through Neville's work 
is that we must realize the nature of imagination of our mind so that we can live in it. Nobody wants to live in a house that's chaotic and filled with abuse. Everybody wants to leave that home. Well, is your inner mind like a house that's filled with abuse? Then you'll most likely not want to spend time in it. You most likely want to leave it. And sure, maybe that you were imprinted with this blueprint, this map inside yourself that when you, you should get down on yourself when you do this and you should um, shame yourself when you do that and all these judgments and you live in this imprisonment and you feel imprison a prisoner to your body. You feel like you want to leave because inside it's abusive. It's a bad home to be in. But what Neville's trying to show us is that we're much more than these physical beings. You know, I've had dreams where I have felt the tile. I have felt the walls, the textures. I've even felt flesh inside my dreams. So inside myself, I have felt flesh. So this imagination in me is the creator of flesh. Or consciousness, whatever you want to say, it can create the flesh. That's actually what, it's, what this is. This is the spirit becoming flesh. But that's not really the point I'm trying to get at. The point is, is that I want you to start seeing reality for a second through the inner man's eyes, or the man of the spirit's eyes, instead of the man of the senses. The man of the senses, you can look through the eyes and you will see objects and walls and all these things. But the man of the spirit doesn't see the same thing. To the man of the spirit, he sees the past and it, it's present in front of him. And he can re-experience it. He can relive it. And the conclusions I've come to is that regarding fear, let's say you're afraid of imagining something. The idea that you're afraid, it means you already experienced the thing you're afraid of. So you already survived the thing you're afraid of. So everything you're afraid of inside yourself is already something you experienced. You're actually just afraid to re-experience it. And you might um, keep imagining things you don't want to happen. But they actually already happened at one point. That's why you're afraid to re-experience it. But as Neville says, the question isn't, how should I change this? How should, what should I, um, what will happen from this? I just imagine something fearful. Oh no, what's going to come? Who am I? Am I safe? What am I? These are the questions we should ask ourselves instead. And we should start to see imagination differently. And I hope that, you know, this, I'm going to say sort of a mantra or sort of a, a certain phrases I might explain if I have to. Um, but try to see the, through the eyes of the inner man when I speak. And I'm going to use the terms in here, meaning the inner world of imagination inside yourself when I say these phrases. In here, there is no judgment. You know, I used to always feel I was being judged in life, and I didn't realize that it was me judging myself so harshly. And I had to see that inside myself, there really is no judgment. You don't, I used to feel like I couldn't give myself a certain desire because I wasn't worthy of it. I was judging myself unworthy. But there is no judgment in imagination. It's, it's always willing. It tells us that, that it didn't come to judge the world, but to save it. So it's more of a, it's a saving um, being instead of a judging one. So you feel inside yourself that in here, there is no judgment. It's a fact. You can feel that. And you might be someone carrying a lot of burdens. You might feel heavy. But in here, there are no burdens. To the inner man, there's no burdens. And once you start to associate yourself with that being, that in here, you do not need anyone's permission to feel or to think or to have. You don't need anyone's permission in here. In here, the past can be changed. Don't ask, well, what will that do? Or what will happen if I do change it? Just go back and do the thing you wish you would have done. 
you the man of the spirit. Go back, maybe you said something unkind at one point and your mind keeps thinking about it. Go back and fix that. Do the right thing. Say what you wanted to say. Revise it. Don't ask, well, what will it do? Simply change imagination. And in here, the future can be is alterable. It can be altered. It can be changed. And you have the power to do so. You're not stuck. You don't have to have an oncoming collision happen. You can change the steering wheel, if you will, and go a different direction. Don't ask yourself anymore. Quite just accept this. Because it's true. In here, there are no abusers. There's no one who has power over you in here. You're not powerless. It's true. Feel that, that in here, I am powerful. In here, I have control. Anything I'm desiring, I actually have it. In here, I'm heard. And in here, I'm seen. You know, we place these conditions that if I want to be respected or to be seen, I must become super famous and super rich and then I'll finally be respected. These are conditions. There's no conditions in here. You can feel heard. You can feel seen. You are. You're always being listened to inside. So you can see where I'm going with this. Is that in here... You don't have to continue the rules given to you by the framework of this, of the sense man. You can discard all of those things. In here, you don't need a reason why you want to feel something. No reasons necessary. No human reasoning is necessary. In here, you're safe. The man of the spirit. Don't go to the, if you start leaving, um, what I'm saying, you start going outward. You'll say, well, this is not true. I am un unsafe. Yes, you might be unsafe. Your outer man might be unsafe. You might feel unsafe. But in here, you are safe. And what you will start to realize is that you actually are the being that is safe. You just keep associating yourself with this outer man. And all I'm trying to ask you to do is just see through the eyes of the inner man. Don't try to believe something. Don't force yourself into belief or don't try to... um do anything other than see through their lens that the past and the future are these present realities to them that they can be changed that the present can be changed that i can be what i want in here i don't need permission i can't go to another man because there's no other god in here i'm the one doing it all i'm the one creating all my in here i create my suffering and in here I create my pleasure, my joy. I do both in here. And you keep resting and you'll realize that there are no burdens in here. There's nothing I need to do in here. I merely accept. So you should be in a very, I, I would say, in a very relaxed state once you start to understand what I'm saying. Because... Everything you're fearing, you will realize is being created by you inside yourself. And you might ask, well, um, I just thought of something scary. I don't want it to happen. Remember, you can't go to another God. Some people will feel afraid and then they go to someone to solve this fear. I'm not saying you can't. Um, I don't want to tell you what to do, but... Just realize that the fear is stemming from a source. And that source is you. And when you take responsibility that you truly create the terrors inside you, those nightmares are created by you. That responsibility will cause you to have power over it. It's not a bad thing to feel that you are the cause of these things. I'm not saying that Everything I do is perfect now because I realize this, but it's a practice that I do. It is something that I practice often as I feel that in here, you know, the, um, imagination is the 
the one who cleanses the temple, if you will. And if I'm the temple, then it's going to cleanse me from all these false ideas, all these prejudices, all these conditions, all these judgments, criticism and critiques that I do upon myself. It cleanses these things. It saves me from them, from my jealousy, from my rage. It shows me that these things that I'm holding on to are I'm living in sin inside. It saves me from that sin. It's a good thing. So the point I'm trying to make is that our minds can sometimes feel like it's just casting more burdens onto us. It's stoning us, if you will. But it's because I think that that nature of the mind where it's very judgmental, it's harsh, it's critical, it's mean. This was at one point I feel given to me. I was taught to do this to myself. But the more I study Neville, I see that the imagination is actually the opposite. I guess it can be mean if you decide it for that to be mean. But when you really think about it, it's non-judgmental. It'll give you what you want inside. You can give yourself what you want inside. So before, you know, right when you go down that path of this is impossible, there's no point in doing this, I don't know what's going to come from this, what will happen, what, it, what needs to be done, as Neville says, go back to the self. Remember, it's self persuasion. You don't have to persuade and convince other people. You persuade yourself that you are. The inner man, the man of the spirit, persuades himself that he is. Well, how do I do that? Well, if I go inside my imagination and I start to change it and I start to have people tell me that I'm this thing, I start to see it in my, in my um, mind, then I, the inner man, must be that. I can't deny it. I'm the one doing it all, yes, but I also do the opposite. I could also have people tell me they hate me, they dislike me, and that I'm this negative thing. I could do both. So always try to go back to the self. Um, and the self is within. And see through the eye, eyes of the inner man. And change and revise the past, no matter what it is. At one point, that past was imaginary. Because I've, I have altered my future. And that has become my past. And that's how it's always been. Maybe when you were younger, you didn't know. Uh, no need to shame yourself or condemn yourself for the misuse of this power. Just go back and change it. Don't ask what, what will happen from it. Just because what you're doing is you're, if you're going back and you're changing and revising your past, you revise it to who you want to be. Going back to the self. So you, like I said, for just an example, you might have done something unkind. You go back and do the kind thing because that's what you want to be. Kind. So it's the same idea as you change into your self-concept that you want. And, the, and there's nothing and no one to change but self, as Neville always says. So I don't, I can't go to another to, maybe deep down I do want to change what I did inside myself. I can't go to another and ask them to do it for me. I must do it. I must take responsibility. And it, again, these words are not bad, they're not burdening. Everything inside is actually... Um, it's light, it's freeing, it wants to give, it's giving, unconditionally giving. So you feel in here there's no judgment. In here I don't need anyone's permission. In here there are no burdens for me to carry. In here it's light. In here it's easy. In here it's comforting, like a home, like a, like a lovely home. Like I said, if you make your mind abusive, it, you'll want to leave it. Um, but don't judge yourself for creating that. Was, you probably were taught to do that. But now that you've become aware, you can start to change the nature of your mind into something wonderful and something powerful. And you'll see its effects in your life. If you truly revise something from the past and you change yourself and do the thing you wish you would have done instead, you will, you, and you just accept it as you would uh, any kind of thought about changing yourself or changing the, um, what you want to experience in the future. You just accept it the same way. Um, you will see a drastic change in you. Um, and it'll be fast. But again, don't, don't 
ask more questions than you need to. Just simply learn to accept and change. Um, and these two are the gifts, as Neville says. Repentance and faith is what leads to forgiveness. So we are practicing forgiveness in the end. We are forgiving ourselves by changing and revising. And we're forgiving ourselves for whatever it is. We forgive the past by changing it. We forgive our futures by changing it, by changing ourselves now. So it all comes back to the self now. And um, I guess the point I wanted to make with this video is to help you feel more free inside. You don't need to feel judged. There's no judgment inside. You don't need to, and use that all the time in here. There is no whatever it is that you are afraid of. And um, learn to relax yourself with that. I always do that. I, I, I think it's one of my favorite ways of thinking about this. So, um, yeah, I hope this helps. You know, in this day and age, we are so obsessed with information. And so, many, so much of it just contradicts the other. And we're told by the media on how we should believe and what we should be afraid of and how we should view ourselves. And we're bombarded every day with these ideas. And if you can't explain everything with its utmost reasoning, uh, then it should just be uh, dismissed as silliness and nonsense. Um, but for this video, I just want you to, because uh, I know a lot of my videos can seem very uh, thought-provoking. You might have to listen to them over and over again. And I do the same with Neville. I reread his stuff all the time. But I want to take a different approach with this video. And I just want this video to be as simple and as honest as it can be. And that is the most important thing you can do in this video. Is I'm going to ask a series of questions and just answer them, not from your perspective, but from God's perspective. And the the most important thing here is honesty. Because in this world, there are so many gods that are external to us. We're taught to believe in this God, and this God does this thing, and this God does that thing. And <laughs> they're all in conflict with each other because they're all from different times, and they all can't get along. But I want us to just take our focus off of these external gods and just simply focus on the God within, the God inside of us. I want us to become curious about this God. I want you to take yourself out of these questions, this ego that's been developed through all these beliefs about yourself given to you by this external world, by the world of Caesar, bombarded daily with beliefs you're supposed to believe and who you're supposed to fear. Just allow yourself which God you're supposed to pray to. Allow yourself to just let these go by the wayside. Allow yourself to just drop them. Because what you hold on to in the mind, you can let go of in the mind. And when you answer these questions, you could be as simple as, no, God wouldn't, or no, God wouldn't be afraid of that. And that's good enough. You don't need to add anything more. And I suggest you don't. Just leave it from God's perspective. And don't allow yourself to get in the way. And when you do that, you'll notice an ease and a fearlessness and a power come up within you. And don't allow yourself to be afraid of it. It's not going to hurt you. Allow yourself to enjoy it. Similar to like when a good speaker is on stage and he's able to speak to an audience and the audience can get an emotional reaction. If he's good, he can do this. The same is true here, that when you start to see God's perspective and how powerful and fearless it is, allow it to penetrate you and allow yourself to be overcome with those emotions as well. And then you'll see how one you are with this marvelous being inside of you, how you two are one, that all that's his is yours, that his strength becomes your strength, his boldness becomes your boldness, his fearlessness becomes your fearlessness. So, as I said before, just answer these questions honestly. Don't allow yourself to get caught up in the minutia of everything. Just answer them. And remove all these ideas of what you thought God was. And just simply ask. Ask yourself these questions. Would God fear what I am fearing right now? Would God feel stuck like I am feeling stuck. 
would God allow himself to feel all the pleasures he desires? Would God question his worthiness? Would God ask for man's permission? Would God seek man's approval? Would God seek anything at all? Would God lack anything? Would God listen to doubts? Would God be a slave to the senses? Would God be entirely graceful in giving? Would God hate or fear anyone? Would God believe in himself? Would God fear death? Would God love endlessly? And when you ask yourself these questions and you answer them honestly, of course God would never question his worthiness. And you don't add anything to it, just his standpoint, just his perspective. You'll see that it's your perspective. You'll see how one you are with this being. That you don't have to fear anything because he doesn't fear anything. It's good enough reason. And who's greater than God? You can't go to some holy man to forgive you anymore. You have to go to this being, and this being is the utmost of love there is. It's the most powerful being there is. And it's love. If you don't want to use the word God, if that has too much baggage, use love. Would love question their worthiness? No, love wouldn't do that. So you don't have to um, use the word God if it's too triggering. But, and I can sympathize with that the word has been used in all sorts of um, justifications which uh, William Blake says is the uh, language of hell is self-justification justifying why we're still in sin justifying why we're still afraid justifying why I still seek approval all these justifications to remain as I am but we're taught to imitate God in all that we do would I have to ask myself, would God be like this? Would God be the way I am? If not, then I want to find out how he would be so I can imitate him. And he calls the things that are unseen as though they were seen. So I imitate that being. He's the ultimate being. I can't go to anyone else. And that's the point that Neville's trying to make. Is that your foundation stone must be the imagination. Something inside you. Not these gods that you have to bow before and show reverence to and because it's a symbol of what they represent, this wood symbol. So again, when you answer these questions, take yourself out of it. Don't try to reason with it or figure it out. Allow the answer to come up and be honest. You know God wouldn't fear what you're fearing. You just know it. You don't need someone on the outside to tell you that he doesn't. You don't need permission from them. You don't need their validation to know you're right. You know you're right that he wouldn't. And like I said, you'll start to see how one you are with this being. There doesn't have to be any anything more added to it. It's a simple meditation. It takes five minutes. And you'll find the ease and the comfort coming. And again, allow yourself to feel those to their depths. For a long time, I thought good feelings were things that could hurt me in the future. And I was so wrong that you have to allow yourself to feel these good feelings. Because it's, as Neville says, it's self-demotion or self-promotion. It's one or the other. So I can remain as I am and keep feeling after the things I'm feeling after, feeling afraid, or I can imitate this being called God and how I perceive them. And if God's love, I can't see love being afraid of anything. It's powerful. Love is the most powerful thing there is. And we're taught that that's God. 
So learn to not be so scared inside yourself. Start to imitate that being inside yourself. And you'll see you're one. So I'm sure this will help you because this has helped me tremendously in my journey of being able to become more relaxed, more at ease, more mimicking the being that I actually want to mimic. I'm tired of mimicking other men. I want to mimic something extraordinary. But in order to mimic that, I must know how this being is. And this being we call God is fearless. It's powerful. It's loving. It does everything in love. It doesn't use and abuse for its own selfish gain. It wants to grow everything. So again, go through these questions and ask yourself them and see what feelings arise and accept those feelings fully. So I know this will help you.